He's the leader of the Interdisciplinary Research Group in Science and Technology. I also want to invite to the table Emilson Pereira Leite. He's professor at the Department of Geology, Natural Resources at the Institute of Geoscience here in Unicampi. He's currently the Institute's Vice Director. And I want to invite Rafael Diaz. He's a professor at the School of Applied Science of Unicamp. And he's currently the advisor, executive director of international relationship that here in Unicamp. And I also want to invite Professor Vodmer because he will start the conference here. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, event. Welcome, especially people who come from very far away, <laughs> from other countries, from other states. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, I know it's been difficult to kind of readapt post COVID contacts, people are still getting used to getting the, the presence of other people. And uh, so I thank everybody who. who the time to come here. It's an honor to be here representing the department. Professor Janaina, who is the head of the department, could not uh, be here, so I'm representing her. I'm also representing the graduate courses of the day, uh, the graduate course in science and technology. I have the honor of uh, being part of this project for many, many years. And this is uh, another one of these opportunities that we have to be together and discuss uh, very important issues. Uh, I think Francisco has really brought uh, richness and uh, uh, vibrancy to the debate and presentation about climate change. I, I really like that you, um, the event is discussing resilience. I think uh, important issues that we have to debate towards the future. I mean, these crises are going to need to be I mean, maybe at a faster pace in the future. So I think uh, our speakers are going to help us uh, understand that better. So yeah, uh, really honored again to be here. Um, I want to thank Nick and every postdoc, uh, PhD, master's, and uh, undergrad student who made this event possible. Uh, it's a lot of work, so thank you again. Welcome to the Institute. Welcome to Campinas. And I uh, hope you all have a good morning, everyone. I would like to extend the compliments to the members of this open panel. A special thanks to the organizers of this event, Drs. Ron Boxma, Bruno Fischer, and Nicholas Marcus, and also the professors of our Department of Science and Technology Policy that are more directly involved, Professor Sergio Queiroz, Andrea Furtado, Sergio Salles, uh, for the initiative of bringing these important international events to, this, to the Institute of Geoscience here in Dominica. My greatest also to the School of Economics, Business, and Accounting of USP for their contributions to make the, the events uh, happen. We are very proud and happy to host this event which is part of a series of events organized by the Sao Paulo Excellence Chair uh, Innovation Systems, Strategy and Policies, uh, supported by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESC. So many thanks to FAPESC for this support. I must say that we are very fortunate to have FAPESC funding scientific research here in our state. So we look forward to host uh, many other uh, events of the same magnitude in the future. We welcome all the participants of this international symposium that are present here and also those uh, who watch us now in the near future. As you can see, this is a new auditorium. I guess we can call it the auditorium new because we started using it just before the pandemic. So it remains new because we, it was not used during these two uh, dramatic pandemic years that we all had to face. 
I will have equipped this auditorium and also our classrooms with new audio systems, new microphones, new computers. And we also got a few educational uh, robots that Unicamp distributed to the institutes and faculties, which basically are high resolution cameras with motion sensors that can be used for online transmissions of lectures. This was part of our efforts to improve our infrastructure to the return of face to face activities after the pandemic, to give support to our everyday teaching, research, and expansion activities that involve around 900 students and 100 staff members. Uh, and we have here 40 plus laboratories that go from research groups, laboratories from our geography and science and technology policy departments two analytical laboratories from our geology department. So I think they're being very successful so far. I personally took a look at the symposium program and found it really interesting, involving around themes like resilience, technology upgrading, regional innovation policy, local ecosystems of innovation as they relate to the disease. But not only because of the importance of those themes, but also because of the great diversity of universities involved both national and international. So I'm sure it's going to be great, a great event, and I hope that you all get involved as much as you can, particularly our graduate students, that I'm sure you have a great opportunity to expand their knowledge with, with such a rich symposium program. So thank you very much and enjoy. Uh, college professor Martin Montero, professor Milton, professor Milton Martin, and colleagues and guests on behalf of the University of Campinas, welcoming you all to this uh, important event. And uh, allow me to say a few words on a personal note, expressing gratitude. Uh, Thanks to the organizing board of this conference, uh, which is a very, very representative of the sort of resilience, of the sort of commitment we uh, try to build in communities such as the new system project has been taken. Uh, the very fact that we are all gathered here today is a testimony to this wish to reconnect and establish contact partnership and further develop these academic activities which are uh, so relevant and even more relevant today. The uh, events team in that sense is very important. Think about themes that are already being explored by this community, innovation and technology, but uh, it's tools for us to uh, develop this new economy, this society, and culture we have uh, is uh, absolutely crucial. So, on behalf of the university, thank, uh, thank you, organizers, thank you uh, for guests today that are following us face to face or online. Uh, for these activities, are very, very important. And it's uh, my personal mission to uh, help to see ways to take that way to build the world in the post COVID. So uh, I'm confident that we have a very interesting agenda. Very really keynote speakers. Interesting discussions ahead, and uh, looking forward to a very productive agenda. And also, uh, to the ones of us, that, the ones of you that are visiting us for the first time, uh, we would like to have you visit us again. So, you're very welcome to you. Thank you for having a productive discussion here and a uh, pleasant day with you. Thank you very much. 
So let me uh, say a few things about uh, this activity. This is, this is actually the San Paolo Excellence Chair, uh, a new instrument from the about 10 years old. Some of this current people are doing. Right? So uh, <clears throat> the idea, the idea with this uh, program is, of course, uh, academic excellence. It's an academic program. Academic excellence is key, but there is also another major objective of the program: to internationalize uh, character international. Other universities, right? So, so that's like the My graph, it's a, a, a picture that came up with the OECD, but essentially describes what we are doing here. We are starting innovation in uh, where ideas start. They are, they are dispersed. Various different ideas. Type of things that one could support. Like TV in the States or the SBIR in the United States, which is right? small business innovation research. There are far out ideas that, that start to then slowly, northeast. As they reach closer to the graph, International factors that
the system of innovation. And that's why I think in the system, I think innovation strategy is important. It's not a strategy. Okay, so the problem has to form. The problem has to form in the patient. Uh, these are the people. These are the people who are actually uh, involved uh, directly. I mean, these are the PIs, the PIs of the program. So in the research trajectory one, um, we have two uh, gentlemen sitting right there. Professor Boschma, who is from the University of Utrecht in, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, Andres Furtado, who is uh, from the department here. Uh, uh, in uh, research trajectory two is led by Professor Sergio Sales, uh, who unfortunately today is traveling somewhere in Italy for another event. <laughs> um, uh, research trajectory three uh, is led by Professor Sergio 
Queiroz, who is following us online today from his home here in Campinas because he is waiting for the results of the COVID test. Signs of the time, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and then um, uh, for big data, um, the the lead is uh, uh, Professor Rodrigo Costas. Uh, Rodrigo Costas is uh, of Spanish descent, but he is uh, working in the Netherlands also, and and he is at the University of Leiden. Right, uh, Professor Costas actually later this year. Um, if you are interested in this in this activity later this year, starting in August, he's going to be spending his sabbatical leave here. Um, so he will be for uh, for half a year until uh, October or November. Uh, he will stay here, and I strongly recommend that you come in touch with him because he is a, a, an internationally recognized expert in this kind of data, in alternative data. We all know in this field, uh, patents, publications, R&D expenditure, and, and classic indicators like this, right? But a uh, few people know how to put together these indicators with alternative indicators, like tweets, okay? or like traffic out there in the street. And, and, and he is uh, one such person, right? So, so these are invaluable resources. And you should contact. Um, here is uh, our people, uh, the current people right now. So what you see in this picture is our postdocs, the current postdoc. Here is one um, changing the slides, but uh, Johanna is another who was talking to you before. And, and you will see around the room, uh, maybe maybe I call them. Alison Mazzoni is back there with the IT systems. Um, Karen uh, was outside, she greeted you um, as you were coming in. Johanna, of course, you saw. Mariani will be presenting the next session. Uh, Mateus is right here. Vanessa here in front. Um, and Juan Carlos um, somewhere uh, in the audience back there. Juan Carlos is our foreign postdoc. He is from Mexico. This slide is the two current PhD candidates. Um, they are fully funded by FAPESPI. And I wanted to announce today, actually, for the rest of you, that we have more money for PhD uh, uh, studies. We have more money uh, coming. Marco mentioned something earlier. These are integrated into the, the, the program of the department. There is a special designation. Uh, for, uh, for funding through in Cisco, and, and this is fully funded positions for direct, what you call here in Brazil, direct PhD, right? Do not have a master's already. If you are, if you are in a master's uh, line of research and study, you should actually jump into this um, before you get graduate. So either you get into this PhD through uh, uh, your undergraduate studies, you have graduated, you know, you have your first degree, and then you uh, start this. Or if you are in the master's already, uh, you do not graduate, but you jump into the PhD. So please uh, make uh, take advantage of this. This is Brazilian taxpayers' money. Your 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 father and your mother have paid for this. So. You really want to take advantage, okay? Um, so, so here is a other important people that are actually affiliated with the program because the PIs are PIs, uh, but there is many others, several others who are uh, around the program. Right? Uh, Professor Marcondes is is one of the most well-known Brazilian experts, academics uh, on uh, things of data, computing, and so forth. He's at the University of São Paulo. We have uh, Professor Robert Thiessen. Uh, he is another Dutch. I don't know why I'm a friend of the Netherlands. Yes. Um, a lot of my friends are from the Netherlands, right? Uh, one of the most prominent people also internationally, uh, University of Leiden too, um, but also now very much uh, working with the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, uh, with which we have an agreement, actually. We have exchanges with the University of Stellenbosch, which is 
which uh, has the center of excellence of South Africa on science and technology policy. So there is one center of excellence is in, that, uh, in that school and we have exchange with it. Uh, Franco Malerba, of course, from the University of Bocconi. Um, uh, we, were, uh, we were just the other month uh, in Milano on a sort of big event in his, in his, uh, in his uh, labor, right? But then we have Luciano uh, Di Giampietri from, uh, from uh, USPI also, from the University of San Paolo, also with data. And then finally, Andriana Bin here from the business uh, and then finally some international some some other people from uh, national domestic too uh, so, so Andre, Andre Alves there um, is here in the audience who was there uh, he is a previous postdoc of ours uh, now professor at uh, FGV in in, uh, in San Paulo uh, we have Otaviano Canuto that you will see online today and tomorrow. Um, he will join us from Washington. Um, he is an uh, ex-vice president of the World Bank and of the IMF and of the Inter-American Bank, an ex-professor of this university. Bruno, of course, Bruno Fischer up there. Uh, we have uh, Wolfgang Kohl uh, from Austria, a good friend of, of mine. Uh, he is uh, actually uh, leading a, a regional uh, uh, organization, organization for regional development, which is very, very active. Uh, it's called Ioanneum Research, right? And he is leading the policy, the policy uh, arm of that organization. And somebody else called Robert Fisher, fairly unknown in this crowd, but uh, with very important role, very key role in Europe um, on uh, uh, science and technology policy. Very influential in the commission and so forth with a lot of projects and um, and, and, and that's that. I will stop here um, I think it's about time. Uh, so thank you very much. I wanted to thank everybody very much. We have a great program. We have here in this room um, some of the most important people internationally in this subject. Uh, two of them from Korea sitting right there, Professor John Dong Lee and Professor Kyun Lee. Um, were uh, uh, advisors to the previous Korean president. The Korean president presidency changed in Korea about a month ago, right? One leading the Council of Economic Advisors, the other was the, the Science and Technology Policy uh, Advisor to the President of Korea, right? Both professors at Seoul National University, which is like the MIT of, of, uh, of, of, of that country, right? Very well-known university. Uh, we have Ron Boschma here, uh, who will give the first uh, the first keynote. He's uh, 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 one of the most important European academics right now, influencing policy actually in Brussels about on the subject that he's going to talk to you about about the regional development and and, and actually technological differentiation. How a region decides what to do next, right? Where to invest next, which is a very very important question. So I will step down. I will ask Johanna to lead you through. And thank you very much for coming. And thank you for the others who, who are online. Uh, actually, there are people on Zoom. Right? We have people on Zoom and we have people on YouTube. So, so, so they will be also asking questions throughout the event. We will take questions from the floor. But also we will be taking questions, if there are any, from, from people. Thank you very much. Hi, so I want to thank again, Professor Marco Monteiro, Professor Rafael Diaz, and Professor Emilson Pereira Leite for joining us in the, the welcoming of our event. We will now, now start the first keynote that will discuss, as Nick just told us, the global value chains and smart specialization. For that, I'll invite Dr. Ron Boschma for the presentation. And Nick will be our commentator. He will uh, later join the table.
All right. Uh, good morning uh, to all of you, and uh, uh, very happy to be here um, in person, not online, right? So uh, although it takes a lot of effort to come here, but uh, it's very worth uh, doing it uh, uh, because uh, I've been here before. And it's always a, a big pleasure to be here among colleagues and friends. Uh, so uh, it's uh, always nice. Uh, thanks to all the uh, good work that Nick is doing and bringing us together. He's a really a good and, and, and well, an excellent person that uh, is very important to our community, connecting people and, uh, and organizing this type of events. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. And uh, um, what I would like to do is uh, um, uh, and maybe, and maybe also uh, and say a few words on my affiliations because uh, they pay me so they would appreciate uh, that I uh, that I mentioned them. Uh, I'm, I'm professor in research and economics at uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands, but I'm also uh, affiliated to uh, uh, the, the business school at uh, Stavanger University in Norway. And I also, uh, uh, um, I, I missed it here somehow. Uh, I got now a chair in economics at the University of Toulouse uh, in France. Um, so uh, these were the uh, things that I had to say. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's not showing there. Uh, okay. So um, the structure of my talk will be as follows. Yes. Um, what I would like to do is uh, to share some ideas, some uh, uh, some uh, uh, work I've been doing in the last couple of years, uh, uh, working for also the European Commission. Uh, they were interested in the smart specialization policy, which is a massive policy intervention uh, scheme uh, at the regional level, uh, trying to uh, develop uh, new economic activities. Uh, policymakers are, uh, are uh, have a strong objective to do so and come up with uh, uh, strategies in order to make that happen. Um, which requires, of course, a lot of understanding of how uh, regions develop new economic activity. So, uh, um, so I will say a few words on that, how that might be uh, uh, possible. Um, uh, also, the way uh, we do, uh, uh, we develop the framework uh, in order to identify diversification opportunities of regions. And this is, a, uh, this is currently used at the European scale. Many regions are adopting this type of approach in order to identify those opportunities. I will say a few things on the role of science in that respect. Uh, so uh, I will incorporate it in the framework uh, uh, that I will uh, briefly introduce. Um, and then I will say something on uh, um, to what extent regions uh, can connect to other regions uh, because they can provide all kinds of capabilities that are present, not present in the region itself, that can be accessed uh, by a region by connecting to other regions that, that have relevant capabilities in order to, uh, to make them diversify. And the last but not least, and this is also what I was asked to do, is to say something on a global value chain and how to incorporate that in our framework. Yes. Yes, works. Okay, good. Uh, uh, just just a brief introduction why why it is uh, very important to uh, 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 look at uh, the topic of how regions diversify over time. Uh, well, I don't have to tell that to you, to an audience like this, is that uh, our economies are constantly changing uh, due to many reasons. Uh, activities come and go, uh, firms come and go, uh, industries uh, come and go, technologies come and go. So there's, there, there are uh, uh, dynamics going on in, in countries and regions. Um, so at, this, at some point of time, all those activities that are currently present will cease to exist at some point of time, or they will be happily transformed by all kinds of uh, uh, events like technological change, globalization, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and, and and I want to stress this because for many of us, this is quite obvious, but not to many economists in general uh, and policymakers uh, uh, more in general. So, uh, uh, so I think those two dots already on this slide are extremely important and we cannot stress it too much uh, uh, because this is our point of departure. 
Um, therefore, regions need to diversify, right? They have to compensate process of decline and stagnation in their economy. So that's why they have to come up with new things in order to offset uh, this process of decline when they want to secure their long-term economic development. So it's an absolute prerequisite that they show a strong ability to develop new economic activities. But we also know that the capacity of regions to, uh, uh, to develop new economic activities differs to a considerable degree. So we need to have more understanding of how regions diversify over time. And we know they don't develop from scratch. I go through this quite quickly uh, uh, because we've done a lot of research on that, made many publications, uh, but basically it comes down to the uh, claim that local capabilities, it might be knowledge, it might be skills, it might be networks, it might be institutions, quite broadly defined, those local capabilities condition which new economic activities will be feasible to develop in the region. So you might have relevant capability to go into artificial intelligence, for example. Well, many regions lack this type of capability, so it might be better not to focus on that in terms of policy. So local capabilities provide opportunities, but they set also limits to what can be achieved in this diversification process. And what we know from studies is that regions tend to develop new economic activities that are closely related to what is already present in the region. So, so they stay close to what they have been doing when developing new economic activities. I always use this slide, maybe you've seen this before, and I apologize for that then, but I think it makes quite clear um, what, I've, uh, what I've just been referring to. And this is the, the concept of related diversification, right? So in region A, it's visualized. A region A is uh, uh, first specialized in motorbikes, then move into car making, and then diversifies into car trucks. And as you can imagine, each time this region is diversifying, it builds on existing capabilities that are relevant to move into something new. So in this case, it might be engineering capabilities more in general, right? So the, the capabilities that you need to excel the motorbikes are very relevant to move into car making, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it is being referred to related diversification. So it's related to existing capabilities that are already present in the region. And this stands in contrast to unrelated diversification, right? Which is specialized by region B, specialized in textiles, then moves into aircraft making, and then uh, uh, diversifies into pharmaceuticals. And as you can imagine, each time you diversify, you have to transform completely the underlying capabilities. So the capabilities needed to uh, excel in textiles are completely irrelevant to move into our aircraft making. And therefore, it has been referred to as unrelated diversifications, unrelated to existing capabilities present in the region. No wonder that in any empirical study I have seen so far is that related diversification is the rule. Unrelated diversification is the exception. Unrelated diversification happens now then, but it's very rare. We just published a, a paper on that in research policy with Cesar Hidalgo, and, uh, and we actually uh, uh, looked at how many times unrelated diversification really happens. It's very rare, but we wanted to understand more about uh, uh, what, uh, what is causing that, why it still happens now and then, this, uh, despite the fact that you have to develop something against all odds, right? There are no relevant capabilities present uh, in the region. Well, that you can apply this kind of idea, this kind of framework, and you can do many things. You can look, for example, at technological diversification, then you are interested in uh, to what extent are regions capable to move into new technologies. It might be artificial intelligence, industry 4.0, green technologies, whatever you're interested in. Uh, and we use patent data in order to do those analysis and we can distinguish between 250,000 technologies. So any technology a policymaker might be interested in, we can do this type of exercise and see to what extent they have a potential to move into uh, a new technology uh, that is not yet present in their region. Okay, I don't go too much so much into the details, in the technical details. Uh, uh, what you basically do with this type of analysis is you look at all patent documents and you look at millions of patent documents. 
and you're going to see to what extent uh, and on each patent document each knowledge claim that is made on the patent document technology classes are mentioned on a patent document and if two technology classes pop up on a patent document at a very high frequency they must have something in common yeah. um, well if two technologies two technology classes are never mentioned on a patent document we define them as being unrelated they have nothing in common whatsoever and therefore and so you come up with a, a, a measure of relatedness uh, between technologies and then you can always make nice networks like this this is what we did for the us each node for stands for technology if there's a link between two nodes it means that they are related uh, above a certain threshold if two nodes are not linked it means they are not related uh, meaning that those two technologies are never mentioned together on a patent document right and this already is so much information in this already i mean you can go to the us uspto to the us patent office and, and you can say that they are wrong in the sense that their predefined categories is how they assign technologies to their categories is not what we found in our data for example look at the the mechanical uh, the red dots if 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 the, the predefined categories by the use would work, they would cluster in this kind of space, right? Because they would all be connected, they would all be related to each other because what they share is capabilities in engineering. And that is not what we found. You see the red dots, you see them everywhere in this technology space. So apparently it's not a very homogeneous category uh, as uh, being assumed uh, by uh, uh, USPT. And here you can really do nice things using this type of technology. You can follow regions over time and to what extent they, they, they participate in the technology space in a specific uh, uh, era. So here uh, I just, uh, I got a date. I asked David Rickey, uh, a, a very good colleague, a uh, friend of mine at the UCLA in the US and uh, to show me, to give me some data and on the left top right is there's the us and the technology space of the us um in the uh, beginning of the um, 20th century right uh, so uh, uh, 1901 to 1930. of course mechanical mechanical engineering that was the that was the, the technological frontier in those days and as you can see on the right detroit was patenting a lot in that type of technology so they were at the technological frontier of the us they were leading the us in those days well san jose silicon valley you can see was hardly patenting at all and the patenting structure was very fragmented they frag they they patented in a lot of diverse activities but there was no focus whatsoever so who could have predicted that silicon valley would be the leading te technological le uh, region uh, several decades later but here you go this is the technology space of the us on the top left again and you see computing electronics have emerged as new technologies a lot of patenting going on the bigger the bullet the more patenting is going on uh, so you see that the technology space has dramatically changed in a period of about 80 to 90 years and so have the fortunes of regions. Again, Detroit on the right top. It's all over the place, the patenting, right? There's no focus anymore. Uh, um, uh, while being the technological leader in the early 20th century, uh, uh, um, a century later, there's nothing left of that position anymore. And Detroit is declining. And it's economically declining already for a very long time because uh, there is no uh, focus anymore on its patenting activity. Uh, it's too, it, it's a completely fragmented system. Uh, they have, uh, and the, the, the elements of that system do not have anything in common and cannot support each other. Well, San Jose, of course, a very different story. Silicon Valley has become the technological leader worldwide. Uh, very much lot of patenting a lot in computing, in electronics, and, uh, um, and, and being at uh, uh, the function. So, so you, you can see this type of methodology can really show how regions are developing over time, how their fortunes 
my change, taking a long-term perspective, going back to my first slide. Our economies are full of dynamics. If you don't understand that, then you cannot really explain how they develop uh, in the long run. The type of methodology you can also use, uh, the European Commission asked us, okay, which regions do have the highest potential to move into uh, new technologies? Here you are, right? And this is the average diversification opportunities of European regions. And you can see there are a lot of differences among regions, right? The, the re uh, so the, the regions in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe do not have that many potential to move into new technologies given their existing structures. So this is a measure in which we look at in which technologies are you not yet specialized in the region and which, in which technologies are you already specialized? And if there's a big gap between the two in terms of relatedness, so the, un, so the, 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 the technologies that in which you are specialized are unrelated to the technologies that are still missing in your region, you have a very low potential to move into those now new technologies in which you are not yet specialized. So here you already can also see is that this technological dynamics also drives inequality between regions in Europe. So you also have an alternative explanation for why disparities in Europe remain stable over time and even have the tendency to be reinforced. But you can also use this methodology just to go into one particular technology. So again, the European Commission came to us and said, okay, we really want to invest in hydrogen technology, but where? Where uh, should we make the investment? Where is the highest potential given the relatedness structure to hydrogen technologies? So where are the relevant capabilities that are needed to move in hydrogen? So here you are. This is the, this, these are the regions that are best equipped to take on hydrogen. So again, policy implication would be that a, a region in Bulgaria does not have any relevant capabilities whatsoever to move into hydrogen. They might, prefer, they might go for a policy in that respect, but then we, we could recommend them. Maybe better not to do it. Maybe you should look what you're strong at and where your capabilities are, and you might have other opportunities and not going into hydrogen technology. Okay, so far this was the relatedness framework and what you can do and how you can apply it. And I think it has high uh, policy relevance. But we, but we also want to see what are the capabilities of regions to move into something new, which also makes their economy more complex. This build on the economic complexity uh, literature that, uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with and you've heard about before. Um, and we use this uh, uh, complexity index in order to see, okay, which regions are not Able, not only able to diversify, but also to diversify in the most complex activities, because they will bring the highest economic benefits to a region. We just published a paper with David Rigby and others in regional studies, and we actually looked at the diversification process in all European regions in the last 35 years, and the ones that indeed uh, uh, were capable of moving into more complex activities, through related diversification, they had the highest uh, 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 gross uh, regional product growth and the highest employment growth. So it actually matters. Uh, 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 and you have to try to go into um, high complexity uh, activities. Okay, I'm not going into the measurement of complexity. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of debate on that as well, uh, a big empirical literature. As he told, Hidalgo uh, uh, is, uh, is one of the leading figures in that respect. Basically, what it comes down to is a complex activity is very hard uh, 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 to develop because you need to bring a lot of different capabilities uh, together. So artificial intelligence is very complex because you have to combine many different things. Also, services industries like, uh, like a theater, opera, is a very complex activity because you have to bring so many different expertise together in just one production uh, and therefore it's highly complex and therefore it's very hard 
if you are very good in that, it's very hard to be outcompeted by others. Um, that's that's the main uh, argument. So if we take those two dimensions together, complexity and relatedness, and I want to advise a policymaker, and I say, okay, what type of opportunities do you have in the region? And I will map them. So I might focus on all technologies or all industries or all occupations in which the region is not yet specialized. So those might be potential candidates to enter the region and might be made part of smart specialization policy. Then I look at how they score on relatedness and complexity. Here, I just have an example. Hey, probably you would, uh, it would be wiser to go for industry J and not to industry I because industry J has higher relatedness. So there are more relevant capabilities present in the region on which this industry J could, could build. And it would add more complexity to the region if, if you are successful in developing that than industry I. Okay, this is theory. So we use this information to say, okay, what type of diversification strategies are available to a region given the structure that they have? The best would, of course, be if they had a result from like a commercial slogan, right? On the top right quadrant, low risk, high benefits. We all want to go for that, right? So it means you have high degree of relatedness and you would add a lot of complexity to your economy if you're successful in developing those in the right up product. But not all regions have the opportunities in that right up product. So they might go for the second best option, which is low risk, low benefits, right? So low risk because still you can depend on high degree of relatedness. So there are many relevant capabilities present in your region on which you can build, but it would not add too much complexity to your region. High risk, high benefits left up quadrant is an interesting one, right? It's unrelated diversification. So there are not that many capabilities on which you could build in your region. But if you're successful in developing it, it will increase your complexity and it will bring uh, economic benefits. Well, the most stupid thing that the policymaker can ever do is concentrate on those activities in the left up, uh, left uh, down quadrant, high risk, low benefits, right? So you have no relevant capabilities. So it's already very difficult to develop that activity and it will not add much complexity to your region. So this is theory. Now we go to the data. This is Ile de France. Same graph, right? Relatedness on the x-axis, complexity on the y-axis. These are all industries. And the bigger the node of each industry, the more the Ile de France region is already specialized in that industry. So first of all, what you see is that the relatedness framework works very well. Because the more you, the higher the, the relatedness, so the more you go to the right, the bigger the nodes become. So apparently that those industries that can really build on a lot of relevant capabilities present in the region, they are the biggest. There, the Ile de France region is already heavily specialized in those. So it works perfectly. But what's interesting in our story is, is that there is a positive relationship between relatedness and complexity. So apparently, Ile de France has the highest potential the activities that show the highest relatedness in the most complex activities. And that's why Ile de France is super rich because it can just diversify easily into related activities that would even make our economy more complex than it already is with all kinds of economic benefits. So Ile de France region has a very comfortable life and just can continue and this is, a, this is a typical example of success breeds success story. Now we go to another region, the Silesia region in Poland, an old coal mining region, old steel region. We have many of those in Europe, but they're everywhere in the world. And they have a whole different opportunity space, as we refer to. Look at relatedness and complexity. First, relatedness can maximum value can be 100, right? So for all industries, they don't have that many relevant capabilities because they're heavily specialized in just mining 
which does not have many spillovers to any other activity. But look at this. Instead of being having a positive effect like Ile de France, there's a negative relationship between relatedness and complexity, meaning that the highest potentials are in the least complex activities in this old industrial region. And this is a very systematic evidence that we find for all old industrial regions. They don't have opportunities in this right up corridor. You remember, low risk, high benefits. They don't have opportunities there. Just be governed be, because of their history, because of the, uh, the because the structure that was created and built in the past. So again, capabilities provide opportunities, but also set limits to what you can achieve in this diversification process. It will be very hard for a region like Silesia to go to go for the most complex activities, although very uh, uh, attractive because it would bring high economic benefits. But it does not have the capabilities to do so. And this should be accounted for. It's my specialization policy. So this is another rationale for why you should reject one size fits all policies. It should really reflect what is possible or what is not possible in region. Here we have the Extremadura region, a peripheral region. We have many peripheral regions in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but the same is true for Latin America or wherever you are. Here we are confronted with a big puzzle, right? Because look at the relatedness scores. They're all very low. So, so Extremadura region does not really have that much potential in any industry. No matter whether it's complex, low complex or high complex. So what to do with peripheral regions? This is something we're still struggling a lot with. Right, so uh, and I'll come back to that later. Okay, I'll leave that for it for the time being. Okay. So we have this related this framework. We can we can actually assess the opportunity space in each region, and each region is different from any other region, given their industrial economic structure that developed in the past. Again, provides opportunities, but also set limits. To what we can be using. Now, what about science? And how can we incorporate the role of science in this respect? Okay. The next, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so how can we incorporate science in this? Respect? So, what we know, of course, is that the science and technology relationship is not that straightforward. You might have scientific uh, excellence, which does not translate into technological excellence because there's a mismatch uh, between uh, 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 science and technology, or there might be uh, 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 problems in uh, industry university linkages. Uh, because uh, uh, um, of all kinds of, of, of issues. Also, local firms might have not have the absorptive capacity to, uh, uh, to understand the scientific excellence in the region, and therefore it will not be applied. So that we know, I mean, there's a huge literature on that, triple helix and whatever it's called. Uh, and also, people here in the room have done a lot of work on that. Uh, so, how to incorporate that in our framework? Well, we use this 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 uh, this typology, in which we say, okay, we have we 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 will distinguish four types of regions, and we use two indicators: patents per capita and scientific publications per capita. And either you belong to the top uh, twenty-five percent in patents per capita, so you have technological excellence, so you might be a technological leader. And you can be an, a leader in terms of scientific excellence. So then you belong to the top 25% scientific publications per capita. If you do both, you're a stronghold. So you have scientific excellence, and you have in the same domain, you also show technological excellence. So there's a perfect match between the two. And this is what we would like to see. There are regions that are only a technological leader. So they are, they're very good in patenting in one particular domain, 
but it is not matched by their scientific excellence. Interesting. You can see many German regions are like that. I will show that later. Scientific leader. You have scientific excellence in one particular domain, um, but you're not that. This is a kind of traditional uh, thing that we often observe, right? That you are, that, 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 that you might have very strong universities in a region, but there are cathedrals in the desert. There's no local spillovers to the region. This is what, uh, and we call, we refer to them as scientific leaders. And then there are followers, right? You score both low on, on science and technology. Okay. If we use this concept, then you can really make some nice maps. And you can, this is for the domain agriculture, fishery, and forestry. And you can see that there are a number of strongholds in Europe, right, that have high performance in science and technology in this particular domain. But you, as I said, you have many technological leaders. Again, look at Germany. I mean, it's really, it's very striking that in many German regions, they score very high in patenting in a particular domain, but this is not matched at all by scientific excellence. So here you see the, the yellow ones, right? The technological leaders. But you also, and this is typical for uh, many Southern European countries and East European countries, they are scientific leaders. So they publish a lot in this particular field, but they don't patent at all in this, uh, in this particular domain. Well, you can, uh, we have uh, uh, hundreds of maps. This is ICT. Uh, but do it a lot of time. Uh, um, okay. Now I go to my framework. How to incorporate this? On the x axis, there's relatedness again. Y axis, complexity, right? And now I here have the Ile de France region, the Paris region again. So, for example, the green one, I can't read it now. This is, is it mathematics. <laughs> Mathematics and statistics. So, okay. The bigger the note, the more scientific excellence, the more scientific publications in that particular domain. So, Ile de France is very strong in mathematics and statistics. And it has a high degree of relatedness with technologies that are related to that particular domain. And it is a highly complex technology. So Ile de France has many opportunities to exploit the scientific excellence that is, all, that is already present in the region because they don't only bring high scientific excellence, but also many relevant capabilities present in the regions in terms of technologies that are related to this specific domain. So they have a huge comparative advantage in developing this and science contributes to that. But as you can see, that is not true for all domains. Uh, for example, chemistry, the green little one, they don't have that much scientific excellence in this field of chemistry. They also have a low degree of relatedness with existing technologies, while being a very complex technology. So our advice would be based on that. You don't have scientific excellence in that field. You don't have any relevant capabilities, technological capabilities in that field, forget about it. Don't put any effort in terms of policy. Well, you can use this again for our famous example of Silesia, completely different picture, right? They have scientific excellence in other fields and how does that match with the relevant technological capabilities and how complex that is? Final thing, and maybe I have some time to uh, um, uh, refer to a bit to the global value chain, is so far, I only look at capabilities that are present in the region, right? Whether it's scientific capabilities that allow you to move into something new, whether those are technological capabilities that uh, might allow you to uh, move into something new or not. But regions also can connect to other regions. Right? So they might also get access to capabilities that are present in other regions that are, that they are missing themselves. And in a way, that is what Europe is about. 
it's about integration, collaborating with others so that we can uh, have mutable benefits to them. In a way, that was always part of smart specialization policies from the beginning. So regions were not, uh, were, were not only uh, uh, um, had the incentive to find out what, uh, how, uh, what, what type of uh, capabilities they had, but also to what other regions they should connect to in order to develop something new. That was part of us. But nobody knew actually how to do that. Right, so how to connect, to what region should I connect? Can you tell me? Uh, uh, so most of the time it was just because I knew somebody else in another region in Europe. But that's why uh, a link, linkage uh, was established between the two. But we uh, argued, no, you can also uh, incorporate our framework um, and, and, and look to what extent other regions can mean something to you. I go back to my framework, relatedness and complexity. This is a region that wants to develop a new technology AI, might be artificial intelligence. They want to go for artificial intelligence. So as you can see, the region has a 50% relatedness. So all 50% of all technologies that are needed to excel in artificial intelligence are already present in the region. But 50% of them are not. So if this region A would link to region B, it would add 30% of the relatedness of 50%. So only by collaborating with region B, it would add 30% to the 50% it already had. So almost 80%. So you're almost there already. And linking to region C would add another 20%. So all I'm saying is that you can be very specific in measuring to what region a region should connect in order to get access to complementary capabilities that are not yet present in the region, but that are needed to develop this new technology I to go into artificial intelligence. So we use this framework and then you can really make some nice maps. Again, for hydrogen technology, this is Ile de France. So I made Ile de France, I made black. This is the Paris region. And Paris region wants to go for hydrogen technology. And it has only limited capabilities to do so. So it should look around. With whom should I collaborate in order to develop new hydrogen technology? Where are the regions that can provide additional capabilities that the Paris region does not have? but that's that it needs in order to develop this new hydrogen technology. Here it is. The more darker the color, the more a region can mean something to Ile de France to develop new hydrogen technology. So when we show this in France, for example, they say, hey, we can make a French program. We don't need other European uh, regions because as you can see, many of those dark colored regions are within the boundaries of the French state. So with the uh, Grenoble area, uh, uh, the, the mini Pyrenees uh, on, in the south, uh, uh, there are some regions in the northeast in France. So they could develop a national program in which they could sit together, uh, uh, make a collaborative program in which they ha can bring all the capabilities that are needed to go into hydrogen technology are present in, in, in France, but you have to bring them together. They are not all located in the same region. Yes. Final word, how to incorporate this with the global value chain approach. So the global value chain approach, uh, a very relevant uh, uh, research topic is made me think about how can, we, how can we incorporate that in this related framework? Big question is then, um, well, the regional diversification literature, as I told you before, focus very much on new economic activities. So those might be industries, it might be products, it might be technologies, it might be occupations. But we are not looking so much at a different task of different functions that, that happen within regions. 
right? Uh, 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 typical examples of those. Um, the functions are R&D, management, marketing, logistics, production, right? So that's what you want to, what you might be interested in. Uh, the, uh, known as vertical upgrading. To what extent is it possible to move from, from that, say, a low uh, value activity within one value chain to move to a higher value added uh, 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 function in the same value chain? Well, maybe that this depends on the degree of relatedness between the two functions. And this is what we want to explore in the future. So can we predict what kind of upgrading will take place in value chains, given the relatedness framework that is already present in the region? So we go, to, to make it a, a bit more complex, we go to the, to the unit of analysis, will not be industries or occupations or technologies and connected to regions, but we make a new uh, variable region industry functions, right? So we, we, look, we, we, we will calculate the degree of relatedness between industry functions and we, um, and our hypothesis is if a region is capable of moving into a new industry function when it is related to existing industry functions in the region. So then I, have, then, then I have a mechanism in which I can almost predict in what direction regions can go in upgrading their value chain, both horizontally and vertically. And I can, and, and I can also show in which direction it's just impossible to move into because you don't have the relevant capabilities uh, to move into those uh, particular value chains. Well, this is a new uh, uh, um, approach that we are currently applying, which already, uh, I, I, I wish I could show it here. I, I just miss, missed the deadline. Uh, I, I just needed a few weeks. Uh, so we are in the middle of the analysis, so it didn't make sense to present it here. But it's, it, it's very promising what we, what, what, we, what we are observing in the data, is that indeed this relatedness framework really explains very well what we have observed in the last 15 or 20 years, looking at regions and how they upgrade their value chain. And, and, which, and, and, and also you can explain why certain value chains are downgraded in particular, in particular regions because there's no relatedness uh, environment around it that supports it. So you're more likely to lose certain industry functions because there's no, uh, no support from the local environment. Uh, okay, I'm talking already too much. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ron. Um, very powerful, very powerful presentation. Um, um, I am uh, absolutely uh, enamored with this. And I'm very happy with the JDC. And instead of uh, giving comments, let me give you two, two issues to understand how important that is. So about 10 years ago, I'm giving a talk in Brasilia, in one of your agencies here, the federal agencies. And at the end, I was talking about entrepreneurship, uh, these kinds of things. So, so the director calls me in his office and the two of us, he says, Nick, I know where you are coming from. You are coming from Washington, D.C., right? Yes. So I know what you have done in Washington, D.C. You have developed these two great clusters in the north in biotech and in the south in IT. Now, I also know that uh, uh, Washington was like Brasilia before. In other words, a lot of power around uh, money. Actually, in Brasilia, we have a lot of money. But how come you develop these two classes and we cannot develop anything in Brazil, around Brazil? I mean, what, what's wrong here? I mean, we have money, but I, I cannot really make it, uh, make it glue. So my answer was, of course, mumbling. Yeah, well, there were conditions, but there was one subject that I told him. The region Washington had been trying to develop actually for decades. It was not overnight. Right? They have been trying to develop since the 70s with a lot of infrastructure, 10 research universities in the region, 10. 
right, in, on the Maryland side, in Washington, on the Virginia side. And suddenly there was an opportunity, the, the end of the Soviet Union in 1990. So there was, there was already a lot of, of things in the region, in the south, where the IT cluster developed, it was the Pentagon, right, that gives a lot of money on IT. Um, and in the north is the National Institute of Health, uh, which, which distributes $40 billion currently for, uh, for buy, uh, uh, anything that has to do with basic medical research, right? basic, basic in the biomedical sector. So I told him there, is, there were preconditions and then there was a trigger. Like something triggered this change, and, but the, the, the regions were, had a lot of the ingredients. What we see today is exactly that, right? If I had this analysis, if I had this analysis at that time, I could have given him a much better uh, answer. I could have shown him what the regions already were specializing in, what human capital was already there, what patenting was happening or not happening, what uh, publications were happening or not public, uh, happening. And that's why, and why these two clusters developed there. This is what he's talking about. Um, the JVC thing is very important at the end because, of course, uh, regions do not live uh, on their own, and uh, uh, there is a lot of interchange. And depending on comp what companies you are, there is a lot of exchange with the rest of the country and abroad. Right? So this is of critical importance, in, in my view. This kind of analysis of critical importance for any country, including Brazil. And you will hear later in the first session a paper presentation actually that relates to this material. Second, second observation. I come from a, some of you may know that I come from a little forgotten corner of Europe, right? And in those maps, if you, if you see that map uh, that, that you were showing about scientific excellence, there is an island there in the south of that little corner, the most southeastern uh, island of the, the, which is actually has scientific excellence. It is blue. It has one of the most significant universities in Europe um, in, in, in IT and in particular uh, other kinds of biotech, right? It is totally unconnected to the local industry. The local industry is agriculture and tourism. This is a beautiful island. You will go there, you, you, you will really love it, right? So tourism is the big industry. Agriculture is the other, it produces beautiful fruits. Of all, all, of all types, right? But the university sits alone. It doesn't connect to the, to, the, to, the, to the environment, right? It goes to the national government uh, or it goes to Brussels, right? And, and draws a lot of funds uh, in order to do research. And then what happens, do you think, to the human capital? This university produces a lot of good people. They go. They don't stay there. These people will, will leave they will go where the market is. They will go either in Athens or they will go to Europe. They will go to the Netherlands. They will go wherever they, they, they can go, right? Uh, but they don't stay there. This university over there, actually it's more than one. There's some research institute as well, is a white elephant. It is investment that happened from the national government. Serious investment, actually, because the funds are serious investment. It was uh, a lot of attraction of uh, people, faculty from abroad, very well-known people who had the networks and were able to continue this research and drawing funds from abroad and so forth. But actually, the local economy understands almost nothing. You see how the, what, what this kind of, of framework actually, how this will help uh, policy decision making, right? And I will close here. Thank you very much. Um, I think we will we will go into a break and come back. Hi everyone. So the coffee break it's right by the entrance. I want to thank again Dr. Ron Boschma for his keynote, and then we'll start after the coffee break the first panel at 11 a.m. Okay. Thank you.
Hi everyone, good morning. As Ambe introduced me, um, I'm here from INCISPO and today I'm presenting um, my paper, Regional Diversification in Brazil, the role of relatedness, uh, the role of relatedness and complexity is co-authored with uh, Professor Ron Boschma and Professor Nicolas Benortas. Actually, it's great that I'm presenting after Ron because he has already explained most of the concept. So um, what I'm going to present here today is an application of this methodology with relatedness and complexity to the Brazilian case. So here, um, our main objective, objective here is to explore two understudy topics in the literature. So first, the relative importance of relatedness and complexity on regional diversification in an emerging country, in our case, Brazil, and uh, how the diversification opportunities, they vary in different types of regions. So what we are going to see here, first, I'm going to show to you um, which are the patterns of diversification in Brazil. And then in a second moment, how we translate these patterns into opportunities, into diversification opportunities. And why we are talking about Brazil here? It's not only because we are in Brazil, but because the Brazilian case is very interesting because we're talking about one single country, but it's a country with a high spatial inequality. So we have regions, that are well developed with a lot of human capital and also regions that are really underdeveloped and really struggle to, um, to develop and to have, uh, to improve their economic condition. So um, our analysis will be conducted taking these two uh, main concepts, relatedness and complexity. I'll not talk much about this because Ron has explored them really well. So just a quick review. And when we are talking about relatedness, we are considering that some activities, technologies, products, they share um, a similar set of capabilities and knowledge so they are cognitively close. What it means, it means that the knowledge and capabilities you need to develop some of set, some sectors, you can also apply to other sectors. And complexity is a combination of variety and uniqueness. So um, the higher the complexity of a sector, it's more difficult to um, develop it. And um, when a region is very complex, it means that the region is specialized in very um, complex sectors, complex technologies, and so on. So here we are using two data sets. We are talking here about sectoral diversification and also technological diversification. So um, we are using sectoral data from HAIS. Everyone from Brazil knows HAIS really well. And the uh, patents we resort to orbit intelligence to collect patent data. Uh, our time frame here is from 2006 to 2019. So we are going to see how um, how Brazilian regions that diversify into this this period. So our methodology here is really similar to what uh, Ron has presented. So first. We divided our time frame into three non-overlapping periods. So we are talking about 2006 to 2010 as the first period, 2011 to 2015, second period, and 2016 to 2019, third period. Well, to calculate if a region has comparative advantage in a sector or a technology, we are considering the share that region has in the sector or in the technology compared to the share of Brazil as a whole. When this share is bigger than the Brazilian share, we consider the region is specialized 
that sector or technology. Um, then we follow to calculate relatedness. Um, so sectors are related when they co-occur very frequently and technologies, they are considered um, related when they appear. We are, we are using here the IPC code, the technology according to the IPC code. And technologies are related when uh, they appear very frequently in the same patent document. So here is a explanation of what we are doing. And uh, then after calculating relatedness, we follow to relatedness density. Um, this is a measure that varies between zero and 100. And it shows uh, considering each sector and each technology, what's the ratio of other related sectors and technologies that a region is already specialized. And why this uh, measure is important. Because when relatedness density is high, it means that a region um, has a lot of the knowledge and capabilities necessary to apply, to develop a new sector or technology. And complexity, as Ron also mentioned, is a very difficult method to, to calculate, but we employ here the methods of reflection developed by Hidalgo and adapted by Volander Ricky. Um, then we are applying our indexes to an econometric approach. So uh, our dependent variable is a binary variable. It's one. If a region enters a new sector or a new technology, and when I say enter, it means the region acquired a new specialization. And it's zero otherwise. So we have many zeros here both for sectors and for technologies. And our the independent variables are relatedness density, complexity that I have already explained. And we also have some regional control. So here, I'm already moving to our results. What we can see here, first I'm showing um, the regressions for economic sectors. So we can see that relatedness density has a positive effect on the entrance of new sectors. And what does it mean? It means that uh, the diversification process in Brazil is based on relatedness. It's a related diversification. So when a region has a lot of capabilities and knowledge in a specific sector that is related to another sector, these, are not, these other sector is more likely to enter the region than others, than others that are unrelated. Um, complexity has a negative effect. It was also expected because as we said, um, it's not easy to develop a complex sector or a complex technology. So in general, it has a negative effect. We have also some other controls. Here we have uh, regression with fixed effects and another without it, but in both of them, um, our, our variables are of interest, relatedness density and complexity, they show the same, the same effect. So uh, our next step was to split our sample. So here we have the 50% most complex regions and the 50% least complex regions. And what we can see here is that they have a different pattern of diversification because complex regions, they are able to diversify into more complex sectors, but the least complex regions, they are not. And why I'm saying this? Because complexity has a positive effect on the 50% most complex regions and a negative effect on the 50% least complex regions. Well, uh, moving to uh, technologies, we have very similar results. So uh, relatedness has a positive effect and complexity has a negative effect. When we split our sample, we see again the same pattern. So the 50% most complex regions, they are able to diversify 
into more complex technologies, but the least complex regions, they really struggle to do the same. So um, how can we translate these patterns into opportunities? How can we, um, after we understood that, well, Brazil also, just like Europe, uh, developed a related diversification process. So how can we translate it into opportunities? So here we are using the same uh, framework that Ron has already showed. It got developed by him and some authors at Balan et al. 2019. So what we are doing here is relating, relatedness and complexity. So again, the four, um, the four quadrants, and um, we can see that the best uh, option, the best work is when low, we have low risk and high benefits, meaning high complexity and high relatedness. But we are going to see that not all regions, they are able to conduct this kind of strategy. So uh, our next step, we used cluster analysis to, um, to, uh, split, to divide the Brazilian regions. So we used our 137 Brazilian mesoregions. We used some um, data on them, like GDP per capita, um, number of patents, uh, people with tertiary education, and so on. And we conducted a cluster analysis. In this analysis, we divided our regions in three groups. So we have central regions, intermediate regions, and periphery. These regions, they, um, the regions in each group, they have some similar characteristics. So central group is formed basically by metropolitan areas and state capital. So the famous cities of Sao Paulo and Rio, they are in the central region. In the intermediate, in the intermediate regions, we have 18 regions. They are mainly from the southeastern and the southern states of Brazil. For Brazilians who really know our country, we know that it's expected there is a huge um, economic concentration in those regions. And in periphery, we have most of the regions and from all over the country. So here, um, we, we chose one region from each of these groups to show to you which are the patterns and the opportunities that they face. So um, central regions, we can see on um, the right side, the upper right side, um, we are showing opportunities for Sao Paulo. So we can see that the sectoral opportunities of Sao Paulo, they are really similar to what Ron showed for Ilde France. So um, green dots, they represent the, the sectors in which Sao Paulo is already specialized and pink dots are the opportunities. So Sao Paulo is already specialized in the most complex sectors, but still there are some opportunities of high complexity and Sao Paulo has a high relate, relatedness to this, uh, to this sector. So Sao Paulo can conduct uh, div uh, related diversification police based on what we see here. Technologies is a bit, uh, it's not as beautiful as the economic sector's graph, but we still see that there, there are some high complexity opportunities with high relatedness. Moving to our intermediate region, here we are showing the northeast of Rio Grande do Sul. And we can see that here we have mixed opportunities because there are some, um, some opportunities in medium complexity region, in middle complexity sectors, and there's low relatedness to high complexity sectors, but even though we can see that um, this intermediate region, they have a lot of special, specializations already. So they have capabilities. Maybe here we can think about a non-related strategy maybe, but 
um, we can see that this region uh, already has capabilities. But when we look at our peripheral region, which is San Francisco, Pernambuco, we can see that the green dots, they are very few. So they are really specialized in the sense that the variety of sectors in which they have specialization, they are, it's really, it's really small. They are very specialized in only a few activities. They are like um, Silesia that runs so. So the opportunities here are really difficult to, to identify because if we look at the graph, we can see that even for the low, the lowest complexity activities, relatedness is really small. So for this region, it's really hard to picture a, a diversification strategy or to think about what we can do there based on uh, related diversification. So what does this all mean? Uh, we can see here in our work that sectors and technologies uh, require similar capabilities. To those available in the regional portfolio, they are more likely to enter the region, meaning that relatedness matters. Relatedness is important also in Brazil. We, can, we could see this in our case. Um, complexity is negatively correlated with regional diversification, both for sectoral and technological. The only exception is the uh, most complex regions because they can uh, diversify into more complex activities. Um, and finally, we could see that diversification opportunities, they look very different for uh, the different types of regions. So when a region is more complex, more developed, they can do basically anything and they have great opportunities to diversify. But when we are talking about peripheral regions, and actually we are talking about the periphery of the periphery. So it's really peripheral regions. Their situation is really difficult because we cannot see so many opportunities. That's it, I'm on time, I think. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Mariana, for your uh, nice presentation. Yeah, I think it's a good illustration about uh, uh, the ideas of uh, Ram Boschma here in application in Brazil. Uh, so we have uh, now uh, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, uh, maybe I, I okay. Okay, she can start and after we go. Okay, so hi, uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. My name is Anvisi. I'm a master student at the Economics Institute here at Unicambi. And um, in my research, I follow the, the steps that you and professors have presented today, but I studied the technologies uh, of the fourth industrial revolution. So my question is, uh, could you tell me like, how have you chose here in Brazil the patents that you chose, like the, the groups, the IPC that you, you mentioned? Uh, I'd like to, to know better if you could. Thanks a lot. Thank you so well, much. Thank you for your question. Actually, we had a limitation with our sample because we all know that um, data in Brazil sometimes is a bit difficult. When I collected the data that I used, uh, the INP uh, data set was not freely available. It, they published this year in January for everyone, but before uh, you could just have access requesting it. And I really struggled to, to got this. So uh, we used Orbit. And uh, due to the small number in our sample, we used um, technological domains. 
it's a classification developed. Uh, it's an extra classification. So it's based on IPCs, but what they do, it's uh, with a list of IPCs, they define a technological domain. So because of our small sample, I use technological domains. Thank you for sorry. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. I have an interest. Sorry. Um, did you check the correlation between regional diversification and income per capita in the region? Um, the underlying narrative is that di uh, regional diversification is good for regional development, but that doesn't need to be necessarily true. So um, I was wondering, how is, how is it in Brazil? Well, actually, we inserted GDP per capita in our, in our model as a control sample, a regional control, but um, it was not statistically significant, neither uh, for technology well, so I will just uh, for technologies we can see that GDP per capita was not statistically significant although it it appears here with a positive sign and for sectors we could see um, a negative uh, effect but it was not statistically significant so we are not really um, exploring this because of the statistical significance. More, more questions. Uh, if data was not a limitation, what you would have done differently in this? What you would have done added to this? What well, is missing? What is missing here is the whole picture about patents, but actually, um, this is not that problematic because the patents that are using here are those that have been um, submitted both to Brazilian office and to other international office. So it ends up being like, a, um, I don't know exactly how to say, it, not a certification, but uh, we know that that patent is really um, strategic and uh, important. So that knowledge is really, um, good enough to be submitted to other office. So we do not have the whole picture here, but the sample we are working with is, uh, we can say maybe the most important patents. So um, I do believe that the picture we are showing here reflects the real thing. Is it work? Uh, Mariana, it's, it's a broader question related to the implications of this analysis, actually. So um, when we think about the trends of digitization, so uh, what happens to the notion of region in that respect? Because we're looking here at relationships that take place at the local level or regional level. And when you have the phenomenon of uh, multiple people working to other regions remotely or even to other countries, such as what has been happening with Brazilian uh, software. Analysis, when you have that uh, trend of remote working. Well, I think we are going to see this in next years to discover the implications. But um, even though, um, Okay, we, we have uh, this new setup, but even though um, the close contact, uh, the institutions, we have the organizations we have in a certain place, um, we, we have this, uh, these different uh, kinds of connections here, but here we are, we are all together and we are connecting here in a way that we would not do uh, through internet and so on. So even that we have this new setup, at least for a few years, I believe that uh, 
this face to face, this uh, bit embeddedness in our uh, regions, in our communities, I think it's still um, the main thing, at least for the following years, but probably it will change. I'm, I'm very, I would not say skeptical, but careful with uh, this idea. Yes, uh, of course, I like the paper. <laughs> um, but of course, uh, um, uh, I'm thinking about the next steps to take to make a full understanding of, uh, of what's going on in uh, in a country like Brazil. Uh, I think what's important to uh, include uh, the role of multinational corporations, right? So uh, I, I guess that they have a huge impact on what's going on and to what extent the uh, the technology and the knowledge they bring in is actually available for others, right? So uh, in the region where they are located. So um, so that, that, that might be a next step to take. Uh, and you have uh, the micro data in which you might uh, might be able to explore that. But of course, it's a different paper. I mean, you cannot put uh, everything in one paper. The second is a bit uh, the comment uh, about the inequality, yeah, what you refer to, uh, I think, Indeed, uh, the GDP per capita is not uh, uh, not positive and significant. But uh, what we tend to show is that diversification is taking uh, 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 a place to a lesser extent in peripheral regions, so they diversify less, and they also do a bit more differently. They they tend to uh, 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 diversify even more in related activities than uh, than, than than other types of regions. Um, so the inequality uh, thing is then, uh, or the implications of it is that uh, it, it tends to reduce um, um, uh, inequality between regions, right? Um, as also this case shows that uh, the more advanced regions have many more opportunities and it's much more easy because they can add much more easy, more complex activities through relatedness, right? And this is the easiest route. Uh, to take and, and and peripheral regions are actually struggling uh, with that to a large extent. So this diversification process has a to increase interregional uh, inequality. Um, actually, what we are doing right now uh, uh, it is also to look at to what extent it affects uh, income inequality within regions. So who is benefiting uh, uh, from um, the sectors that uh, enter a region, uh, who are hired, and uh, what kind of wage profile do they have, and to what extent that has an impact on the wage distribution within a region. And uh, um, so we're doing currently, a, 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 okay, it's a, a, a study on the Netherlands. You need the micro data uh, to do that. And uh, what we tend to show came a bit as a surprise is that regions that are more active in, in, uh, uh, in, in diversifying it tends to reduce wage inequality uh, within regions. Um, and uh, okay, it's a big topic, uh, which we have to explore a bit more in detail, but I think that is definitely a next step to take and a very important question to address. We, uh, I, we, we don't have any more time, so we are going to the second presentation. Uh, so we have uh, four authors, Leonardo Vasconcelo Gomes, Mateus Graciano, and Paulo Figueiredo, and Ana Fassi. Uh, who is going to present is Mateus Graciano de Santos. I, I asked him to, to, to go there. He is from uh, USP, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. So please, Mateus, this is your presentation. We have also 20 minutes for the presentation. Okay. So today I'm going to be sharing with you the initial results of an ongoing research on uncertainty management in global innovation ecosystems. This presentation is based on a research report written by myself, by Professor Leonardo Gomes from the University of Sao Paulo, 
Professor Ana Facin from the State University of Sao Paulo. And I'm very glad to tell you that it has been accepted for publication in the Technological Forecasting and Social Change Journal. It is a pleasure to be speaking here in this event. This is the agenda for my presentation, and I will begin following the advice of Ronald Coase and talking about what's going on and why it matters. In March 2020, BioNTech, a German biotechnology startup, created a partnership with Pfizer, an American pharmaceutical company, to develop an innovation to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. This was the beginning of a global innovation ecosystem. This global innovation ecosystem faced global technological and demand uncertainties and faced local uncertainties as well. BioNTech created co-innovation partnerships with companies around the world, such as Trilink in the United Kingdom and Polymon in Austria to handle those uncertainties. Pfizer also created partnerships to manage uncertainties with companies such as Croda, responsible for technologies related to the scale up of the vaccine, and Polar, a company that develops logistics solutions. Pfizer also created partnerships with research institutes for clinical trials, CEPIC here in Brazil, Fosun Pharma in China, and many others around the globe. This innovation ecosystem, however, also faced local uncertainties related to the regulatory agencies located in different countries and also the adoption by the different ministries of health that were responsible for the acquisition and distribution of this innovation. The success of this innovation is the success of a global innovation ecosystem and the success of this global innovation ecosystem is what allows us to be here together today. This research matters for two reasons, because there's a lot that we still do not know about global innovation ecosystems, what are these alignment structures and the strategies that are used. And we also have limited insights on how they manage uncertainty. And this matters as companies are using these global innovation ecosystems to develop innovations using partnerships across borders. And they are doing so managing both global and local uncertainties often simultaneously. The research question that guided our efforts was based on the gaps in the literature about knowledge dispersion and uncertainty, the governance of innovation ecosystems in a global context, and the unique features of global innovation ecosystems. The research question is how the firms manage uncertainties in global innovation ecosystems. Now we'll briefly guide you through the review of the literature and our conceptual model. In this research, we established a dialogue with the innovation ecosystems literature, which we can split as a literature that treats innovation ecosystems as collaborative structures for the development of novel focal value propositions and as common technological platforms around which companies develop their own value propositions. The uncertainty management literature is also addressed, mainly treating the issue of knowledge dispersion between people, places, and time, and how it leads to uncertainties. And we also highlight the recent works that treat the issue of collective experimentation in ecosystems to manage such uncertainties. As a methodological tool, we created a conceptual model based on a review of the literature. This conceptual model treats global value propositions, global uncertainties, local uncertainties, and dispersed knowledge as antecedents of global innovation ecosystems, which have global actors and local actors, which will lead to the activity of uncertainty management, which will, in the end, influence global innovation ecosystem performance. I will now quickly present our research design and methodology. This was a qualitative research, and this makes sense when we address a phenomenon that challenges the current theoretical frameworks the current academic understanding on a subject, and this is exactly what we found here. We began, we created a theoretical sampling of global innovation ecosystems that manage that deal with global and local uncertainties and that have operations here in Brazil. We began with a list of 11 potential cases, which we screened and finally selected four cases 
to study in depth. The data was collected using a semi-structured, a priori defined protocol over all 30 interviews were transcribed, four cases were written, and we used a data analysis methodology based on within case and across case analysis, as well as an open coding approach. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the cases. So the Line Plus ecosystem is governed, is orchestrated by a Latin American multinational. We study in ecosystems the development of a unique and single value proposition. In this case, it was a solution to use drones for the maintenance of power lines. And the solution was created using a partnership between the Brazilian subsidiary of this organization and a local Brazilian startup. And they faced global uncertainties, mostly related to the viability of the solutions of using drones for the maintenance of power lines. And they also faced some interesting local uncertainties, such as regulatory issues and things related to the specific context in Brazil. The master plan ecosystem is orchestrated by an European multinational focusing on industrial software and the innovation that we studied was the development of a new generation of industrial software to serve a global market using disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence and cloud computing. This ecosystem also faced global uncertainties revolving around the best features for this new platform and how the value proposition would evolve over time and also some specific applications of the software in the context of Brazil. How would local actors respond to these changes? The BioLeader ecosystem is orchestrated by a Brazilian biotechnology startup that operates in the biofuel sector. Specifically, we study the development of a new type of biofuel based on second generation ethanol. This Brazilian startup also faced some global uncertainties related to pricing of this product, related to the best production technologies that should be used in their development, and also some local uncertainties, mostly around the response of the local supply chain as the new standards for this innovation were put in place. Finally, we also study the smart plat ecosystem, which is orchestrated by a European organization, which has global operations in different sectors. Specifically, we study the development of a software solution, a digital platform for the use of Internet of Things technology. This ecosystem faced some global uncertainties related to the co-evolution, the integration of this platform, and also the business models that would be more appropriate for the solution and faced local uncertainties related to the platform scale up in Brazil, regulatory issues in the country. Now let's get to what is the more interesting part of this presentation, which is the results of our research efforts. So analyzing the data, analyzing the cases, talking to these managers, realize that there are three main tasks that are relevant for the management of global innovation ecosystems. There is something that is related to the assessment of the scope of uncertainty. This means that these managers have a task, a challenge in one, of understanding whether they are dealing with a local uncertainty, one that is relevant only for one country, or if they are dealing with a global uncertainty, one that is relevant for more than one country they operate in. This global innovation ecosystem all face challenges related to the governance of the ecosystem. There are sets of rules, roles, procedures, and overall mechanisms that can be used based on different governance structures, and this becomes more relevant in these multinational corporations which have many subsidiaries and the headquarters. We then identify three archetypical strategies that are used by the focal firms in the management of this global innovation ecosystems. These firms often face the challenge or the dilemma of either internalizing 
uncertainty management and dealing with it using their own R&D infrastructure or sharing this uncertainty management with other organizations. And more interesting, perhaps, we also discovered a novel way that these companies manage uncertainty, which is by outsourcing the uncertainty management discovery to other firms, mostly complementers in digital platforms. So let's take a deep dive into these concepts. Uncertainty scope relates to the geographic boundaries of a specific uncertainty. These managers need to first assess whether the uncertainty, technological uncertainty, market uncertainty, regulatory uncertainty is specific to a single country or whether it exists in many different other locations. And we see that managers struggle with this process. Let me illustrate it for you. So Line Plus, our global innovation ecosystem developing a drone solution for power line maintenance, they had to deal with some very specific local uncertainties here in Brazil, such as the use of this solution in favelas, the Brazilian slums, which have a very specific structure. They also face the same issue with microclimates, such as the Andes in Peru. However, they also face simultaneously global uncertainties about the feasibility of this solution of whether it was possible to use these drones to conduct the maintenance of the power lines. BioLeader, our global ecosystem developing the new generation of biofuels, faced a similar situation. They had global uncertainties that related to the best technological production solutions that they could use. And in order to deal with them, they decided to partner with companies that, were, that had this technology or they had more knowledge about it in Europe. They also faced some very local uncertainties that related to the supply of the raw materials that were necessary for this type of innovation. What we see uh, is that there is a dynamic nature of assessing uncertainty scope as identifying a local uncertainty can often lead to the revelation of a global uncertainty and vice versa. Another key task and key activity is the governance of the global innovation ecosystem, which you can define as the rules, the roles, the mandates, and the mechanisms to approach global and local uncertainty. So there are different roles that can be defined using this governance phase. For example, roles for the subsidiary or the headquarters to play or the external partners to play in this uncertainty management effort. There are different rules that need to be followed, rules that are set by the focal firm and different mandates that are given for the external partners, for the subsidiaries, for the headquarters to address these uncertainties. Let me illustrate. So Master Plan, which is our industrial software global innovation ecosystem, they created a program here in Brazil to experiment with local startups to manage local uncertainties. However, the solutions cannot be used in the global platform without explicit approval from the headquarters. A similar situation is seen in SmartPlat, our Internet of Things global innovation ecosystem. The Brazilian subsidiary has a specific mandate to experiment with local startups to manage local marketing uncertainties, but the solutions cannot be integrated into their platforms without the approval of the headquarters. Line Plus, our drone ecosystem, also faced interesting governance challenges as the subsidiary was responsible for managing the global ecosystem. It's a little bit different from the other cases. The subsidiary actually had the mandate to orchestrate this experimentation and to coordinate the knowledge flow of subsidiaries in Peru, subsidiaries in Mexico, for example. Now, we also identify that in order to manage this uncertainty, these global innovation ecosystems use different types of strategies, and the strategies are determined in some sense by the governance structure that is in place. So there's always a tension, always a dilemma when we talk about uncertainty management in ecosystems, as the focal firm may choose to internalize the 
management of uncertainties use their own R&D department to address some uncertainties. And it is common that they do so before sharing them with their external partners. There are also cooperative, collaborative strategies that are used when the focal firm establishes partnerships with other organizations to address this uncertainty. And there is a result that is less obvious in this research, which is the idea that there is such a thing as autonomous uncertainty management when the focal firms use digital platforms more open in nature to collaborators, established firms and startups, so that they can conduct the uncertainty management efforts themselves without strong coordination mechanisms. Let me illustrate. So SmartPlat, which is our IoT, IoT global innovation ecosystem, they decided to internalize the management of some critical technological uncertainties about their solution before sharing them with the other members of their ecosystem. BioLead, which we could call an internal uncertainty management strategy. BioLeader, when developing the new generation of biofuels, decided to partner with some companies in Europe to create collaborative uncertainty management agreements to identify and deal with the relevant technological uncertainties. Master Plan, however, used a different approach. They created a digital platform that enables them to outsource uncertainty management to startups and other complementers, basically creating a collective experiment with weak coordination, what we call an autonomous uncertainty management strategy. So the main result, the main contribution of our research is the framework for global uncertainty management in global innovation ecosystems. Let me guide you through. So the process begins with the identification. Okay. You okay. need to conclude. Uh, I'll get it done. Uh, so it begins with the identification of an uncertainty, which leads to an assessment of whether this uncertainty is local or global, the definition of a strategy to tackle this uncertainty and the mitigation of this uncertainty. However, as you have seen, the governance of the ecosystem plays a major role. There needs to be an alignment between the governance structure, one that enables this scope assessment to take place. There is also an interplay between the definition of the strategy and the governance. So there needs to be a coherence analysis between the governance of the ecosystem and the strategies that are adopted. We also have an influence from the uncertainty management strategies on the uncertainty scope assessment as the existing portfolio of strategies might not enable the focal firm and the ecosystem to address these uncertainties. And also that perhaps a richer portfolio of strategies gives the focal firms and the other members in the ecosystem a, more, a richer portfolio of strategies to deal with such uncertainties. There is also an interplay between the uncertainty management strategies and governance and changing the, multiple, the portfolio of strategies might influence the governance structure of the ecosystem and vice versa as changes in the governance might impact the portfolio of strategies. And there you have it, the framework for uncertainty management in global innovation ecosystems. Let me talk a little bit about our contributions from a more academic perspective. So we add to the uncertainty literature by adding a new typology, global and local uncertainties and the notion that there is a scope assessment that is critical in these ecosystems. We add to the uncertainty management governance in ecosystems literature by showing how this governance influences global innovation ecosystems. And we also add to the ecosystem strategy literature by presenting the autonomous uncertainty management strategy. There are obvious research boundaries related to, to our efforts based on the qualitative methodology that we adopted, the sample and the setting in Brazil. And I call for other researchers to help us in these efforts of better understanding global innovation ecosystems. Thank you very much. Well, we have a few minutes for a debate. Uh, so.
Professor von Orthus. So this is, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very So this is actually the subject of my PhD thesis, and I'm going after this data. I believe that the most critical uh, okay. okay. So the most critical data is in the linkages, right, between the actors in the ecosystems. So it is my understanding we have a small amount of data, small amount of understanding of how the actors in these ecosystems communicate in this international setting, how knowledge is transmitted, how knowledge is transmitted, for example, from the headquarters to the subsidiary, from the subsidiary to an external actor, and how it makes this way around. I think this is a critical part of managing these innovation ecosystems. And we are doing some qualitative research trying to come up with this data to better understand this phenomenon. Do you think there is any chance that alternative indicators can give you that? Messages between people, tweets? Uh, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. From what I have seen, there's a lot of internal communication that goes on in the companies, these business cases, as they call it, as they send the information that is local to their headquarters and vice versa, but definitely there could be something to look at uh, in this profile. I think LinkedIn is an excellent source and one that we are using a lot to try to gather this information at a more micro level. Thank you for the question, Professor. Hi everyone, and still good morning, two minutes. So I'm talking today about uh, the Latin American inside countries in session into the hydrogen global value chain. That's a uh, work I'm developing with Professor Andre Furtado here in, at King Cisco. And the agenda for today so I, I'll talk about why we are um, interested in the hydrogen industry formation in the Latin American countries and um, how they are developing technology in hydrogen trajectories and their relative specialization. We use patent data for that matter. And also we, um, we look at international event of collaboration networks in, hydro in this hydrogen technological trajectories. And then I'll go to, I will conclude the remarks so far. So the, our, our theme is inside the, the question of industry formation, late comer contest but um, especially in the cases of clean tech industries, in which we see many cases in the literature where the relevant knowledge, the firms, and the, the knowledge is outside, is already established in industrialized countries. So this is a special case. And um, in this paper, we specifically look 
at the question of complex transnational linkage and how they are expected to help this industry formation dynamics in clean tech, where this, the firms from, from this late common context, they go access knowledge outside their countries and their regions. And through generic absorption, they bring this capacity. And um, also, we look at different um, technological trajectories inside hydrogen. It's like the technology we have, we are, we are seeing uh, a moving, a transition in hydrogen technology. And it's so, it's, um, it also can influence the catching up in these countries. So hydrogen is now, there is a, a big expectation uh, around hydrogen, especially to the carbon, helping decarbonize the, the energy production and economic activities by 2050. So to decarbonize, we need to move from the gray hydrogen, the one produced from fossil fuels, to other alternatives like the blue hydrogen that's produced using carbon capture and use it in storage technologies. And also the green hydrogen that is Sorry, thank you. And the green hydrogen that's produced mainly from electrolysis, water electrolysis, and renewable energy sources. So um, the expectation in the net zero scenario is that first, this hydrogen, more the clean hydrogen, is used for convert the existing uses of fossil energy into the into low carbon hydrogen and after 2030 hydrogen in the use is expected to increase rapidly in all sectors. So the main uh, value chains that are pointed now are transport, buildings and power generation for the future. But today mainly for the industry that already uses hydrogen, the oil refining industry, ammonia production, methanol production, they are mainly using hydrogen from fossil fuels right now, so they can be the ones that start the increasing the demand for the clean hydrogen. The question is that for clean hydrogen, we need um, a lot of um, renewable resources. In Latin America and these other countries that are with the red color, they, these regions, they all have a high potential to produce renewable energy. And so they are expected to produce hydrogen, the clean hydrogen with low costs. So um, a Latin America, for example, already demands 5% of global hydrogen. So it could, it is used today for ammonia, methanol and steel and refined oil products. So it could demand the clean hydrogen also produce it for exports. So near term, the expectation is that this um, already existing industry could absorb the shares of the low hydrogen and then also facilitate the integration of these renewables like wind and solar to the existing power grids and provide the long duration storage and flexible power. So uh, when we look at patent data, we see um, now here we divide three key trajectories. The hydrogen technology that we call hydrogen technology here are the non-carbon containing sources, from non-carbon containing sources, the cleaner one. Then we have the full cells and applications to electric vehicles. And the third trajectory is the hydrogen full production, full production, the one from fossil fuel supply. So, but we see that these three tra trajectories, technological trajectories, they had patent, been patenting since the 70s, 80s. 
but they only started growing more from the beginning of the 2000s. But full cells is one that grows faster and has more um, patents. Then we see also after the 2010s that the hydrogen tech, the cleaner one we consider here, um, growed faster than hydrogen fuel after 2010. So we are seeing different patterns here. And when we look at the Latin American countries, they have a small share of patents in the, in the three trajectories, but we calculated the uh, revealed technological advantage to see relative specialization. And we see also distant patterns here. For full cells and, and applications to electric vehicles, no Latin America country specific have, has like, um, relative specialization that, but hydrogen technology, the one for non-carbon containing sources is a relative specialization for Mexico, Chile, and Colombia, especially in the last period, the around 2009 onwards. And hydrogen fuel production, the one from the fossil fuel supply is a relative specialization for Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. Uh, we also wanted to look at the main hydrogen patent applicants, the ones that uh, owners own the patents. So for Latin America countries, the top patent owner is Petrobras. And um, then we have a lot of public and governmental institutions from other Latin American countries and also Brazil. But uh, Petrobras is not the, a research institution, but is a company that is following a, a clear strategy in the field since we see that when we look at the top, the world top patent applicants in hydrogen technology and hydrogen fuel, we see all the oil and gas companies and also some of the automotive industry companies. The difference is that full cells, we have a high concentration in big company and Toyota is like the concentrated the most patents in that area. So for the International Event of Collaboration Network, this one is the complete network, the one that has all the, the trajectories and all the, the countries. It's just to illustrate how do we represent the network is the structure of the collaboration. So we have the nodes are the countries and the ties, the edges represent the technological co collaboration between countries. We have countries that have concentrate a lot of the patents. So we calculate um, a measure of centrality called the hubs and authorities to identify the importance of these countries that by their, the importance of these network neighbors, the ones that they connect to. So the nations that cooperate with almost other countries are classified as core countries in these networks. And we also calculate the partition. So a contextual view. So we sharing this network to see together um, the countries that no, do not belong to the core, that do not belong to the, the hubs are shrinked and we produce another network here. We have a network for each of the trajectories and that network shows the, the hubs. US is the hub, the main hub for the three networks and the Latin America countries, they are in the net, this network only connecting to mainly to the core countries. They do not connect to each other. That's uh, a thing to observe. Like Latin American countries are not collaborating with each other in hydrogen technologies, not uh, 
in, in any of these trajectories. And they also do not, they rarely connect to countries outside the core. They are really connecting to the core and through um, very different um, applicants. So they, they do not follow a same strategy. So we also have network uh, metrics and they, they are important to show that the full cells one um, network has the highest number of countries than N number. They have 63 countries participating at the highest number of edges. So in the full cells, there is the more diversity of members in this network and they are connect collaborating more. And uh, the Latin America countries, they have these values of eigenvectors. They, they show how they are in relation to the core. So they have really, very, really low values. And also they show some different patterns because Brazil and Colombia, they are more connected in the, the networks that are from hydrogen flow. And Mexico and Argentina are more connected in the hydrogen technical networks. Mm -hmm. Chile has no connection. It, it, not, it does patenting by itself. It's not collaborating right now. So I still have time, but I want to discuss a lot, a lot, a little about our results. So um, the hydrogen technological development in Latin America started before the 90s, which had, um, had attention from the government and investment in all the periods and also in, in the world because it has developed in other times, but now um, there is uh, increasing expectation for Latin America countries, there is more than 20 projects commissioned for the production of hydrogen. So, um, now it's increasing uh, in hydrogen technologies, and it's there is expectation to lower the cost of production, and also the need for the transition to a low carbon economy that is influencing this whole development. So Brazil has the most um, number of patents in, in hydrogen, but the whole group of the region of Latin America has accumulated few patents in this area. This is a, a limitation that we look only to patent data yet. But when you look at the Revealed Technological Advantage Index, we see that in the most recent period, there was a relative specialization and the countries followed different trajectories. Mainly Mexico, Chile, Colombia are going to the non-carbon containing sources. And Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia are still in the hydrogen crew. But, um, and that the, this, this whole technological development in Latin America countries has been concentrated in public and governmental institutions. But, and Latin America have a limited incession into the invention, collaboration networks of hydrogen. They have few connections, but they are mainly collaborating with the countries from the network core the countries that accumulate the most number of patents and also the highest collaborations. Well, there is no indication of regional collaboration on patents and is um, no indication in, in, in the development of these projects that are being commissioned. They are 
not um, between countries connect projects they are being doing in individual miners. And the presence of the same companies of, from the full oil and gas and automotive industry in this distinct technological trajectories of hydrogen, the clean one and the other that's not clean is an education of technological relation between them. And we can better analyze that by relatedness. This is an idea for continuing the research. So um, we want to see that if this is, this, these industries, they are related. This is an opportunity for diversification. So transitioning to a low carbon hydrogen can be an opportunity also inside the oil and gas producing industry in these countries to take advantage of the existing capacities, the specialized work and infrastructure to follow this diversification path. So this is what we are looking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have also 10 minutes of uh, debate. So Morning. Thanks, Vanessa for your presentation, very interesting piece, and raise the doubt. Um, it's actually, it's probably an issue for future research. Uh, you mentioned that this is, this seems to be clearly mission-oriented policy, because you have this strong involvement from public um, institutions, as you mentioned. And uh, my question, you probably won't be able, able to answer it right now, but it's just some food for thought is why don't we have stronger engagement from private actors? Because if maybe you um, achieve some answers when you start looking into the complexity and relatedness um, issues. But I, I think that's really important because if you do not engage these private actors in terms of innovation, you might have these uh, situations that don't move forward. They have these policies, they're interesting, they, they're promising, but how do you translate that actually into economic competitiveness in, in Latin American countries in this case? I, I think this is the main issue that at least in my perspective will, will be interesting to see in the future. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. It's, yes, it's, it's um, ideas for following, but it's interesting also to look at the, the patents that these Latin American countries have. They are mainly from these um, public institutions, but when they cooperate with other countries, they are mainly not cooperating with other um, with firms, with enterprises. So they are also cooperating with institutions and public institutions. So this, this is something that needs to go deeper. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, insightful presentation. Uh, not comments or questions, but uh, kind of suggestion for further improvements. The first thing is that, uh, as you showed us, the number of patents are very small, you know, four and five and so on. With very small number of patents, the RTA index may have some biased information. So maybe you may have some qualitative analysis for the patent directly and so on. So uh, other alternative methodologies should be supplemented. And second comment is that uh, maybe we need some additional analysis for the usage of that technology. Is there any vehicle uh, industry to utilize hydrogen technologies uh, or other related industries, not only technology? So we need to have a due balance on the perspective between 
knowledge generation and then for document utilization of technology. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I like the presentation. I think it's a uh, very good work. Um, okay, two things. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I might have missed it, but um, first of all, um, hydrogen technology is a contested uh, technology in the sense that it might uh, um, threaten vested interest, and especially the companies that that seem to be involved in that. Right. So I uh, so. Maybe you could say a bit uh, on that, uh, uh, because I'm not an expert on that. So I would really like to know a bit more about, um, I think it's also related to my second comment is, um, there are different ways of producing hydrogen, right? So uh, you can do it in a very clean way, right? And I think it uh, refers to as green hydrogen, and then there is blue, I think, and green, gray hydrogen, uh, in which you use uh, fossil fuels, uh, to produce hydrogen, right? So uh, and um, so, the nature of technology development is also very important. Uh, and, and and what type of actors would actually promote that? I guess the the ones uh, the big companies that you are mentioning, uh, there are already part of this old regime uh, that uh, uh, that is very much based on uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so they might have an interest to move the techno technological development in a certain direction, which is in line with their own interest. This might not be the optimal solution for society as a whole. So uh, um, I have to take that on board. Uh, again, I might have missed it. But, um... Thank you. So um, for this, we use the literature from the the EPO and the, the IEA from where they classify what is hydrogen technologies and which ones are the hydrogen that are the cleaner, the for no carbon sources, and the ones that are from carbon sources. So they and this is their classification that I use. So I I did not dig on this matter of looking of the technological difference myself. It's not in the area, but um, I'm following the the idea. But I I think that when we look at the relate the related technologies, it will be more clear to see um, when they are co-occurring with other technologies, probably they are going very different um, pattern of collaboration, of co-occurrence, co because they are very different technologies. And it, um, it's what I, I, I want to see and what I, I'm implying that this is the strategy of transitioning for these companies that they not are applying technologies for mixing their energy sources, but they are also trying to do some cleaning on the already existing production process. So this is a strategy. And it, when I look at this, how, how they are present in this cleaner trajectory, I think this is um, an education that they, they are following this strategy. But since um, the hydrogen technologies not from non carbon containing sources, they are uh, involved in much more applications and new trajectories also, they can um, appear, there appear new companies too okay, that are not from this old um, other trajectory, they are entering the market and with completely new uses of hydrogen, clean hydrogen. So, yes. uh, 
We can, we can make uh, I can make a last comment because uh, I think the, the paper is interesting because uh, we can see that the uh, diversification eh? it's in some sense hydrogen is uh, a diversification of energy uh, is related in this case in I think in Latin America much more to the uh, to the resource eh, that, that we have we have a uh, Advanced natural resource advantage in, in hydrogen, right? and uh, this uh, can be understood as a, an opportunity. To, uh, so, as uh, Vanessa explained, to, as a catch-up opportunity for the region. Right? And uh, now we, we are attracting a very great investment. We, we have uh, investment. Some of them are made by. Uh, uh, multinational oil companies in Latin America right? because they are interested in to clean their production right? and uh, hydro green hydrogen is a way to make this and, and I think in Latin America we have a great opportunity to produce green hydrogen but uh, in some sense uh, the, the hypothesis of the paper is, is that uh, we have uh, some capabilities in the region and uh, this capability can be used to make this transition uh, for green hydrogen. So uh, and, and we are mixing some sense uh, the natural resource endowment, very good natural resource, you know, sunlight, uh, or even biofuels, etc., which can be a, a route for getting access to hydrogen. Then we can join this with some uh, local capabilities. So, in the, in this sense, and at, at the other side, attract new players no? uh, from outside no? that have uh, complementary capabilities and even access to foreign markets. Because uh, in, in this strategy, in Latin America is sought uh, in some sense to make the region uh, an exporter of uh, hydrogen. No? On board the spot of it. So, in this sense, we are rich and we want to create a global value chain huh? in some sense. Uh, in hydrogen, and Latin America could be a, a good place to take advantage of global value chain in hydrogen. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we are going to the third presentation now. And I see your So and I, I unmuted myself. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, we can hear you. We can hear me, great. Share the screen. Okay. Right, can you see my screen? I, I have a note that can, you can. Um, can you hear me and can you see my screen? We can hear you, but uh, yeah, and you can see your slides. You can see my slides? Not yet. I am sharing my screen and hopefully you are able to see it. Yes. Yep. Yes, we, we are, we yes, can, we can, can, we can see your presentation and hear you. All right, brilliant. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Esin Yoruk. I'm an associate professor at Coventry University in the UK. 
Um, first of all, very, very many thanks to uh, the organ organizing team at the conference to invite our paper to, pre to present this very interesting and insightful uh, conference with lots of interesting papers. Uh, I would like to be there in person, but it had to be this way. But uh, these uh, digital uh, advances, you know, uh, make the proximity of me to you. I'm on the Aegean coast at the moment of Turkey, and it just makes me so close to you. I've been listening to all the papers very uh, with great interest up to now. Nonetheless, I'm here to present our paper with uh, Denise Yoruk and uh, Paolo Figuerido on the sectoral uh, resilience through learning in networks and global value chains. So I hope you find it uh, interesting. Uh, Ms. Essing, just, uh, just a moment. I think your camera might... Well, my my you, camera, camera, you can't see me. Yeah, I don't no, know we, why. Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Although yeah. we see the slides. But yeah, um, I don't know why. Can you see me now? Oh, hang on. No, it was closed. How about this now? Can you see me now? Yes, we can see you now. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Sorry about that. I'm on a new laptop. <laughs> so so I, I, it was just uh, turned off the camera. So it's on now. Great. Okay. So um, just motivation at the moment. My outline will start with motivation. Uh, briefly introduce you how we approach the concept of resilience from an economic and regional studies perspective. How we incorporated networks and inter-organizational learning into our framework. We have used adaptation and adaptability concepts of uh, Ron Boschma for this. Introduce the framework. Uh, briefly talk about data and methods. We collected the data from Poland. Our data comes from Poland uh, and I will introduce the empirical evidence and our results and talk a little bit about the um, implications. Um, so after Brexit and COVID pandemic, we started hearing a lot about the uh, resilience, uh, the, the concept of resilience, but it has been actually um, touched upon a lot uh, in the last two decades. So in the economic literature, uh, they are a bit stuck in macro indicators. They look at the GDP growth. They look at, look at the employment growth, how a country uh, bounces back from uh, a crisis, uh, a very hard crisis. And this would usually be an economic crisis, whether it bounces back or not in the short term they would, they would look at GDP growth and employment growth bouncing back to its original levels. But then in the regional resilience um, literature, there's actually an evolutionary perspective from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, Boschma and colleagues, uh, look back uh, Pike et al, Martin et al, they have a lot of uh, work they have done about, from part dependency to part evolution and looking at the reju rejuvenation of industries, how, the, how these old industries have transformed formed from old to new. Actually, Boschma was talking about all these in the morning in a very striking presentation. And then uh, he has a lot of work in 2015, a seminal paper, role of those knowledge networks and global value chains within the region, how they can bring about the regional resilience. So he has really established all the background uh, to take this further. So what we, what we are doing is that looking at his historical legacy, legacy of the regions is important. He says that look at, look at the history of the region. So we take on that and then we uh, focus on Poland to bring about some kind of uh, conceptual framework, what we mean uh, with this path dependency to path evolution and how we incorporate knowledge networks into this. Uh, two views on the concept of resilience. As I said, the traditional one is the short term one, ability to rapidly recover from external shocks and doesn't really tell much to us uh, how to progress, but the evolutionary perspective is telling us uh, bouncing back to a steady state, but developing new growth paths, sustain long-term development through adaptation and adaptability. So we build on that heavily uh, on the definition of regional resilience, on the role of knowledge networks in building this resilience and, and that the history matters. Um, we extend the concept of networking 
from knowledge networks it much more really um, focuses on to gvcs as well because it is important in the context of transition late comer and emerging market economies so poland was a uh, socialist economy and from socialist economy to market economy they were transitioning at, at the time we collected our data and then we also uh, incorporate the interorganizational learning uh, into our uh, con uh, conceptual framework and we uh, we we ask the question how have interorganizational inter learning in networks and GVCs contributed to building sectoral resilience in a low and medium technology process intensive industries in Poland during the transition period from centrally planned to market economy? And we specifically picked food processing sector and, and the clothing sectors. Right, we then extend the uh, framework for that so knowledge networks to gvcs building of sectoral resilience and then we move on to introduce the interorganizational learning into this process oops and we how do we uh, look at the interorganizational learning processes so how do we um, measure those so we uh, we captured mainly the external learning me mechanisms, and we rely on uh, Malerva's taxonomy for that 1992 seminal paper. Uh, Fontun Salman and Wang have worked on it a little bit. They said that sources of knowledge come from production, consumption, and search supply. We uh, match this with uh, Malerva's taxonomy on learning by spillovers, learning by interacting, and learning from advances in science and technology and education. So spillovers would be about interactions, horizontal horizontally related to the firms in the industry interacting would be upstream suppliers or downstream customers users uh, other firms in the industry and learning from advances in science and technology will be uh, looking at into their interactions with universities research labs and and consultancy firms and then we uh, then bring in adaptability and adaptation is very difficult uh, to uh, actually we had we found it a, a very difficult to operationalize this but they've been very useful as well they have the ability to operationalize this resilience concept so how we go go about that we uh, look at this adaptation and adaptability in the historical historical path dependence way uh, using our um, primary data using our primary data, I'll come to that in a minute. But before then, what adaptation and adaptability means in, 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 in Boschmann's words. So adaptation refers to a movement towards a preconceived path in the short run, strong and tight couplings between social agents, whereas adaptability is defined as the dynamic capacity to affect and unfold multiple evolutionary trajectories. The links could be loose and weak and between those social agents, but it will be uh, bringing some dynamism in the long run if, if, uh, if there is adaptability uh, in the process. And it is not a trade-off between adaptability or adaptation. Uh, they can coexist. Uh, these can be local, international, dense or lo loose relations in a mixed way uh, uh, and can be found in uh, the network structures and characteristics of the regions. Now, one thing they've done really nice is that they have defined this control, efficiency and openness dimensions of, uh, of these um, relationships uh, in the context of when that they were defining adaptation and adaptability, which we really found useful and we, we took it uh, uh, further. So we uh, looked at uh, the network characteristics uh, by uh, the indicators that we have collected uh, in our primary data in Poland during the transition time. So for the control dimension, for instance, we looked at initiator of the network, whether it is the partner or the firm, uh, level of formality in the network, whether it is formal or informal, we, we uh, um, uh, operationalize efficiency by continuity of the network, whether it is continuous relationship or occasional or one-off, and the openness by looking at the geographical origin of the partner, whether it be domestic or foreign, and the direction of knowledge flow being bidirectional or unidirectional. Now, when the partner initiates this relationship, it's restricted to the knowledge al uh, uh, allowed by the partner, the firm, the, the receiving end, uh, is restricted to knowledge allowed by the partner. When the firm initiates it, it's an active learner. So they're ready to you know, uh, be more proactive and gain what they can from this relationship. Formal 
relations relations have high degree of control where informal relations have uh, you, you are more flexible articulation of tested knowledge you can pick on knowledge spillovers for product development and problem solving continuous relations there is trust, but then it uh, it is said that the previous literature says that it hampers the search for knowledge because you're stuck to the knowledge that your partner has and you cannot expand on that. Whereas occasional and one-off relations, you can reach out to more diverse range of knowledge and expertise. Um, uh, again, we are picking this from the extant literature. Domestic partner is uh, about sticking to what is available locally, where if you go with the foreign partners, access to wider sources of up to date and state of uh, the art knowledge is possible to uh, get access to. This is important in the transition and emerging market countries. Again, bi directional knowledge transfer is about more similarities and complementarities in the knowledge base of cooperating partners because you would be approaching to those partners, then um, you, you share some, some, some common ground. With the unidirectional knowledge transfer, uh, it is said that receiving and benefits more from the transaction in the long term. They they have access to some new knowledge they don't they don't have about and these are uh, uh, coming through mostly technology purchase licensing subcontracting kind of activities so uh, and then we built this uh, analytical framework looking uh, at the data from 1989 to 2001 this is our primary data and after the transition because poland became um, a European Union member in uh, 2004, I think. So we have this data from 2004 to 2018. Uh, we can go to Eurostat and we can look at the, uh, all the all the networks of Poland uh, in the industry uh, industry level uh, from Eurostat database. So we look at uh, the network characteristics here: learning, adaptation, adaptability, uh, feeding into historical and path dependence and path evolution, changes in network density, and some other characteristics at the level of uh, sectors and contributing to building of sectoral resilience. This is the focus of our paper as the framework. Um, yeah, so we collected our data in um, I think it was collected in uh, 2010 or so uh, for the, you know, maybe maybe around 2002, um, between 1989 and 2001, we have involved um, food processing and clothing sectors uh, um, hang on, it just went back. Yeah, food processing and clothing sectors. We collected all these indicators that we uh, use in our uh, framework. And then we use secondary data and we do some descriptive analysis looking into these uh, indicators production growth, employment growth, uh, networks of the innovative enterprises, and what kind of networks they do have. Um, why we pick Poland? Because Poland is actually a, a country uh, which has bounced back from all of the um, crisis very well compared to all other uh, countries in Europe. And there is a huge literature about this in the economic resilience literature. Their GDP bounced back, their employment growth bounced back uh, quickly. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute with this data. But the primary data comes from uh, Polish food processing and clothing firms over a 12 year period. We looked at largely domestic, large domestically owned firms. They all have uh, over 500 employees and uh, we looked at their links uh, and all together they have 467 links, which allows us to do some regression analysis. Um, okay. Right, so this, these are the first descriptive findings from the primary primary data. So at that time between 1989 and uh, early 1990s and late 1990s, before they joined the European Union there, in, they were uh, both sectors were increasing in networks, but different network patterns emerged. Food processing firms were establishing more knowledge networks, but also gradually integrating into GVCs. They didn't at the beginning, but the clothing firms were highly integrated into GV GVCs already at the beginning of the 1990s, and they kept to this. And uh, some other things uh, which emerged different uh, in these sectors is that networks initiated uh, by firms in the food sector, they were actively going and looking for more relationships with uh, foreign firms, for instance. Uh, but a shift from domestic to foreign partners in food 
uh, opposite in clothing was happening. A shift to one of relations in food, but opposite was happening uh, in food. They were more sticking to their trustworthy relationships. We, we observe formal relations in both sectors and a dominance of uni, unidirectional knowledge flow in uh, both of the sectors. So this is what our data tells us. Uh, here I'm showing you some uh, data from um, uh, 2005 to 2008. This is the secondary data. So the graphs to look at here is now we compare Poland. It's the solid line in all these uh, graphs. Uh, Poland with Hungary and Czech Republic because they're in part to uh, Poland. So you can see that 2008 crisis uh, growth rate in production value of food processing has dipped down, but it bounced back over zero. You know, after that, very good and. Uh, Poland has always been positive, where Czech Republic and Hungary have been a little bit going to uh, negative values uh, after that. With the clothing, though, again, a dip, uh, and then it's, it struggles to come up to uh, zero, uh, over zero values. You know, it takes time to recover. With the employment growth rate, you see, um, again, 2008 crisis, the crisis happening. Um, uh, Poland is showing first a little bit um, below zero values, but it goes up. With the clothing, it's very, uh, it's just not happening, really. Couldn't get to above zero values. Um, for for long years um so this is this is what was happening in the economic level but the the values of these um when you look at the sectoral uh, interactions um, in the food processing how these firms were then interacting and developing their networks although there's a little bit increase decrease in the food processing sector from 40 to 35 percent this was more prominent uh, in the clothing sector it was it just links have disappeared. And when we look at what kinds of links were disappearing, so you look at food processing and you see that actually uh, research links were increasing in the food. This is the uh, white bars in this graph. They were increasing. They kept, kept on to their relationships with suppliers and with customers and everything. They stayed in place. But with the clothing sector, again, all these links from 2004 to 16, they have decreased uh, in considerable amounts. So that's what we establish uh, different trends in two different uh, uh, sectors. Now, when we move on to our um, yeah, why can't I move in here? Yeah, when I move on to our uh, regression analysis, we have conducted uh, multinomial logistic regressions. But I'm, uh, it gives us three models for learning types, each of the learning types that I have discussed uh, earlier. I will show you this uh, picture, which is, which is more um, explanatory. So learning from knowledge spillovers um, was closely associated with knowledge networks. The partner initiating the uh, interaction, informal interactions, continuous interactions, and foreign partner. You see a mix of adaptation and adaptability here. With learning by interacting, it is the uh, similar story. Adaptation and adaptability is here. But with learning from advances in science and technology and education, you see the firm initiating one of uh, uh, relationships, unidirectional relationships, more on the adaptability side and and food processing industry comes uh, significant uh, in this model. In these uh, two models, uh, both sectors are showing uh, the same uh, kind of adaptability. So we, we say that, so in our descriptive analysis over time, we've shown that food processing sector distinguished itself as the resilient sector in Poland compared to clothing. And we can provide some explanations to this with this uh, uh, analysis from multinomial regressions going to the historical data because uh, engaging in global value chains with foreign partners and increased adaptability happened in both sectors but food processing uh, was not only able to use its networks for le learning from spillovers and interacting but also expand their learning to incorporate advances from science and technology so this brought some kind of adaptability factor uh, to sustain the sector Sector in the in the long run, so they were able to absorb the shocks better in 2018. Um, and if I talk about some implications of uh, of this research, then I would say that um, uh, yeah, I'm finishing. 
just the last, this is the last slide, what kind of uh, actually implications we can have post Brexit and post COVID for that. We are talking about disrupted supply chains and global value chains that are calls for localization and uh, forgetting about international links, especially in the UK. Uh, there's this kind of ideology now being uh, uh, inserted on us, but our results suggest that uh, this connection from GVCs and knowledge networks is not a good idea. These networks should be re-established and functioning for resilience in future crises to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, shall, yes, shall I share my screen and see you? Yeah, I, I can hear you well. Asim, this is Nick. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, uh, talk a little bit more about policy implications. So you are you start from the data and and then what do we learn out of this? Um, what do you can do with somebody who has the policy decision making? Uh, some policy implications. Uh, can you please, uh, I couldn't hear you well. Policy implications? Yes, policy implications. Yeah, so uh, uh, I would, I would uh, say that um, the policy implications should be about, you know, increasing these knowledge networks and increasing uh, 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 embeddedness in the global value chains uh, for the sectors, you know, to get stronger and uh, to get um, um, really connected to uh, global uh, global linkages. It doesn't it doesn't just make sense, you know, uh, that you 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 are going to be well on your own if you try to you know uh, produce whatever you are specialized at. Because the clothing sector was a very very strong sector in Poland to start with, but then it lost all its uh, effectiveness. Some people say that this might be due to some competition from China, uh, you know, emerging. Uh, but they really had really good products you know they were they really had really good quality products um, and uh, they could be on par with italy or so had they kept to their relationships this did not happen so what what comes out of this research is that don't undermine global interactions and uh, yeah uh, i think all the policy should be uh, improving uh, networks and uh, all forms of uh, knowledge networks and uh, embedding firms in the global value chains as much as possible. Not only the large firms, probably the SMEs as well. If I can follow up on this, um, you may know from the literature that probably we will see a little bit later from uh, that he has uh, he has been proposing a, um, an idea of in out in yes. um, in the uh, value chains. Do you see anything like this here? Um, um, do Do you mean it in the case of uh, clothing sector, for instance? They were in, then out, and then they might be in again. Do you mean in that sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, once capabilities are lost, and when once there's competition from other uh, sectors, other, other countries, and probably other regions as well, because Italy uh, is a big competitor in that sense in high quality products, and China and Turkey have been in the lower quality products, uh, it has been difficult. Uh, I think uh, we have to do another research, go and uh, collect data from clothing companies over there, but we already have the secondary data that their links have been diminished a lot, and uh, probably they will be specializing on something else in Poland. And probably Ron Boschmann's new recent, recent work will, will shed a lot of light on that. If we would be able to see his, uh, you know, nice charts uh, with bubbles uh, for the clothing, uh, that would be an interesting uh, thing to find out, yeah. I think it's very sector dependent. Uh, I don't think that it will happen with the clothing sector, if that's your question. 
Okay, I move on. Uh, my name is Susan Schaefer from uh, from Jena. I found, I found your um, presentation really interesting, um, but I would like to critically um, or um, yeah ask you a question: Why you choose the perspective of the of the industries or the sectors? Um, let me yeah. explain that a little bit. When you when you have an, a shock, a political or economic shock. Then, from a policy perspective, um, then I think the uh, prosperity or the well-being of, of the population um, is, is probably at stake. So, when we apply the idea of resilience, it doesn't need to be a bounce back in sectoral patterns, but a bounce back in, let's say, income or um, let's say, um, general health. So, so from the only from the perspective of policy making. So, what what are the benefits, but also maybe the the difficulties in applying the sectoral perspective? Okay, um, it was it was easier to study the sector because we had the data uh, in terms of our research. We had the data on on these two sectors. The primary data, the historical data, came from specifically these two sectors. So we, on the, on the other hand, we had to focus on these sectors. Now, we could, of course, look at where these firms are located and uh, do a regional, uh, you know, do a regional study on that for Poland, you know, where these firms are located. We could do that. But then the question would be, are we capturing all the firms in those regions in these two sectors? So may, it wouldn't be uh, really a re reliable way to do the analysis. So we are restricted uh, by our data here. It's, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, now, um, if, we only, if we go and collect the data now, probably 10 years later, we can uh, repeat this, uh, this kind of research. So it had to be on the sector level, but this does not necessarily mean that, you know, a policy implications could, could not be drawn from this. For the sectoral, uh, at the sectoral level, it can be. You know, food sector is, uh, food processing is something that, you know, Poland has to put the efforts on. And uh, literally these two sectors demand different kinds of policies. Food sector, food processing will be um, on the policy side, um, um, maybe at the regional level or at the um, country level, you know, uh, however the country is uh, um, run, you know, how the policies are defined in the country it depends on the country as well, these kind of issues, because not all the countries are working at the regional level, uh, at the policy level. Uh, so it may be that food, food might be supported with more um, getting embedded into knowledge networks and do more patenting and that kind of stuff because they're at that level. But uh, clothing might uh, still need to be being engaged into uh, more global value chains and production networks and uh, that kind of stuff. And they have to determine what will be their outcome? Who are they competing with, isn't it? Um, this kind of uh, necessary uh, policy decisions have to be made. And this is up to the policymakers, you know, how they um, take uh, results from this kind of research. Uh, does it answer your question? <laughs> I think it's okay. We, we need to go to the next presentation. Okay. <laughs> I will unshare my screen and uh, uh, stop what? share and yeah. So okay. Boss, not you. Yes. Uh, um, okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have a question still. <laughs> see. Hi. Hi. Uh, okay. I, I just want to comment on uh, the the paper that you presented. Um, I think it's a, an, it's an interesting paper, um, although it's full of information. Yeah? So I I I, I, saw, uh, I had a bit uh, difficulties to to grasp the whole story. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's also a complicated uh, uh, topic uh, that you uh, that you address and with very different data sets uh, that you use. I think uh, 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 maybe some suggestions for improvement is that, um, okay, what, what is exactly the shock here, right? So uh, uh, the resilience literature is also, okay, okay what, hap what, what, is this, what is the state of affairs before a shock? And, 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 and what is the state of affairs after the shock? And to what extent 
um, in this case, sectors have been uh, uh, capable of overcoming the shock and how, right? And then you can mm -hmm. use the notions of adaptability and adaptation in order to mm -hmm. see to what extent the, the uh, to, to what extent they uh, um, responded to the shock uh, and 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 how, right? So uh, so that 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 would be my first comment. I think you have to be a bit more explicit on that. The second okay. thing is. Um, uh, I agree with Susan uh, that uh, um, this is a, this is a, this is a literature on regional resilience, right? So uh, and and you you're taking a sectoral perspective, which is fine yeah. because uh, you you could in a way apply the same uh, uh, type of ideas, uh, but then you look uh, to what extent uh, a sector responded to a shock, right? And and and, and the way they did it. So I think here again you should be uh, you should. I think a bit more explicit, and maybe you expect different uh, outcomes uh, with respect to the two sectors that you have analyzed. So uh, um, um, I don't know if that's the case. If you already had some uh, um, um, hypothesis on that, but that I think uh, would be useful also as a kind to serve as a kind of guideline to uh, to to uh, to report about your analysis. Um, I had a third comment, but now I, uh, I'm a bit jet lagged. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, shall do you want me to respond, or I'm taking these on board? We we, we need to start. The, the... Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. For that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start the next presentation with uh, Susan Schaffer. She's from the University of uh, Vienna in Germany. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the organizers um, for setting up this conference um, and also for inviting me. Um, it has been a pleasure so far, and I would like to present you some ongoing work. Um, you don't see it yet. Okay, great. And okay, okay. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks again um, for the organizers. My name is Susan Schäfer. Um, I'm a, a researcher in economic geography at the Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna. And today I would like to talk about entrepreneurial ecosystems. This contribution uh, is a co um, collaboration uh, together with uh, Andreas Kubert, who is a postdoctoral research at the uh, Leibniz Institute on Society and Space mm -hmm. uh, near Berlin. Um, a few words before I start with my uh, topic on entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, so the topic I think also on this, uh, of this conference is that we see that many firms who organize their businesses globally, uh, globally um, have faced large scale, large scale reorganizations of their, um, of their production networks, of their value chains. And this is due to um, the financial crisis, the many financial crises we, we had in the past, but also the COVID-19 pandemic, and also recently the war um, uh, in Ukraine. What also became evident today is that we used a perspective looking at, this, uh, at these global economic structures. And just to make this clear to you that um, I'm coming from the entrepreneurial ecosystem debate. There are also different, um, different foci. And um, it depends on the perspective a little bit at what you look like and also what kind of research uh, you do. Um, and, um, and I'm focusing here on entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, but I also, of course, take into account these other debates. So the structure of my talk is first, I would like to give you an, a short intro to entrepreneurial ecosystem and then um, argue that um, the current debate has neglected uh, a little bit the trans, uh, local knowledge transfer between different entrepreneurial ecosystems. And then my co-author and I would like uh, to, we would like to develop a typology 
uh, of these linkages and knowledge circulation between entrepreneurial ecosystems. And then what is quite new, which I have developed also for this conference, is to think about what happens with the typology in COVID or post-COVID times. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so the animations are on. Uh, I'm sorry if you are confronted with a lot of text now. Um, so there's a recent interest in, in entrepreneurship studies, but also in economic geography on the environmental and systemic elements and processes associated with entrepreneurial activity and value creation. This is labeled under the concept of entrepreneurial ecosystem defined as an umbrella for the benefits and resources produced by a cohesive, typically regional community of entrepreneurs and their supporters that help new um, high growth ventures form survive and expand. Um, there are um, several papers out there that distinguishes this debate um, from the cluster debate or the debate on regional or national innovation systems. But here, a key characteristic. First is the branches. So we usually look at different industries together, but they are usually high growth and often innovative. For example, the high tech industry. Innovation plays a key role in entrepreneurial ecosystems because it's seen as a driver for growth and success. Um, and also the spatial aspect has gained important. Um, so usually it's seen as a regional um, concept um, or another administrative unit is laid at its base. So far, we have, um, however, very little consideration of actor-based linkages between entrepreneurial ecosystem and also linkages to other um, concepts that have been mentioned so far. For example, global uh, value chains has been underrepresented. Um, here's a, a, here, here's one of the many visualizations of um, entrepreneurial ecosystems. This is a, a, a figure um, 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 put together by Daniel Eisenberg. Um, it's about 10 years old. What he wanted to do is to show the different um, and also the subcategories of, the, of an entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is policy, finance, culture, support, human capital, and markets. And of course, you see a lot, uh, a lot of um, different aspects that belong to that. What uh, Bruno Fischer, um, Nick, and also others have identified is that that um, spatial elements, or I would call it the specialities, it's I think it's weaker so, okay. the spatial elements um, for example regarding the boundaries the scales but also the trans the translocal languages are currently under theorized and but also they are under research in the current debate um, yeah let's see um, let's let's have a look at these linkages we um, Look at these linkages not in terms of of, uh, um, of, uh, of products, but we look at these in, uh, these linkages um, in the context of learning and knowledge circulation in and also between entrepreneur ecosystems. So let's have a look at the uh, at the left side. So within one entrepreneur ecosystem, it is argued that due to the co-location of entrepreneurial actors and organizations, there's a so-called it's taken from the cluster literature, but I use the term anyway, the, a local bus, uh, a knowledge transfer of information and tacit knowledge that is unintended, it's very low cost. And also entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial learning takes place through the various social networks between the area, uh, between the actors um, in the ecosystem, but also through role models and, and success stories. So let's let's jump to the uh, to the left uh, uh, to the right side. So what is currently not so much discussed in the debate how learning and knowledge transfer takes place between entrepreneurial ecosystems, and in geography it's argued this, that geographical distance makes learning and knowledge circulation a little bit more difficult because you have to invest more in it, and the issue of trust is relevant, but. 
Um, there are certain arrangements and practices that enable knowledge uh, transfer and learning. And you will see on the, on the next slide that this kind of circulations are already taking place, but we haven't had a chance to really systemize it so far. So um, one of the arrangements is called global pipelines. And this is a, a relatively established concept in economic geography saying that firms um, in a, um, in a cluster or also in an entrepreneurial ecosystem, they develop um, ties or pipelines to firms outside um, um, of their region to gain access to new knowledge um, and so on. Then you also have the, uh, the issue of personal mobility. Yeah? Um, just to mention the World Migration Report that was published this year shows that we have a high degree of personal mobility. And this also comes with knowledge transfer because we have the highly skilled that are on the move. Then a third um, aspect of arrangements are temporary events. So these are, for example, a conference, people from many places around the world come together, but we also have this in economic um, uh, sectors, for example, industry fairs, um, or other kinds of global events that are that take only place a few days, but they are, that, that are, but anyway, they are very essential for knowledge circulation and also the aspect of digitalization. Um, so uh, what I would like um, to show you that we have a lot of arrangements and practicing practices that enable this um, uh, information flow between entrepreneur ecosystems and because we already see that a different, uh, uh, in different research. My co-author and I will want to um, yeah, say, do a, a, a synthesis uh, of trans uh, local knowledge transfer, but also uh, understand how the COVID pandemic has affected these knowledge transfers. So here are a few anecdot uh, anecdot anecdotal evidence that we have this kind of um, translocal element. The first um, dimension here uh, is human capital. Um, I hope you can read it. Uh, on the left side, there's a blog post saying that 52% uh, of startups in Silicon Valley founded by at least one immigrant. So when we look at a very vibrant entrepreneur ecosystems, we have a very high share of immigrant founders. Then the second is finance, and I took a um, <laughs> Uh, a chart from uh, a current presentation uh, showing that um, that in Sao Paulo, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Sao Paulo, we have a, a majority. This is the dark blue. This is, uh, these are FDIs from US-based uh, investors. So we have a, a very high share of foreign direct invest, uh, investments flow, floating into the Brazilian ecosystem. And then the third part, I think you can't read it in detail, but the idea is that we also have an, a circulation of entrepreneurial culture. And what is the said here is design thinking, lean startup, um, and so on. And um, what it says here is that when you go, for example, to an entrepreneurial ecosystem in Tel Aviv, in Israel, or in London, in certain industries, you will come across the same ideas, how you do uh, business and what are like good entrepreneurial tech. Um, so um, th this is a short summary in the dream. So um, uh, observation we do is that innovative, vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystems tend to be more globally connected than less innovative entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, and this is so because these entrepreneurial ecosystems are able to attract um, migrant entrepreneurs, foreign invest uh, investors, but also multinational firms that relocate there, they open a branch there. We, um, I don't have the data here, but uh, we, have, we have studied that. Then also there's a global uh, competition for the best innovative ideas and venture capital opportunities. And we see the large share of foreign direct, direct investments is that the investors don't look uh, nationwide, but they have a very uh, global focus. Um, and we can also see that there's a circular circulation of best practices and blueprint entrepreneurial practices on how to run an innovative business. Um, and this leads us a little bit to the 
conclusion that we see a specialization of entrepreneurial ecosystem, not regard to the industrial um, setting, but to the um, entrepreneurial process. Um, and I can go deeper into that in the discussion. And also that this specialization will also affect the evolu uh, evolution uh, status of entrepreneurial ecosystem. So in the last um, eight minutes, I would like to show you the typology. So we thought, when we look at the, the Eisenberg model, what are the indicators and dimensions that can be in theory mobile or mobilized? Um, and also what is the temporal scope of linkages? Um, and it's, um, this is the, the second part of the slide. So we would argue that the elements of the ecosystems that are most mobile are single actors um, with, with regard to human capital, organizations, but also finance. And with regard to the temporal scope, we argue, okay, we have linkages that are quite permanent, that they have a, a, a long perspective, but we also have temporary connections that are maybe only a few days or a few months uh, between entrepreneurial ecosystems. So now here we come up with a, um, um, with a table, distinguishing between um, these dimensions, but also between permanent and temporary actors. And we use our own work, uh, our own empirical work to explain in the contribution uh, what the nature of the linkage is and what effect it has on knowledge creation. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have time to do it here. But we can see down, in the last um, in the last cell is that our argument is that these permanent linkages provide long-term pipelines between entrepreneurial ecosystems and the actors involved in these um, are boundary spanners and translators of entrepreneurial cultures and they stabilize trans, uh, local knowledge transfer. On the other hand, we also have temporary uh, linkages, for example, international community gatherings but also very important for the entrepreneurial culture accelerator, incubator, or boot camp that are um, more short time, uh, but also and also shorter uh, forms of venture capital um, engagement. And uh, our argument is that these short-term pipelines are, are also very important because they don't stabilize um, the, um, the knowledge transfer but they give new ideas and information to entrepreneurial ecosystems, prevent lock-ins, and are very important impulses for innovation creation that are beneficial for various sectors. So now COVID, uh, what has COVID brought to us in terms of knowledge and learning uh, between those ecosystems? We say it really depends on the national context, but in general, we can say there were strong limitations and restrictions with regard to personal international mobility. So you were not allowed to travel as much. Then, uh, although this is not really quantified, we think there's a decreased productivity in the innovation cre uh, creation uh, through lockdown, sickness, and also long COVID cases. Um, uh, firms in Germany, for example, expect that 10% of their employees um, have symptoms of, of long COVID. Then in terms, uh, in with regard to investment practices, we see an increase in risk perception and risk averse behavior, and also new communication practices within and between firms due to digitalization. And in addition to the pandemic, we also see an increased reliance on platform economies for outs outsourcing of work. So when we look at this table, our argument is that through COVID, especially the temporary forms of knowledge circulation were affected. Um, they were either not possible at all or very restricted or done on a not face-to-face -face level, but online level. So there was a restriction of the temporary forms of, of knowledge circulation, but also new forms of uh, uh, temp uh, temporary knowledge circulation were created but, and this is in this study of a major video conferencing inhibits the production of creative ideas. So, um, um, so we don't know the exact um, effect uh, on innovation creation, uh, but it, as you all know, it's, 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 it's a totally different whether you meet in person or you meet online in a Zoom meeting. 
Um, so these are our conclusions. Uh, in the current debate on entrepreneurial ecosystems, we have an overemphasis on endogenous factors, regional uh, um, specific factors, and um, we try with our typology to um, to categorize the global connectedness of these ecosystems by looking at the time, but also different elements that can be mobile or mobilized. Um, we think that um, uh, the COVID pandemic has been particularly strong on temporary uh, linkages, but we need further empirical uh, work to, to really quantify and dig deeper into this topic. Uh, when we look on how actors um, uh, or different actors um, change their practices, um, how the politi political governments um, affected critical industries, and also how the emergence of the, uh, of the gig economy uh, takes part in these translocal linkages. Um, I would like to thank you. And if you're interested in our work, then follow us on Twitter or have a look at our webpage. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. We have uh, now 10 minutes for debate questions, please. Uh, Susan, first, congratulations for the presentation. And I wanted to hear from you if you see any difference in directionality in this knowledge flows between ecosystems. If the, the flow that goes from Sao Paulo to the Silicon Valley is the same that comes from the Silicon Valley to Sao Paulo, how do you see uh, this direction of knowledge flows? Yeah, I think your question addresses the aspect of specialization. Um, I cannot say anything about uh, Latin America because this is not the region where I work, but I can say for, for Tel Aviv and Israel that uh, we see a, a, a dependency between these ecosystems. So, uh, for example, investors in, uh, Sil uh, in Silicon Valley, they are very eager to take us. Uh, on the most innovative idea of the Israeli entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, we see um, um, a growth um, of, of these uh, US um, um, uh, investment and of emerging acquisition. And the effect is this leads um, to, uh, at, at least in Tel Aviv, this leads to the fact that the ecosystem doesn't grow um, with, with regard to mature firms. So we have a lot of young, innovative activity, but we don't see that companies grow old in Tel Aviv. So now you can question the rationality because the ecosystem is composed of so many actors. It's, 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 let's say it's, it's complicated, um, but we can, can say for sure that actors in uh, Israel, they are a little bit critical about it because they think, oh, we are selling our best ideas to Silicon Valley and that's it. The entrepreneurs they like the idea, get a lot of money for it. But um, let's say policy actors or people that are that want to bring the ecosystem forward, they are very critical about that. Uh, so, so I I think that I, I this is really it's not really a mature thought. But my idea is that when we have um, entrepreneurial ecosystems in very small uh, domestic economies that they tend to be very innovative, uh, innovation driven. So they, they, uh, they, uh, they don't, uh, you don't see the, um, the firms that are founded that will in these ecosystems. They, they, they will be the firms. Uh, Susan, thank you for your presentation. You know, I'm a big fan of work. My question, it, it, it's some, somehow what relates to, to what Nick was talking about earlier this morning about using alternative sources of data. Because I was thinking, and I've been reading a lot about a Thank you. 
So um, looking into this qualitative assessment of ecosystems as narratives, mm -hmm. so not as objective constructs, but rather as a social construct and how different groups of people perceive what an ecosystem really is. So what we're addressing this right now in Brazil in the specific ecosystem, try to understand if entrepreneurs perceive what their ecosystem is similarly to what the university, the local university mm -hmm. does and, and, and so on. Um, where does big data enter here? So I'm thinking about Silicon Valley as an exporter of a mindset. Mm -hmm. Obviously, all, everyone who reads about this know that you cannot have several Silicon Valleys. Maybe you cannot even have two Silicon, Va Silicon Valleys in the world. But the entrepreneurial rhetoric that is spread across the globe is very similar to what was originated there. So maybe Twitter can be an interesting source to see how entrepreneurial rhetoric changes over time in, in different ecosystems. And somehow with other data, you might connect with inflows of investment of people, of some, mm. some stuff like that. So this intangible flow of resources. It's, it's just actually a comment and uh, it was partially inspired by your presentation, partially inspired by Nick's suggestion. I think it's uh, it can be interesting to see this, if yeah. there's a shift. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think that's the basis for this uh, uh, totally underexploited uh, uh, big data or also social media data. I think it can be very fruitful to look at that and how it resonates uh, in certain regions. Um, but I also think what could be interesting, whether this this kind of knowledge transfer of let's say best practices, how you how you be a good entrepreneur, how you uh, how do you attract uh, interest of an investor and so on, how this is intentionally or unintentionally transferred. Um, because um, I th I think that there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, going on on uh, let's say the Silicon Valley mindset. But what I would be interested in is that whether people actually do that on purpose or whether this is unintentionally the case. Um, because in, in the long run, this can be seen as positive. You know, entrepreneurs from abroad learn how to be successful entrepreneurs. But you could just say it's also some kind of uh, um, uh, entrepreneurial imperialism, right? You know, and now we, have, we all have to become like Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and, and local specifics and maybe um, other practices that can be successful as well are marginalized. I am really looking forward to when when uh, Rodrigo Costas comes here to stay, right? In a, a, a few months later, to to engage in some discussion with about these issues because that's exactly why we have all this data. And we cannot. I mean, we need to move forward. That, uh, otherwise, they are useless. They are they are important. Problems. We have not. Uh, one is what weight, how do we weigh this data? I mean, what is a tweet versus a paper publication versus a, okay, but, but, but this has yeah. been a, a problem. There, there are people who, who actually have advanced this kind of, of, of research. And I think in, in your, in your uh, um, analysis, as, as Bruno said, um, there is need for some, for some, for some. That actually, it's good to have the qualitative thing, but, but it would be even stronger if you if you could have uh, some indication of real inter. You know, yeah. another... I think this was this is uh, let's say I I sacrifice the, the quantitative stuff a little bit uh, for <laughs> for uh, to to replace the. Technology, but I think you're absolutely right. I think there, there are many uh, novel uh, data sources. Uh, you mentioned Twitter, but also the LinkedIn or other career portals are very 
switch to, especially when you can link them to entrepreneurial data. Um, but then, of course, it's always the issue of, of data regulation and, and research that's coming to play. But uh, I think that is very good. Um, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit frustrated with the, the use of secondary data and also patent data in, in the consumer ecosystem because you see a lot of innovation that has no patents and all. And if, uh, let's say there's no patent, you can't even measure the innovation and so on. So I think we really need to move forward. Social innovations are, are out of the data, is the patent data. Yeah, right? or any so, kind of software. So, so the kinds, the kinds of innovations that that actually the Oslo Manual now presents, right? Eight, I think there are eight different kinds of innovation. Yeah. The patent data captures only part of it, yeah. uh, whereas all the other no managerial innovations, uh, they are out of, it, right? Um, so, so, so there is a big question there too, mm -hmm. um, and this is this is of interest to 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 Ron. Here's uh, uh, Ron, your, your analysis is great, right? I, I am enthusiastic about it. But it's, it's really true, this, that the patent data, the patent capture typically technological innovation, right? And, and, and that is not what, uh, what uh, only, it's not only, it's important, very important, but it's not only what, uh, what the Oslo manual these days defines as innovation. And, and that is a... Uh, I think we thank you very much. We are out of time. We are closing our session. The discussion was very interesting. And uh, well, let's clap our hands for the presenter. And <laughs> see you uh, later. Huh? Okay, so thank you everyone. I want to thank again Professor Andrea Furtado for um, moderating the session and also our presenters, Mariani, Vanessa, Susan, Mateus, and Dean, they join us online. Now we'll have a break and we'll come back at 3 p.m. Okay, thank you. So first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to inform you about an executive course of GEOPI. GEOPI is the Laboratory of Studies on the Organization of Research and Innovation. Uh, GEOPI is a partner of INCISBO. This course is about foresight, prioritization, and decision-making support. It will happen, is, it is 100% online. Hi, okay. So the course is 100% online and it will happen in the mornings of 18 to 29 of July. The course has many specialists from many countries, including Nick, he's one of them. 
And after the end of our conference, we will send an email with the link to register. So now I will proceed to our second keynote. Uh, it's about from local, from global local. Local. From global local interface to local value added and knowledge process of upgrading of regional innovation systems in the South. So for that, I'd like to invite Professor Kyun Lee. Kyun Lee is a distinguished professor at the Seoul National University, and he's head of the Center of Comparative Economic Studies. For this keynote, we'll have a commentator that is Dr. Taviano Canuto. He will be joining us online. Otaviano is based on Washington, D.C. He is a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South and a principal of the Center of Macroeconomics and Development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kunni. Very glad to be here. This is my third visit to Campinas. So it's good after this COVID-19 is getting over, we resume our the interaction, uh, global and local. So uh, my topic today is about uh, following this theme of this conference, which is about local global or global local interaction interfaces. So uh, to manipulate this uh, mouse, let me sit here and uh, to speak, okay? So, um, as this title suggests, my idea is to uh, talk about linkage between this uh, global local interface and out of the how to generate more local value added and innovation uh, uh, in local context. Also from a uh, latecomer's perspective who is trying to catch up with the incumbent. So uh, my talk today will be based on three episodes of global local interface. Uh, first one is about uh, IT cluster in Asia, Taipei, Shenzhen, Penang, how they are catching up in different speed, slow versus fast catching up. That part already published in this PFSC journal. Episode two is about auto sectors in China, Malaysia, Thailand in compared with the uh, uh, Korean cases. That part already published in the uh, European Journal of uh, Development Research. Three is about resource-based development in Chile and Malaysia, based on uh, Journal of Technology Transfer papers. So I'll talk about main uh, idea of these three episodes. I'll summarize what the uh, emerging implication for this uh, uh, local global uh, uh, interfaces. So uh, in this part, uh, uh, I'm contrasting very fast catching up in Shenzhen in China versus some uh, slow uh, catch up in Penang in Asia. Okay. Uh, so this uh, the showing the three cities map. Their common start is all day based on FDI based uh, uh, catching up mode. And uh, in that regard, um, Taipei has early start starting from 1960, followed by Penang from 1972, Shenzhen uh, most late 1980. So in other words, whereas Shenzhen was a uh, more recent uh, uh, catch up effort, but nine now uh, Shenzhen showing much uh, better performance than Penang, although has Penang is early start. So my question is, what's the uh, differences in this uh, uh, catching a speed between uh, Shenzhen Penang, whereas Taipei is kind of benchmark high above this uh, uh, two, two cities level. Okay. So this shows the per capita GDP of Taipei is highest, followed by uh, Shenzhen then Penang. Although Penang has uh, early days is higher than Shenzhen. But now, uh, Shenzhen is catching a better laterally with uh, Taipei. Okay. And this shows the uh, non-patent. It is almost obvious that uh, patent is one of the driving uh, force for these differing performances. This is Taipei, Shenzhen, but no catching up uh, in terms of patent application by uh, Penang. Okay. So uh, I'm taking this 
question from uh, RIS uh, perspective, regional innovation system. In the literature from European scholars saying that there is a peripheral or emerging RIS, which means they are relying heavily on uh, foreign knowledges for innovation, given they don't have much indigenous knowledge at the initial times. Okay, so uh, so they come rely on foreign knowledges. Okay, then try to catch up. Okay, so eventually uh, upgrading of RIS in these emerging countries that they will be uh, gradually reducing reliance on foreign knowledge and at the same time increasing the local knowledge creation diffusion. So I'm seeing whether this is happening uh, in these cities in which uh, or, or different degrees. So I'm using these three measures of uh, knowledge localization. Intraregionalism means how much you are citing uh, local patent. So intraregional uh, sourcing of knowledge is intraregional means that how much you are citing patent from other region, other city in the same uh, nation. Internationalization means that internal sourcing of knowledge from abroad. Okay, these are the three uh, key variables in RIS from uh, late uh, perspective. So we can hypothesize that type will be highest, whereas Shenzhen showing very rapid catching up, whereas uh, Penang has no such catching up pattern in terms of this, uh, uh, especially uh, intra-regionalization. Okay. And whereas Shenzhen keep relying on, uh, no, Penang keep relying on high degree of international sourcing, high degree of reliance on foreign knowledges. So these are some formula for these three measures. Also, uh, so this show that this uh, internationalization, how much you are sourcing internationally and the lowest in Taipei, because Taipei now generates more local knowledge uh, basis, whereas uh, Penang keep relying on foreign knowledges. Intraditional means that how much you are citing locally, highest in Taipei and least in Penang. Also, intraditionalization too. Okay. So this means that uh, more knowledge sourcing locally or intraditional is the major of, uh, aspect of catching up or upgrading. Okay. Then I turn to more of uh, ownership of knowledge. Who are own, owning the patent? Is it foreigners or, or, or local companies okay and also looking at originality Originality means that how much you are citing uh, how much you are generating innovation based on citing knowledge from diverse field this is one way of defining originality and usually advanced countries tend to show high originality so if uh, uh, Penang keep relying on multinationals they will show higher degree of originality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, this is definition of originality uh, variables. Okay. Then this show local ownership, highest in uh, uh, Taipei, very rapid catching up by Shenzhen, whereas no catching up Penang. Penang keep relying on MNCs. Okay. So this is a very important aspect of uh, source of catching up by Shenzhen, rapidly increasing local ownership. Okay. And there are connection between ownership to uh, local society because if you are multinationals, you don't want to, uh, you don't have to promote local R&D activities. You keep relying on headquarters and their R&D activity at headquarters. So if you keep relying on multinationals, uh, there will be a less chance to increasing uh, local creation of knowledge. Whereas if you learn MNCs, your originality is high. Okay, this high highest in uh, Penang. Okay. And more actual data of who are the top 10 assignees in Shenzhen is the Chinese. Whereas uh, um, United States uh, used to be dominant, but uh, rapidly declined with the rise of uh, local uh, ownership. Whereas in Penang, they're still relying on US as a uh, ownership of Dayton. Malaysian ownership declined to zero as a, as a top 10 of science. Okay, so a uh, summary of this first part is that uh, 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 Shenzhen is lax catching up in terms of uh, 
uh, higher degree of local ownership and localization. Whereas Penang is not so. And Penang just work on uh, improving the human capital so that to keep multinationals. Whereas Taipei was more aggressively promoting localization, local ownership. Promoting more transfer from foreign to local company, public private joint R&D, INAS R&D uh, by local companies and so on. So this way, Shenzhen, although they rely heavily on FDI initially, eventually they are able to create uh, uh, local ownership and localization. Okay. So in terms of this finding, we can summarize uh, uh, features of RIS. Mature RIS will be high localization and regionalization and low international uh, uh, sourcing. And ownership very strong. Immature is the opposite, where catching RIS is increasing localization, decreasing international layons, increasing local ownership. So this is uh, uh, some emerging uh, characterization of uh, features of RIS. Okay. Then let's, let's turn to part two about the uh, auto sectors in uh, Asia. Okay. So one puzzle is that uh, Malaysia was very actively uh, pursued industrial policies from auto sector. They own a locally owned company brand Proton, but they failed despite active industrial policies. What's the reason? Whereas Thailand is uh, doing okay, but still relying on Japanese uh, ownership. Okay, and China is showing more successful uh, achievement. So how can we explain this uh, different outcome in terms of uh, degree of industrial policies? So uh, I'm answering this question in terms of uh, comparison to Korean cases, or in terms of looking at uh, three indicators of uh, GBCs. So these countries all pursued industrial policy in terms of uh, local content requirement, try to increase domestically uh, uh, manufactured goods in the automobile uh, assemblies. And my hypothesis is that to succeed with the uh, industrial policy like LCR, you got to three things. First, local ownership. Then there should be a competition discipline from world market. And it should be matched with the firm level effort to increase the R&D and innovation. This is my uh, 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 kind of hypothesis, explain this uh, uh, different performances. Okay. So in the case of Korea, uh, this Hyundai Motors market share US market, they entered uh, some record sale initially, but they failed because of poor quality. But during this time, they're able to increase the innovation, localized engine transmission, able to uh, eventually able to catch up US market. This show importance of innovation effort to localize key high-tech parts, including engine transmissions. Okay. So in Korean cases, ownership was locally owned, Hyundai Motors locally owned, although there is some period of joint ownership with the uh, GM. Then they facing uh, domestic market oligopoly, but facing discipline from world market. Then they was forced to go world market, otherwise no support from government. And they all had to localize engine and transmission. Okay. So those both carrot and sticks. Okay. In the case of three uh, uh, countries in Asia, uh, they all has early start from 1960s. They all tried to tried promote their own brand, local brand, but eventual outcome was so different. Okay. So uh, eventually, why Malia failed? The reason is that. There is no competition discipline from market, okay? Uh, in domestic, also foreign market. So they fail despite active industrial policies. Thailand makes success in promoting local ownership. While uh, uh, it makes because uh, they are doing okay, but still in the Japanese ownership. And so degree of local value added is not that uh, great, okay? China uh, used to restrict foreign ownership less than 50% or, or try to have some control. 
implement a lot of uh, protectionist policies, but there are a lot of competition in domestic market and so on. So uh, China was able to uh, achieve more success compared to these two uh, comparable countries. That's a big story. Okay? This shows the data of LCR, all countries increasing, but they have to stop because of double to request that this is against double to regulation. So Malaysia, try, Thailand tried some degree of LCR, but in the middle, they have to stop. Okay. When are they achieving some uh, success? Okay. And China did more quick success with the LCR before they also stopped uh, due to double to request. And China's case is that they matched degree localization with uh, tariffs. So you have uh, achieving higher degree localization, then they'll be subject to less import tariff. So there is kind of a linkage, very interesting linkages. Okay. So I'm looking at also these three countries in terms of GBC indicators. So uh, 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 I'm following this IW in and out in IW GBC. In other words, uh, from Lake you got to join GBC and learn from them. But that's not then. You got to increase domestic, GB, domestic value chain, domestic value added. That means showing up in less degree of GBC participation. Then after you build your capability, you got to join GBC again, globalize. So this is kind of non-linear pattern. Uh, different from uh, linear pattern saying that the more GBC, the always better. It's not that simple. I'm saying that there should be non-linear pattern. You got to have uh, some period of increasing domestic value chain. That means you're showing up in terms of less GBC participation. And that's the case of Korean experience. Korea joined GBC, learn from GBC, but they have a, a decreasing period from mid 80s This is where Korea localized uh, formerly imported part and component. That means uh, uh, this indicator, share of 14 bill added in gross export tended to be getting smaller and smaller because you uh, replaced foreign imported part by domestic part. Then after you build domestic uh, capability, you got to be open again. You will be globalized. Then you'll be able to increasing GBC again. So this is in, out, in pattern. I think this is more uh, standard pattern and seems to be replicating in some degree in, in China too. Okay. But this is the aggregate GBC indicator. We get, look at specifically the case of automobile. Okay. So this is Korean uh, GBC uh, in terms of this uh, uh, FBA variable, so in decreasing and increasing again. So this is the key catching up part and localizing uh, 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 some formally imported part. Okay. And I'm see whether this happened to other countries. China still, uh, China should keep decreasing. In the meantime, China is keep in the tendency of localizing all made in China effort, whereas Thailand is uh, still remaining high, no period of decreasing because China keep relying on Japanese made intermediate part and so on. Okay. In the regard, uh, number two catching up. Okay. Second is the case, something called REI, which means that share of re-exported intermediate import in your total intermediate import. So you import some intermediate part, when you export them again after assembly, then this show will uh, increasing. I mean, this is major export orientation. So the more you export, you will have this indicator increasing. This is a case of a Korean uh, uh, cases, automobile. Okay. Because although you import uh, some intermediate part, but uh, they are export again after you assemble the, in, 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 in your territories. Then uh, this is Thailand. Thailand is doing well in terms of export orientation. Okay. And uh, 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 Malaysia is not doing well. So Malaysia is not pushing export orientation. They're all targeting domestic market where it's protected. So no discipline from world market. That's the problem with the Thailand, uh, Malaysia. Okay. Third indicator is uh, 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 this domestic edit embodied in foreign export as a share of gross export of that country. Okay, 
So uh, that means you are exporting in intermediate part to other country, and they're using that imported part in their own export. So this shows your strengths of your intermediate part industries. Also is major of globalization. So this is Korean case increasing, okay? steadily increasing. But uh, that's not the case in uh, Thailand. The Thailand uh, are not strongly uh, promoting their intermediate part industry in, in the global market. And this is Korea and China's kitchen. Okay. So overall summary is that uh, um, um, why failure in Malaysia in other words, they are locally owned, but no discipline, no sticks. Domestic market was monopolized, whereas no uh, pursuit for uh, world market. Though also no fundamental effort to localize high tech parts such as engine. So that's why um, uh, Proton eventually sold to Gili uh, from China. And mixed success in Thailand because no local ownership. So no need to increase local bill added. And they also stop uh, somewhere in the, in the middle, the, the industrial policies. So Thailand is, I call it, mixed success. And Polish was not sustained. Mm -hmm. They try some industrial policies and they stop in the middle. And China different in terms of more consistent policies, local ownership matched by competition in domestic and world market. So there are fierce competition domestic market and they did more smart support policy in terms of various uh, restriction against foreign company or foreign part. They tried to increase localization of uh, formal imported part. Okay. Also the formal effort to localize production of engines and so on to acquire foreign technologies. More similar to the case of uh, Korean experiences. So summary is that we're confirming three factors required for successful industrial policy, which are the uh, competition, local ownership, and form level effort. So I don't repeat this uh, summary. So now let's turn to uh, the FPO3, uh, which is about uh, case of Chile and Malaysia in terms of uh, resource-based development, thereby escaping middle income trap. So I guess uh, many of you know this concept, middle income trap, that means uh, a country tended to uh, face growth slowdown after they reach uh, middle income. So uh, uh, usually they stay below 40% of US level for many decades. In this case, middle income trap. And reason for that is that many middle income countries are caught between low wage manufacturers and high wage innovators. So after you reach middle income, your wage rate becoming uh, increasing again. And they are losing competitiveness in low end market, whereas you are not that innovative enough to enter high end market. So you're kind of sandwiched in the middle. There's a typical uh, situation in many countries who are trying catching up in terms of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, so, so, uh, but I would say there might be other model of catching up, not relying on manufacturing, but based on resource of each country. And I'm saying that Chile, Malaysia is showing, showing some sign that they're getting beyond middle income trap, not owing to manufacturing success, but owing to their success in uh, diverse resource-based sector, sectors. Okay, so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, my main ideas. Okay. So leading sectors in these two countries that not manufacturing, but palm oil, rubber, and petroleum product for Malaysia. Chile, not copper, but fruit, berries, wine, salmon, and forest product. So these are not manufacturing, but these are very uh, highly value added based on knowledge and innovation. They're all export, export oriented industries. Okay. Also, 
uh, their success is not based on free market, but active industrial police, which has been pursued for many uh, decades. And they finally able to get some uh, successful outcome in terms of creating a local uh, uh, value chains, or also based on local ownership. This shows the capital GDP trend over time. This is US, this is 40% bar as a threshold of middle income trap uh, or high income uh, status. So uh, Korea used to be same as Malaysia and others, reach 70% nowadays. Malaysia reached around 50%, Chile just over 40%. So there are some sign that I, I hope this can be sustained sign that these two economies are going beyond middle income trap, whereas uh, Mexico, Thailand is still below this 40% uh, threshold. Same graph for more countries in this area. Uh, Argentina used to be high, but now below 40%. And, and Mexico also reached uh, a little bit more than 40% and reached below 40%. So, all is in this range except Chile, or just above the 40 percent range. So I'm looking at these uh, resource sectors in Chile and Malaysia. What happened to these sectors? Okay. First, looking at their performance in terms of uh, export, trade surplus, and RCA. This shows Chile. Who are the leading exporters? Of course, mining. But this graph show combined issue of this uh, three uh, wine, forest, fruit, and so on. They are uh, decent uh, generatable uh, dollars for Chile. Mm -hmm. For Malaysia, Malaysia is known for electricity and electric product, to IT product, but their shares keep decreasing because it's matched by, by the resource sectors such as petroleum product, palm oil, and rubber. So these three resource sectors are as good as uh, IT sectors in terms of generating uh, dollars by export. In terms of uh, trade surplus, Chile, this is mining, but now it's almost matched by this uh, surplus from these three resource sectors. Also in Malaysia, this trade balance surplus by uh, IT manufacturing, but Oh, IT is manufacturing. It's, it's smaller than contribution by the resource sectors. So they are uh, very important contribute to the trade surplus for Malaysia, more than uh, the IT manufacturing. I look at also ICA, uh, very high, more than uh, 10 or 6, showing very high uh, competitiveness of uh, these sectors, especially in terms of the world market. And Malaysia, this um, uh, palm oil, extremely high, more than uh, 40. <laughs> and these are the other three uh, sectors, rubber and so on. So this also uh, competitive, reaching more than two or something. This is, okay. So uh, some details, what happened to these sectors? Okay. Basically, uh, local ownership has a key role in terms of uh, boosting up these sectors' competitiveness and innovation. Mm -hmm. So, example is palm oil. Palm oil, uh, Malaysia used to export crude palm oil or unprocessed. But now they turn to processed palm oil export, which is more highly added. So all turning to uh, 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 processed palm oil, no more crude palm oil export. So this shows the, it's become more uh, high level added product. Mm -hmm. But Indonesia also export palm oil, but they're mostly exporting crude palm oil, different from Malaysian case, exporting processed palm oil. And how it happened? First, Malaysia tried to promote this palm oil export, okay, but they faced tariff from European countries. The UK others doesn't want to Malaysia export uh, um, processed palm oil, but don't just keep exporting through the palm oil. That's what Europeans said, this kind. 
So they charge export duties on crude palm oil, uh, 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 on the tariff against uh, processed palm oil from Malaysia. Malaysia counteracted by charging export duties on uh, crude palm oil. Okay. Eventually, Malaysia took over UK company in London stock market, hostile takeover. So they took over British owned plantation in Malaysia. And this turning point that Malaysia took advantage or keep uh, 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 power in, in terms of this palm oil export to European market. On top of that, there was uh, active R&D support, fiscal incentive for value addition. They set up R&D Institute in palm oil, making them more heavily added and knowledge base. Into ownership, uh, they're mostly uh, local owners, petroleum, of course, state owned companies, palm oil, Lomo, as I mentioned, there used to be foreign owned, but there was a de facto nationalization or hostile takeoff. Whereas IT manufacturing, all still foreign owned, MNC dominated. So they are doing okay in some export, but not much high value added. Is that an example of a middle income trend? IT manufacturing in Malaysia is a uh, good example of middle income threat. Uh, something okay, but not much uh, uh, local value creation. Now turning to uh, Chile, also there was uh, active industrial policies promoting uh, local value added in all these uh, sectors of salmon, wine, fruit, and forest uh, products. So salmon is a good example, okay? Now salmon is famous export to Chile, but you know, salmon was not used to be there in Chile Sea. It was planned, it was planned action to grow salmon by scientific method. They learned from Norway and Japan by setting up this uh, foundation. So they work hard to R&D how to grow salmon in Chile Sea. It is done all by planned action, not by natural uh, progress. Okay. And uh, inside it was uh, done by foreign Chile corporation, but later more become uh, 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 local company orientation. Number of local company increased from very small, now more than a couple of hundred uh, nowadays. Whereas mining still foreign dominant, so very weak, Domestic linkages, not export oriented, but farming is all export oriented. Okay. No, this uh, the, the salmon is all export oriented. Same go to story of uh, wine too. Mm -hmm. So in the local ownership, they are all mostly uh, local owned. Salmon used to be foreign, but now local owned. Wine also local ownership. They export berries. Berry used to be non natural fruit of Chile. It's all done by uh, scientific uh, research labs. This is not the naturally grown uh, fruit in Chile. Mm -hmm. So summary is that uh, these two countries showing that uh, possibility of escaping middle income trap, not through manufacturing, but through resource-based development. Okay. So this look different from short cycle technology-based sectors catching up in East Asia, but it is still consistent because these are the also low entry barrier sectors. So my the short cycle means that you have to target low entry barrier sectors when you reach uh, middle income stages. Actually, these are the low entry because it's all based on their own natural resources. Okay. And this side makes more sense in this post pandemic period because now GBC is fragmented. You got to rely less on GBC nowadays. And resource sector is perfect target to rely less on GBC, but growing more based on local resources and local value addition. It was not owing to free market, but due to active industrial policies, which has been pushed many, many decades. Okay. And domestic ownership is important. Without local ownership, nothing can be uh, accumulated in terms of uh, capabilities. So the emerging conclusion from uh, these three episodes is that first episode one, IT cluster in Taipei, Shenzhen, Penang showing the importance of local ownership. Because if you learn
they use the R&D in the home basis. They don't have to promote R&D activity in uh, hosting countries. That's why only local ownership, you have a increasing uh, degree of local diffusion, local creation of knowledge. There is a connection between ownership and local knowledge creation. Second, episode two about auto sectors in uh, China, Malaysia, Thailand, showing that local ownership is not the end. It should be combined with the global market discipline. Otherwise, you will fail like uh, Malaysia. You got discipline from world market, and uh, you need both stick and carrot, carrot, right? So export donation matters. If you don't target only domestic market, uh, it's not going to work. You got to target world market, where you got knowledge also discipline. Mm -hmm. Episode three, resource-based development in Chile, Malaysia, showing that market force alone cannot do the magic, but you got to have some uh, plan, for industrial policies. That's case of all uh, Samoan and Berry in Chile and Malaysia too. And also, it doesn't have to be manufacturing always, but it can be resource sector can be a, your source of uh, or engine of growth or catching. So nowadays, uh, uh, it makes more sense. Now manufacturing already kind of finished <laughs> for lack of already, <laughs> unless there is a new emerging sector. So. Uh, I guess Global South should target uh, as long as possible some resource sectors and making them knowledge based, make them uh, innovation based. Look at Netherlands, they're exporting uh, many of the, the, the flowers. It's all high tech flowers. <laughs> okay. So, overall conclusion is that uh, global local interface is very important, but only when it is strategically managed, only and that can lead to creation of domestic value added and jobs, uh, which are based on local ownership and knowledge. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, obrigado. Shall I go? Professor Kanuto. All right. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. This time, unfortunately, I was unable to travel to, to Brazil and attend in person, but at least I'm, I'm doing it uh, online. And it's really a privilege to be a commentator to Professor Kim Lee. I'm a follower of his work because I, uh, his research and the way he frames them, uh, it, it, it helps fill a void um, in, 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 in economist knowledge, which has been long recognized as the measure of our ignorance. That is to say, uh, the total factor productivity, which in turn, as uh, the literature has uh, shown clearly, uh, already, uh, it's associated with uh, the presence or absence of uh, local capabilities accumulation. And Professor Kim Lee does that by moving from both the macro to micro and meso levels, looking at sectors and taking into account exactly the country differences and so on, and inside countries as well. So it, it, I really learned, and uh, his three episodes today are uh, illuminate exactly different dimensions of, uh, of that process. So uh, we know how uh, the technological convergence gaps and the fact that the use of uh, te existing technologies is non-rival. And, and that has offered economies coming from behind, laggard economies, the opportunity to keep advancing. Uh, even if the pace of innovation decelerates at the frontier. Okay, so cross-border technological diffusion has contributed to rising domestic productivity levels, both in advanced and emerging economies, and even facilitated a certain a partial reshaping of the global innovation landscape. 
All right, but as exactly uh, shown by uh, in in Professor Kinley's uh, work, uh, it is not enough. It doesn't suffice to be connected. You have to make sure that there is uh, on an arising scale the, uh, the development of uh, local knowledge of tacit and and idiosyncratic locally specific uh, uh, content. And his three episodes show clearly. Uh, how that's the case. Uh, and, and, and by the way, uh, Professor Kim Lee, thanks for including uh, the, the piece on, on, on Chile and, and, uh, and Malaysia on the uh, case where the natural resource base is fundamental because of the following that may explain sometimes uh, uh, in the debate in, in Brazil and elsewhere, uh, there is a sort of a fetishism of sectors uh, confounding uh, uh, thinking that only electronics or mechanics are, are let's say, uh, sectors offering a ladder of value added to be to be uh, cr uh, crossed by 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 developing countries. And as you aptly demonstrated in your third episode, this is not the case, and we should focus on what matters for the local development of capabilities. To take place, and that leads me to my second comment, which is on, uh, and, uh, and it's incredible how Professor Kim Lee exactly uh, uh, mentions and, and incorporates in his analysis uh, the so-called complementary factors. It doesn't suffice simply uh, to look at the, uh, let's say, the local individual micro efforts to, to acquire, to develop capabilities. One has to look at uh, a whole framework of, uh, of, uh, of important determinants of uh, the, the investment in intangible assets in creating locally the capabilities. Access to finance matters, the availability of infrastructure, of course, the, the, uh, the, the supply of skilled labor, uh, managerial and organizational practice also matter a lot. You, and you have to have solutions to market failures that generate this disincentives to the accumulation of knowledge. Uh, so you have to have them. And, and furthermore, and I make the point, transaction costs associated with the business environment, including trading across borders, hiring and enforcing contracts cannot be too high. Uh, and and he, he illustrated this by remarking how costly ended up being for Malaysia the absence of uh, enough uh, local uh, global uh, market discipline. And, and, and this is an important aspect to be also highlighted. It's not simply uh, to enforce local ownership, but if you don't have competition in all the other components of the business environment that I, that I mentioned, uh, you do not get there because the, the costs and benefits for investment on the creation, on the local creation of domestic capabilities does not point in that direction. It's quite important. There is this dimension across uh, sectors uh, that must also be highlighted. Uh, a third point that I would make, and this is a bridge exactly to, to Professor Kim Lee's uh, remarks and connections with the middle income trap uh, issue, is uh, uh, his presentation, his analysis, and assuming that I'm right in emphasizing the relevance of those cross-sector horizontal uh, uh, complementary factors, is that the middle income trap is something that, uh, let's say, can be characterized as going beyond going up the ladder of value added in each individual uh, value chain, uh, whatever be the value chains relevant in this specific country case. Because in fact, there, there are uh, th uh, things in common, just to name a list of policies and institutions that are needed for a country to climb the income ladder. Human capital accumulation, so as to make possible the total factor productivity improvement domestically, innovation as aptly demonstrated by him, but also government supportive to private sector development. Uh, you have to have a minimally uh, strong intellectual property protection. Uh, otherwise, nobody will invest in creating the, the, the capabilities and rule of law. 
better access to finance and allowing private sector competition to prevail. Uh, beyond that, uh, diversity and, and increasing sophistication in the product mix, quality of education, infrastructure, and as well, a minimum macroeconomic stability because otherwise no economic agent will take the risk of, uh, of investing in the local creation of domestic, uh, of domestic capabilities. So all in all, particularly put it uh, as I naturally as being mostly a, 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 a macroeconomist or a country economist, I put the emphasis on those uh, horizontal cross sector uh, factors that must be there for the country to succeed in going up the ladder in the value chains of whatever be the sectors uh, uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, in, in the, so the, the research uh, illustrated and presented by Professor Kim Lee reinforced that, even if he's looking at the role of ownership uh, here, uh, comparing Shenzhen, uh, in, in and Taipei, even if he, when he looks at the, the automobile uh, industry and when he looks at natural resource, uh, we, we, we have beyond the details of the specifics, you will see the presence of those uh, common factors that I we ha highlighted. And just to finalize, uh, 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 talking about nonlinearity of processes that Professor Kim Lee uh, uh, mentions not only in the stages of in and out of the value chain, as one of the papers uh, showed to be the case in Korea and, and in China, but uh, non-linearity sometimes with a clearly non-typically uh, economic or industrial uh, uh, policy specific factors. I have in mind uh, a piece by Professor Kim Lee that came out yesterday uh, the projects indicate on the, the dilemmas and the challenges faced by China uh, and the connection of those challenges uh, with respect to semiconductors with uh, whatever be the policy options taken by the US. It's a fascinating piece, short uh, and, and to the point on, the, the, uh, on, on what lies ahead as a result of the geopolitical influence uh, the geopolitical rivalry between the United States and, and, and China on uh, the development of semiconductors in China. Uh, and he highlights in this piece uh, a nonlinearity. Uh, if the United States makes the option for, uh, let's say, helping to curb inflation by easing the restrictions on, 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 uh, on uh, Chinese semiconductor uh, uh, innovation in production processes vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the US market, there is a trajectory. Whereas as he highlights, if the option is to maintain the restrictions, uh, it seems likely uh, given the context of the US-China geopolitical rivalry, then China will be obliged to take the harder step, which is to, to innovate radically and so on. I found it fascinating how, how in this uh, two page, or three page, Professor Syndicate, Professor Kim Lee has illustrated this connection between the micro level and the broader level, including this case of, uh, of geopolitics. So thank you very much, Professor Kim Lee for your research because uh, our measured ignorance uh, as economists is diminished with uh, the work uh, like the ones that you uh, summarized today, today for us. Thank you. Okay, so uh, what Otaviano was talking about actually is very, very important. And, and I just wanted to make a comment that there is a project that is going on right now in Europe. It's called Global Into. Uh, you can see it online if you want. Uh, and it has created a very, very interesting database uh, of intangible assets 
So these kinds of things are very difficult to measure because he was talking about intangible assets like security in the courts, uh, like like uh, intellectual property protection. R and D is also such an asset. So uh, many thousands of companies in Europe have been surveyed uh, very very tightly. Actually, a lot of budget went to this. And uh, <clears throat> people are now, the data is uh, being uh, used for analysis. One special issue will appear uh, maybe at the end of this year in my journal, which is the science and public policy. Actually, my journal and uh, Professor Lee here is a co-editor as well, uh, and third person in Germany. So there's a special issue that, that, will, that deals, uh, that uses that, that data. Another book is going to be published by Routledge probably next year. Uh, but the data is uh, really very good and, and, and very useful. So uh, people who have uh, such aspirations of using that type of, 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 of data that does not exist actually, they that no, no statistical agencies uh, collect uh, other than R&D of it. Um, it's, it, it's really good. Um, so companies answer uh, in what way they use intangible assets and, and whether all types of companies from the smallest to the biggest across several countries. So I just to mention. Thank you. Can I uh, respond to find some comment? Okay. So, so one of the issue in this middle income trap is the lot of uh, IPR protection, IPR. Um, it has somewhat uh, tricky issues because people used to say uh, you got to provide strong IPR protection to stimulate innovation. But it's not that simple because uh, you are, if you are in the middle income stages, weak IPR might help use innovation. So it depends upon your level of uh, capability. If you need you got to uh, emphasize some weak protection IPR. You can diffuse uh, image uh, innovation also. Image can be only with a weak IPR, there will be more imitative R&D or diffusion. If you provide too strong IPR protection, uh, you might stifle imitative R&D or diffusion. So there's a trade-off, there's a difficult issues. Also further, very strong IPR protection in like the US market, this courage export from South, targeting US market. You know, there are many IPR dispute happen to before when Samsung tried to enter US market, they charged IPR litigation against saying that Samsung is uh, copying your patent. Same thing happened between uh, Huawei and others. So, IPR is a very uh, tricky issue. You got to have more dynamic view or flexible view of IPR protection. So simple, strong IPR doesn't help you become more innovative. Even World Bank now taking this more flexible view about IPR for in, in southern countries. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for your very interesting uh, lecture. I really liked it. Um, I was just intrigued by one of your findings, and that is uh, about uh, how to overcome the middle income trap, right? And you say, okay, uh, one uh, one way to do it is to focus on resource-based uh, uh, products, uh, as you showed in the, in the number of countries. Um, and I can see the point, um, and uh, you were also referring to the flower industry, right, in the Netherlands, uh, which you refer to as high tech, and I think uh, uh, that's indeed true. But based, are there, do you, could you also see uh, kind of limitations in following that model of resource-based products, right? Uh, um, because you might still compete with many, right, worldwide, uh, because fish or wine, uh, or even flowers uh, can be produced by many worldwide if they make an effort to do so, right? If they would also uh, uh, take on uh, a serious industrial policy, build a sci uh, scientific network around it. Uh, uh, so um, 
maybe I could not see uh, limits to to this kind of process happening in other countries as well, which means that these kind of countries that you refer to will be faced with more competition, things like that. So I'm just wondering to what extent do you also see limits to this kind of focus on resource-based uh, uh, products that might overcome the middle income trap, but maybe not uh, uh, forever, right? Congratulations, uh, brilliant. Uh, my question is, <laughs> yeah. the, in the third, uh, Malaysia and Chile, is it could be too early to uh, conclude that they have overcome the middle income trap just <laughs> after because the, the in Netherlands you have flowers but also you have in your uh, article for the uh, on semiconductors you have ASML né? that firm that produces machines for semiconductors so just is it too early that's the question It's it's also close to the question. So first, thank you very much, Kenley. A great presentation as always. Question uh, regarding the natural resource base and catch up, and I wanted to know your opinion on the size of countries as well. Uh, if this uh, matters uh, when you are choosing the, uh, the strategy. Uh, First, because there's many industries that uh, the size, uh, uh, the, the increasing scale, uh, it's very important. So this would be, and, and many countries use also uh, the domestic market to, to do this catch up. So I wonder if this, uh, the size of the countries uh, matters also when choosing this strategy. Uh, so just quick response regarding the point by loan. Maybe he is uh, uh, referring to the concept called uh, adding up problem. That means if many countries are doing same thing, it will flood the market, so price go down. But this need to those resources also to make goods. So point is how to make it, your product more innovative, differentiated. This one matters regarding whether it is resource sector actually. Okay, the size, size can be uh, tricky because like Brazil, very big domestic market, it's kind of a so Brazil company many just end up doing playing, not bothering going to export the market. It, it copy, but very, very strong copy industry, but they all target local market, not, not trying to go for body market. So there is also some uh, protection in the northern country market against export by, uh, uh, South from in terms of copy and so on. so size uh, Korea is small small smallest market that push plan can be go abroad yeah K-pop K-drama because they went abroad because more domestic market is so small they cannot survive local market only so that's why they target from the beginning global market in terms of entertainment industry so size can be a uh, good but it can be source of a trap yeah. May I uh, just add some comments to, to Professor Kinley's response to the interesting questions, if I may, uh, on the IPR, on the intellectual uh, property rights. Professor Kinley is correctly pinpointing that, particularly at early stage, uh, and if you are in a context in which you are using particularly uh, knowledge from abroad, then a loose IPR system may be, uh, let's say, more appropriate. But as, as you one 
wants to go up the ladder, uh, the country has to have, otherwise there will be no local accumulation. And by the way, it's not by chance in my view that much prior to, to, to Trump's war with China, we had the enactment of uh, uh, international property rights laws uh, in, in China, because ch as the moment China started to deposit uh, uh, in uh, rights, rights of innovations, it became on its own interest to, to have uh, some kind of protection. So yes, it's right, it's a double, but ultimately, if you wanna have local development at upper stage, there's no way you can get that without providing the investor some sort of a protection uh, in, in relative to, to uh, uh, stealing. Second point that I would make on, on, the, on the, the point about the, the flowers vis-a-vis -vis other sectors, look, we should, we should not be caught by any sort of prejudice against uh, natural resource uh, sectors. Look, uh, the same uh, uh, difficulty with competition also applies to most manufacturing activity. Uh, there's no monopoly in, in manufacturing. So whereas, let's say, uh, when you look at what is embedded, for instance, in the Brazilian agriculture that makes it so much competitive, is not in agriculture itself. It is the, the, the component of science in seeds, as well as uh, with the strong support originally by the, the, uh, the, the, the government research company and the Embrapa and so on. But at the end of the day, what goes out as ch uh, uh, Chilean flowers that I buy here in the US in the, in the, uh, in the winter time, it, it is technology there embedded. So we should, and it is not easily replicable. And that's why the Chileans managed to obtain uh, strong value added in producing fly flowers. So we should avoid making uh, broader statements about how easy and therefore uh, none enough uh, to do the, the, the job on natural resource vis-a-vis -vis other sectors. This is not based on, on facts. Third point that I'd like to make is the following. Look, is it precautious to say that uh, uh, Chile and, and Malaysia have overcome the middle income trap? Well, yes, maybe right, because they're not at the forefront of that process as Korea uh, has been. But if you take into account, let's say, the parameters used by the World Bank group to classify countries, Chile and Malaysia have crossed the, the limit of, uh, of uh, upper middle income country to the high income level as measured by per capita income. Uh, so that justifies taking them uh, as case of so, uh, so, uh, success so far. And finally, on the size of the country, come on. Uh, what Professor Kim Lee's research showed was the relevance of competition. This idea that we could use, for instance, a country the size of Brazil could use its domestic market and close it in order to obtain scale, uh, that would exactly would be, that was one of the mistakes of the Brazilian process of import substitution industrialization because it protects uh, from competition the, the, the incumbents, those one, uh, regardless of the size of the country. So the size of the domestic markets should not be seen as a substitute to the full engagement. As he, uh, Professor Kim Lee aptly remarked, uh, the, the export orientation was quite important in the successful case. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I just want Piano is an ex-vice uh, president of the World Bank, uh, executive director of uh, uh, VP of uh, the IMF, uh, ex-VP of the Inter-American Development Bank, um, uh, vice minister in here in Brazil, uh, professor, uh, ex-professor of Unicampi, an ex-professor of the University of São Paulo. I don't know. I think it's one person who did all this, but uh, <laughs> that's him. <laughs> <laughs> That's him. Um, currently, actually, he is affiliated with our school, with my school, the, the Elliott School of International Affairs in uh, Washington, D.C., at the George Washington University, and he is doing a great job teaching our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So we want to thank again Professor uh, Dr. Taviano Canuto and Professor Kim Lee for this keynote. And we <coughs> now move to the session two of our conference uh, about global value chain reorganization and opportunities for Latin America. I would like to invite our moderator, uh, Bruno Fischer, to join the table. Bruno Fischer is an assistant professor at the School of Applied Science here at Unicamp, and he's also one of the organizers of this event. On, um, you can hear me. All right, good. Otherwise, we'll have to start the mic microphone relay again. Um, so, welcome to the session two of our conference: Global Value Chain Reorganization and Opportunities for Latin America. So, we have five presentations. Um, I've been told that we had some last-minute uh, changes to the program. We're going to have uh, Professor Paulo Figueiredo from FGV in Rio. Uh, presenting first. So, Professor, please. Virtually. All right. Many thanks indeed for this opportunity of presenting this study in this distinguished conference. Um, I'd love to be there with you presenting this uh, study in person, but for health constraints, I've been advised to, to, to stay indoor. Uh, right. Uh, today, um, I'm going to, to present this study, uh, which is, in fact, an ongoing study um, in, based on the issue of innovation, capability, accumulation, in the human health biotechnology ecosystem in Brazil. Uh, its process, sources, outcomes, and policy insights. Uh, this study has been conducted by this team, um, uh, including myself. I'm with the Getulli Vargas Foundation. And also Daniela Oziel, she is a professor uh, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. She is a medical doctor. And she also heads the Center for Health Innovation Studies at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Bernardo Cabral, who is a professor at the Federal University of Bahia. And he, uh, there, he studies the economics of biotechnology uh, and innovation also. And there is also Lohana Palin, uh, who is a postdoc fellow at the um, uh, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in the area of uh, molecular biology. And Pedro Gomes, who is engineer, and he is also uh, MSc student at Unicamp Geosciences Institute. So uh, this study uh, actually has been motivated by several uh, factors. Um, one of them is the fact that with a population of 214 million and an universal public health system, the Brazilian uh, Unified Health System, known as uh, SUS, uh, which is grounded in the federal constitution of the country uh, under the notion that health is a social right. Um, because of this, there has been a... a an increasing demand for uh, government spending in public health services. Uh, this is associated with demographic factors, including, for instance, longer life expectancy, uh, but also aging population, uh, new therapies available within the SUS, uh, which has led to a growing demand for biotechnological drugs and active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs. But because of the limited supply of APIs and, and biopharmaceutical products, uh, there's been an increase of imports of those uh, bio drugs and also APIs, which has led the country to a trade deficit which reached $7 billion uh, in 2020. But despite Brazil being the world's 
sixth largest pharmaceutical market. Today, only 5% of the APIs um, uh, uh, used in Brazil are produced locally. But um, some decades ago, back in the 1980s, under the import substitution regime, around 60% of APIs uh, were produced by the country. Uh, but then comes the disruptions caused by the COVID pandemic. And this, these disruptions, they have somehow reignited in Brazil uh, discussions on the country's dependence on imports of biotechnological drugs and APIs. So there are now uh, discussions and initiatives at government and business uh, sector levels to rethink the model of engagement in the global pharmaceutical value chain uh, and the high dependence on India and China for those inputs. In other words, there has been now some movements towards the upgrading of the local ecosystem to supply the country's needs for biopharmaceuticals and APIs. Uh, but at the same time, that there are some discussions, some policy initiatives and so forth. There is also uh, a scarcity of evidence and analysis related to the, uh, the proper upgrading of this uh, kind of ecosystem. So there is a scarcity of evidence to inform uh, public policy on the nature and dynamics of the local ecosystem from the perspective of technological capability accumulation for these activities. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is also a dearth of evidence in the international literature and, and analysis also relating to the accumulation of innovation capabilities, its process, sources, and outcomes, especially in the uh, ecosystem of uh, human health biotechnology in late industrializing ecosystems. So uh, basically those are the motivations which led us to design this study, uh, seeking to generate new evidence and analysis of the process, uh, but also the sources and the outcomes of innovation, capability accumulation in the ecosystem of human health biotechnology. Um, what I'm going to present to them is some, are some findings related to this ongoing study. Uh, we are still in the process of implementing this study. So this study is basically organized around this framework to meet this kind of ob objective. Um, our central uh, issue is the accumulation of uh, technological capabilities, which we disaggregate in capabilities to operate existing biotech systems or uh, biotechnologies and capabilities to innovate, to change and to create uh, new technologies in this area. We are interested in the sources for those capability building processes and also the outcomes of all these efforts. And of course, as we know, this equation is uh, influenced by several other factors and we are analyzing them also in the study, uh, especially uh, the demand side, uh, the, the, the pressing issues, uh, the regulation, IPR things, and government policy, micro and meso level institutions also. So basically the, the research context and methods involve, for instance, the mapping out of the, of the ecosystem. Um, in Brazil, fortunately, there is um, a good scientific stock of, sci of scientific capabilities actually in this ecosystem. This involves, for instance, the presence of some renowned um, public research institutes like Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, Instituto Butantan, and so forth. And they provide, together with some universities, uh, the scientific capabilities which help us to analyze 
the 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 process of accumulation of technological capability in this ecosystem. So basically, we are centered on the startups and also the incumbent firms and considering the links, the knowledge links with the rest of the ecosystem. Um, in terms of design of the study, we avoided the traditional way of designing a research like this uh, in terms of simply going to the literature, uh, implementing the study, collecting data from the companies and delivering in the end a final report or an academic paper. We decided to engage the stakeholder, stakeholders right at the beginning of the design of the study. So we conducted several workshops. We simply uh, began to hearing from them uh, about the pressing issues, problems, uh, needs, demands, and so forth. So we, we, we held actually uh, more than five workshops. Um, and in those workshops, we were able to to together important inputs for the design of the research questions. Then we carried out a pilot work uh, involving interviews with key stakeholders, then um, application of questionnaires. So we are now right in the middle of this study and we should engage more companies in the following months. So far, we have studied four to one companies, including startups and also incumbents. And of course, including other types of organizations such as research institutes and also universities. More or less, our ecosystem is, is spread across some states of Brazil. Um, a darker shading reflects the higher intensity of sampled startups and incumbent pharmaceutical companies, uh, biotech companies in the state of Sao Paulo and then also states of Minas Gerais and others. Well, what I'm going to show you is some preliminary findings that our team have been um, examining uh, based on the framework I showed you earlier. Uh, in terms of the technologies employed by the startup companies and also by the incumbent companies, we have found a variety of technologies in the field of biotech. Uh, from gene vectors to cell and tissue culture and engineering. And in those technologies, we examine to what extent they have been uh, developing capabilities around those technologies, not only to use them, but especially to change uh, those technologies. So this is the picture from the startups and this is the picture from the incumbent companies, okay? So they use a diverse uh, portfolio of capabilities, sorry, technologies. Right, uh, now I'm gonna show you some preliminary findings uh, regarding the central issue or the issue of accumulation of technological capabilities. And what we have found is actually that we are uh, uh, gathering evidence regarding capabilities as a stock of resource, knowledge-based resource, which is accumulated in human capital, professionals, and so forth, technical systems, and also organizational system. And we can classify this stock of capabilities in terms of levels, from very basic level, like operating level, to the uh, world leading level. And we make an important analytical distinction here, which is the distinction between capabilities simply to operate and those capabilities to innovate. The capabilities to innovate in turn are further disaggregated into four levels. So the idea is that the more we disaggregate the more we find in terms of details, nuances. And this is very important for policymaking. Um, 
And the findings related to the studied startup is more or less like this. We have been uh, finding a variety of levels of capabilities. Some companies, they have not only accumulated the basic level, but some of them have moved up into more uh, sophisticated levels of innovation capabilities. This is, is the picture from the startups. And we also find this variation in the context of incumbent firms. Uh, it is important to say that this type of disaggregation in terms of capability accumulation is very important for designing of effective public policies for innovation because policymakers will be able to identify in an ecosystem the amount of companies which are stuck at basic levels of capabilities and trying to design some policy mechanisms to stimulate them to move up this scale. And also it is important to know that the incentives, the policy incentives are different for specific levels of capabilities. So this is why we are insisting in, in, in this type of analysis, although it is quite daunting and time consuming. Um, and we also disaggregated the distribution of those capabilities. Most of those capabilities, they have been accumulated by those companies in terms of collaboration. Uh, it is actually distributed across the, the ecosystem, uh, including, for instance, uh, local universities, um, other biotechnology companies, pharmaceutical companies, other startups, specialized suppliers. And this holds also for the case of startups and incumbent firms. We also saw at some outcomes, what comes from these type of partnerships or from this time of partnerships implemented with all those stakeholders. Uh, there are some important outcomes emerging from those partnerships. For instance, new product development emerging from uh, the, the collaboration with research institutes, uh, the recombination of existing knowledge emerging from the, um, the partnership with specialized users and also other startups. Um, in terms of location, of those uh, partners, they are distributed across Latin America, but also in the US aid, Canada, Europe, United Kingdom, and in China. Uh, so it means the companies are searching, are trying to get knowledge, not only locally, but globally, uh, depending on the need they have to meet their demands and build their capabilities for that. Um, in terms of the sources of those capabilities, which is the second major issue in our study, we have been using a framework that identifies different types of mechanisms companies use to acquire um, external knowledge, but also to create knowledge internally. And what we found for uh, the startups in terms of the acquisition of external knowledge is the use of a variety of mechanisms to, um, to, uh, to acquire knowledge from external sources. This ranging from, for instance, hiring expertise to um, collaborate with uh, universities locally and internationally, but also to send people for training, for external training. And this is also interesting for the case of incumbent firms. They also use a large variety of external knowledge acquisition. And we're going to go further in the analysis to measure the effectiveness of those uh, learning mechanisms in terms of their impact on the accumulation of innovation capabilities. Um, in terms of internal knowledge creation, uh, we have found that those sampled startups and incumbent firms 
they have been engaged in several mechanisms, for instance, for experimentation, uh, training, uh, knowledge integration inside the company, knowledge codification, uh, knowledge sharing. So those are the practices we have been um, finding in those incumbent firms, but also in the startups, okay? What I'm, we're going to do later is to disaggregate it more and, and uh, implement some more quantitative analysis uh, to measure the effectiveness of those learning mechanisms. And finally, in terms of outcome, the question is, does it matter? Does it make any difference? All those efforts in learning and capability building in terms of innovative activities, sustainable growth, export, and so forth. So far, we have been uh, finding some important impacts for the startups. It is important for the scale up of the startup. It's also important for cost reduction, but especially uh, it is important for the introduction of new products. For incumbent firms, it is important for for new product lines, for new um, biotechnological drugs development and so forth. Uh, so basically this is uh, uh, a glimpse of the preliminary findings we are getting from this study. Uh, we believe that this is a kind of relevant study to inform uh, policymaking, especially in the process we are now in Brazil of having this high demand for those types of drugs and the discussions there are at the policy level and private sector level in terms of upgrading the ecosystem to take advantage of the scientific base the country has built in this area, but also the advantage of the large stock of biodiversity that there is in the country. So we hope that next time we'll be able to come back with more uh, detailed uh, evidence and analysis in this, uh, about this issue. Many thanks indeed for your patience. I'll be able to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Professor Figueiredo. We hope next time also we can have you here with us in Campinas. So now we have some time to take questions and comments from the audience. Um, thank you. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first is about the thank you. Uh, assessment of the innovation capabilities, these five levels. I didn't really understand how you came up with these and whether they were externally or internally um, developed. And the second question is about your methodology. I find it very interesting that you engaged with the startups and incumbent firms very early on. Um, and this kind of part of, uh, participatory uh, research has, has many benefits, but I'm wondering um, encounter any problems or aspects in the process that that were conflict loading in a sense that you had different interests than the firms or did firms expect you to do some kind of market research or were there any uh, let's say tension uh, during during this kind of uh, uh, participatory approach thank you Right. Yeah, many thanks for your comment. Um, indeed, uh, it is quite difficult to, to get evidence from this type of uh, ecosystem, and particularly when we are taking a inside um, a view from within companies, a macro level perspective, which is quite difficult, it's quite a challenge. But it is also rewarding to when you when you get the evidence to somehow um, examine the evidence and 
and treat the evidence in a way that we can somehow uh, reconstruct the path of capability accumulation. Uh, we, we are considering the, the external uh, sources of capabilities as a major uh, uh, input for capability building, but it is also important to consider the uh, actions and mechanisms they use uh, internally. And of course, uh, one of the main challenge also is to try to elaborate some, some policy recommendations on the base of this, because also this is a very risky kind of endeavor. Uh, so it is very important that policymaking can support those startups until they get, for instance, a certain level of maturity. But we are going to take your comments also into consideration for further improvement. Thank you very much. Any additional comments or questions? All right, thank you, Professor Figueiredo, very much for Ron. Thank you. What? There, there's another, there's one last question, sorry. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, it was very uh, interesting and very inspiring talk. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I just uh, wonder, um, did you also come across in your interviews to what extent uh, the companies uh, faced um, institutional obstacles, right? Uh, because you focus a lot on technological capabilities. Uh, but I guess that especially in this type of sector, uh, the institutional environment uh, 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 might be very important. Um, so uh, did you come across uh, any evidence of that uh, uh, during the interview? So I'm just interested. Yes, many thanks indeed for the relevant question. Uh, yes, we, we are considering as a central variable, central issue, the accumulation of technological capability, but we consider very much the external influence on this process, especially the institutional effects coming from uh, policies, coming from regulation, coming from the uh, intellectual property system in the country, and also coming from the funding system. And this, the, those kinds of issues, they emerged very much during the workshops as uh, some of those issues still constitute some barriers for those companies to engage in more riskier and more innovative activities. So indeed, we are considering those uh, factors and they will appear in the analysis in a, in a robust way. So thank you for reminding us. That's very interesting actually, because I came across that sort of discontinuity, so to speak. It is very relevant indeed. And, and, and of course, this institutional discontinuity, they may somehow compromise the, the, the micro level efforts. So that's why we're considering them seriously. Excellent. So thank you very much again, Professor Figueiredo. Uh, I've, been told, thank you. Uh, I've been told during uh, Professor Figueiredo's presentation that we have an unlisted surprise coffee break right now. Uh, so uh, we can take a 10 minute break uh, and then come back and resume the session. That's okay. I mean, surprise coffee breaks always good, right?
Dá pra desligar a música. Essa, você prefere. É isso aqui. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, again. So we're going to resume the session of our event. Uh, we have a presentation by our own one. Steve, uh, together with Daniel B. Evicente, Nick Bonotas. Um, the title of the presentation is Smart Specialization in Guanajuato, Mexico, and International Connections. So, Juan Carlos, very much. You have the usual 20 plus 10. Okay, um, hello everybody. Welcome to my presentation. Um, it is my honor to present here during the conference in Campinas. Um, I am part of the group of INCISPO. I recently joined uh, the institution as a postdoctoral researcher. And I will present uh, um, uh, a bit of a case study on this uh, concept of, of a smart specialization that we have been seeing all over during the morning sessions. So this paper um, I co-authored uh, with Professor Villavicencio, which I understood he's online, and also with Professor Nicolas Bonortas. So the, the idea behind this project is that it's part of like a commission report uh, requested by the European Commission in the sense that um, what you have seen in the morning was more or, more or less like the academic perspective. However, the European Commission through the Joint Research Center is very interested in implementing this, this type of ideas from a, poli from a policy perspective, meaning that we were requested to see the manuals to understand uh, the ideas that they have in order for us to provide a, a policy advice inputs for the policy makers to undergo this type of projects. So the, the the sector that we were advised initially to take into consideration was the automotive manufacturing sector in the region of Guanajuato. Uh, however, we were also supposed to come with some additional insights that could help regional planning, that could help regional development in this part of Mexico. So, well, basically, this is what I'm going to tell you, like um, three key ideas. Well, in fact, there, could, there are going to be four. Uh, the first one is a shift in regional specialization. What I will show you is that this region in Mexico progressively switched from being specialized in clothes to be progressively more specialized in the automotive sector. Uh, and then we, I, I will show you how we were able to identify a promising new mar market niche for a smart specialization, which is the production of other parts of automotive vehicles. So the general idea is it's not the entire manufacturing sector. It's only one specific market niche the one that we were supposed to identify and validate for empirical evidence for policymakers to, to start supporting. Something very important is like um, the idea that we need to cooperate in this type of projects. I, I had the opportunity to present this um, yeah, for the Joint Research Center like a few days ago. And one of the key ideas uh, that uh, one of the policymakers from Europe was stressing out was the fact that, that in Latin America, we are very social we like to engage in social events, 
However, he was insisting the thing that we miss is the fact that we don't really collaborate with, with one another. So one of the ideas that the smart specialization, uh, uh, these uh, the main ones stress is the fact that you have to find uh, partners and these partners are not only to be found within your region, but also outside. And also you have to map the strategic actors that, we, that are going to be part of this type of projects. So research institutions and extra, extra regional actors are suitable partners for this strategy. So let us start, why Guanajuato and why the automotive sector? Well, uh, this is an interesting case, interesting case because if you understand a little bit about Mexico, you will see that the industrial part of Mexico is located in the Northern part, right in the border with the United States. We have the case of this state, which is not in the border, but it's part of the industrial heart of Mexico that would used to be like the industrial part of the, of the country back then. I'm, I'm referring to the, to the 1950s uh, under, under the process of import substitution and industrialization. So we have to start by pointing out which are the competitive advantages that this uh, territorial location has. So, well, one, one important thing is that it's not that far from the border. It's 19, 10 hours driving distance to the, um, to the border to San Antonio, to well, all, that, all that part of the United States. But also this sector has an important advantage in the sense that it's a bit in the middle uh, from two uh, strategic points, which are the maritime ports. Uh, Mexico is unique in the sense that we have access to the two oceans, the Pacific Ocean and the other, the Atlantic Ocean. So this is especially good for, for the automotive production that requires like proximity to, to, other, to other major markets. And an important thing, about this uh, sector, about this uh, region, was that it, ex it, had some, it had already an important industrial growth back in the 1960s when the country was following import substitution and industrialization. This idea that we were supposed to produce our own capital goods, our own um, final goods. So this, um, this uh, country, this part of the country really extensively benefited. Nonetheless, as of 1994, that the Mexican economy uh, opened up to the US market, uh, we have now the USMCA, which is the new word for NAFTA. You can no longer, you can no longer say NAFTA is USMCA. And, and also like we open up to the, um, uh, to the market, we face a, st a stiff competition from Asian producers. So therefore Mexico, the, the country as a whole, stopped producing textiles. And this was one of the biggest, one of, one of the biggest producers in the country. Uh, this was really associated to something that we no longer have. Uh, which you, might have heard, you may have heard of the maquiladora production. The maquiladora is slowly disappearing, which implies good news for the country, but also bad news because you, uh, this is kind of associated to the uh, migrate, migrate, migra, migratory flows to the United States. So therefore we see something different. We see like what we could label as, an, as economists, like a process of structural change in the sense that we are moving from segments that add low value added to other segments that are progressively more value added. And the thing is that um, Guanajuato is slowly over the, over the face of three decades, slowly switched from the, products, from, products, uh, from the production of boots, from the production of leather, to being progressively specialized in transport equipment centers. I stress this because this is not a, 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 a one a region in, the, in Mexico, which is part of the heart of the industrial part, which is not, it's not a Northern state. So this part of the country somehow managed to realize that it has some competitive advantage to be continually specialized in this production. So therefore, by 2020, uh, in fact, as of 2010, I'm, show you, I'm showing you the latest available data, half of the production of this region in Mexico belongs to one single sector. The textile sector used to be the predominant one, but now it, it accounts for only 4%. Now it's more traditional. And we have only one sector that accounts for more than half of the output of a single state in Mexico. We also see a process of internationalization, which is, called, which is required by these um, manuals in the sense that we have that this uh, uh, city, this region is the second largest exporter in transport equipment of Mexico. So whenever Mexico exports a car, it's quite likely that it comes from this state. So therefore, we need, um, then it comes the policy part, how to boost regional competitiveness and globally position Guanajuato's automotive manufacturing. So here it, here it is when you start accounting for the concept of a smart specialization. As I mentioned in the morning, you already checked like the concepts that were developed by Professor Ron Boschman and Mariani that took, took some others. 
However, what we are seeing now is that we are kindly asked to guide Guanajuato into the different processes from the, from the identification of competitive advantage till the part of investment projects. So therefore, what we wanted to have is like, we were supposed to follow, well, Guanajuato is supposed to follow four stages, which is the learn phase, the connect phase, demonstrate, commercialize, and scale up. This has been present all over Europe. However, uh, we were only asked to see, to conduct this study in the learn phase. You, uh, we, our partners, because well, we were working with a, uh, some sort of a consultancy firm that have gone through the entire process or for some regions in Slovenia, if I remember correctly, some others in Denmark. However, we were only asked to help Guanajuato with the learn phase. What is the learn phase? Uh, as it names, it says that you have to learn what you are good at. This is something that is explicitly mentioned in the manual. So identify competitive advantage beyond the territorial ones that I mentioned, identify priority domains, and also look for partners. And the partners are not supposed to be found only within your region. You are kindly asked to look for partners that are outside and even extra in, the, in other countries. So this is what we conducted. So what are the sources of information? Okay, um, something important is the fact that, well, when you get to see the projects that are uh, prepared by the European Commission, they have lots of wonderful data, they have access to publicly available data and everything. However, when it comes to our region, we don't have that much information available. So what we did is that following the new trends in the agenda for marketization, we utilize uh, information from the input output table. Uh, as you remember in the presentation of the morning, um, it was highlighted as one of the parts of the new agenda. However, uh, we went uh, uh, into very detail. We took information at the six digit level, meaning that we could map the different activities that participate in a global value chain, taking into account more than 300 stages of production, more than 300 uh, um, in, uh, activities. And therefore the next part that we do is that we were also able to connect this information to the economic censuses in Mexico that we have. This is very good because we can have information at the territorial level, at the level of municipality, not only in terms of the industrial activity that they have, but also in terms of the innovation related activities that they perform. Meaning that it's not only the fact that we were, we were able to see information in terms of patents, well, that we didn't really use, but also like some of the new highlights on there. The Oslo manual that tell, was telling you the type of organization that you are supposed to follow and so forth. Another important thing that we use, we use the official directory of firms, which means that Mexico publishes all the firms that are available in the country, which is a huge directory of 5 million firms. We don't really use them all. We only use those that are linked to the strategic sector that we found. We also find information in terms of the exporters, multinational firms and firms that, um, that are participated in, in, in innovation projects funded by the government. These are the names. And what we were able to do is that we were able to match each of these directories with the official one and with the census through the name. This implied like a matching procedure, which was demanded at, at the first place, but uh, we were able to do it. And another thing that I'm not gonna elaborate that much because I didn't really participate, but this is important. The fact that we were asked to validate uh, the market with, uh, with key uh, stakeholders in the region. Um, this was conducted by Professor Daniel Villavicencio and it's also part of the report that we were already, that I was already mentioning. So moving on, okay, so after this, after an extensive review, we were able to identify two key sectors that are part of the automotive sector, but uh, that, uh, that we were, uh, that, that show like the, um, let's say like the most dynamic uh, trend. So we have two, which was electrical and electronic equipment and other automotive parts. So this is something interesting because well, it also highlights another competitive advantage from the country. Mexico is a top exporter of electronic goods. We don't really add that much value, but I mean, uh, we are a top exporter. However, well, Mexico is becoming a bit specialized on electrical and optical equipment, not only for production for the electronic goods, but also for automotive parts. This is also related to the development of the aerospace cluster that we have in the country. And the other one was the uh, automotive parts. So the first thing that the manual says that we, you should take into consideration is like, you need to analyze the evolution in terms of labor productivity. So we did that. We used economic census. This is information for the case of Guanajuato. 
So what we see is that over time, this sector, other automotive parts, uh, the one that you see in, in orange, record uh, is reporting increasing uh, uh, productivity levels. So this was like an important highlight for us to see that this could be an important market niche for the case of Guanajuato. So uh, then it comes the next part. One important shortcoming when somebody undergoes a value chain analysis is that most of the time you take for granted the value chain. You somehow assume that a firm or a sector belongs to a value chain, but you don't really elaborate on how exactly this participation takes place. So that's where we use the input output table. So we took the six digit level industry, other automotive parts, and we were able to map all the different activities that produce for that value chain in the sense that it produces intermediate inputs for them. So you have uh, three main quadrants. The one, the first one is the value chain information, which you have to use the in total intermediate consumption and the important thing for us as a developing country, the domestic part. Then the industrial data, I have a lot more information than the one you have here, but uh, we took, I am highlighting only the number of firms, which is the total number of firms, the multinational firms that are available there and the exporting firms. And the last quadrant, is the innovation related activities that you could see, the, the use of highly skilled workers and the innovation strategies that they are following. Um, whether they improve, the, whether they following, uh, they were following product innovation or process innovation, organizational uh, innovation and on the improvement of machinery. So the general idea is the following. We see that these two uh, sectors, um, uh, if the first one the, uh, is very important because this sector produces and demanded and demands imported in, uh, intermediate goods from its own sector. Meaning that if I invite those firms to come to Guanajuato, this will help the industrial growth of Guanajuato because one firm, one Korean firm that arrives will uh, require to start producing intermediate inputs for other firms that also belong to that value chain. That's why it's highlighted as the first because this firm produces its own intermediate inputs. The other one that I show you is also important. It's ranked 12 but uh, I highlighted here because it shows important productivity levels. I have information for a lot more. I also have information for the domestic ones. However, for a space constraint, I couldn't put it here. So what you can see is that these two uh, sectors uh, score very well in terms of internal internationalization. They have a lot of MNEs present, uh, like one third of the firms that are part of that value chain of that uh, uh, productive stages are multinational firms, and more importantly, nearly all of them are exporters, meaning that they are helping the, the region to position in global value chain. They score rather well in terms of innovation, in terms of the use of highly skilled workers, in terms of they are targeting to the improvement of machinery and so forth. The only thing that we are very concerned is the fact that these industries do not really demand domestic intermediates from Mexico. That is a still, as you can see, like um, uh, this, uh, the first sector, produces 10% of, uh, delivers 10% of intermediates for its own consumption. However, out of that 10%, only 1% is, uh, is from Mexico. So this is uh, still the thing that we are, that we, that we saw, we somehow forget during this, uh, uh, providing this policy advice, the fact that it creates a lot of industrial growth. However, the domestic part is uh, still not complete. So, well, the next part, that, uh, before I finish is, um, I will show you like the, the additional things that we conducted. We were also able to map um, the location of firms in order for us to identify an industrial corridor for this industry. So as you can see, um, the star in black that you can see, those are the key manufacturers uh, that export uh, the complete car. So this is the information that we have from SEAT. This is information that we have from the Ford Motor Company, Toyota. And then like the ones that you see in pink is like the, like the important market niche that I was mentioning. So therefore the ones that you see in yellow, those are the iron and steel that are uh, helping production of this type of goods. And that is the Mexican part. Those are the ones that are contributing the most for the, for the value chain and that are helping us to add a little bit more of value added. Then uh, another thing important is this, uh, taking into account the actors in the ecosystem of innovation. Uh, our information was a bit limited, but in, in nonetheless, we were able to compute uh, network analysis and in this network analysis, we identified that an important gatekeeper, an important, an important actor that has already conducted a number of collaboration with other firms is a public institution, which is the Celayas Technological Institute. So when any industrial plan that seeks to promote this market niche needs to really go to these guys because these guys have collaborated, 
and we have information that this collaboration has been successful. Uh, that's why it's um, uh, they are allocated according to their betweenness centrality, and the other ones are like also domestic firms that, uh, as it was highlighted by Professor Kunli, that they are important. Uh, we have this uh, pintura, uh, like painting thing, that's a, a Mexican firm. We have two other firms that are also important, multinationals, and below we have other uh, public research institutions that could be helpful um, uh, for the for undergoing this type of project. Uh, finally, the other actors um, that can be uh, uh, accounted for in the process, it's very important that uh, as, as regions, uh, uh, as, it has, as it is highlighted in the strategy, that we aim to collaborate. So there are other regions in Mexico whose structure, whose productive structure is similar and that could uh, somehow interact uh, with Guanajuato. Uh, of course, you have Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo León. These three are the northern states. We, we already know that they are very good. The important thing is uh, the, those that are in the corner, Aguascalientes and Puebla. This is good because they are in, they are part of the geographical proximity. They are neighbors with Guanajuato. So we may be highlighting the emergence of a mega corridor, um, given the fact that they are sharing some sort of externalities or something like that. So that could be it. And these are the general conclusions um, that we, um, that, uh, we have. So the seeking of potential partners should not be limited to the automotive firms in Guanajuato. There is a scope for interaction with other, with other firms. Uh, we really want the locals. However, in this specific market niche, it's not that feasible. We don't have that many. Uh, they are allocated in some segments of the value chain, which I could not in include, but uh, there, are, there is some local firms that can contribute on. Research institutions are very important. This is Celaya's uh, Technological Institute. It's important because even though it's not the top producer of patents as, as, the, as the regional university in Guanajuato, this industry has a lot of uh, knowledge, uh, this uh, research institution. Extra, extra regional actors, as I was mentioning, not only the Northern states, but also the neighbors, the ones that are located next to you. And the next part that it says that upon successful validation, that's why we have the interviews, Guanajuato will be able to move to the next uh, stage for a smart socialization, which is connect. Hopefully we will be invited, I hope so. So um, that's it, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, now I have uh, some time for questions, comments. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned the role of uh, USMCA leading to decline of uh, original textile food oil sectors. Can you elaborate uh, what happened early in terms of this uh, sector's decline? Secondly, uh, the ri rise of the automotive sector, is it planned or is it naturally growing uh, uh, out of some process? I don't know how much it was action by the government. Who, who, who chose the automotive sector as the next engine? Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Lee. Well, the part of, um, of uh, the decline, um, I mean, it, it, it is a mixture of things. Like, uh, I mean, this uh, sector was heavily protected uh, back, back, back in the 1960s. Um, even though, like, um, I mean, uh, uh, in Guanajuato, most of the producers that were uh, producing uh, the textiles were local. Uh, this is like, the rule with the maquiladora, which it was, which used to be, was the ones in the north were the multinationals, and the ones in the center were the nationals. So they were heavily protected. Uh, they were, they didn't really update on the machinery. So there are many, there are many issues that account for this part. Uh, joining uh, the the USMCA, this also meant that we were also open our market uh, to a steep Chinese competition, and that uh, we couldn't really. Um, their competition and therefore like uh, uh, the Mexican government could, couldn't really support them anymore. Uh, and therefore like, and then the part of the sector, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a mixture of the new strategy in North America, because uh, the thing is that something that, um, we, we, that I forgot to highlight is that here it plays a role of the rules of origin. I don't know if you're familiar with in the sense that um, uh, NAFTA demands, well, NAFTA back then demanded that whenever, if you wanted like a North American input to join, to enter free of duty, other North American input, it, it had to be produced with 60% of North American content. 
meaning that by, by doing that, we, uh, we were forcing the German firms, the, the Korean firms, the Japanese firms to come and produce in, in, in a North American country, which by cost uh, restrictions was going to be Mexico. That used to be NAFTA, USMCA raised it to 80%. So it's, it's like um, even more like an entry barrier um, because they were able to see that uh, like um, perhaps we, uh, the Chinese could, could like to compete with us in that sense. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, that, that was like in the part of the deliberate. Uh, uh, one of the interviews that Professor Villavicencio said was that it, this is not at the national level, but the regional level that the previous administrations in Guanajuato really seek for this window of opportunity that they highlighted that even though this, uh, this region did not belong to the northern part, it could have another potential in the new sector that was coming from Mexico. Because I mean, uh, uh, the NAFTA, I mean, um, it was well predicted that NAFTA was going to be all about the automotive. So like the planners in Guanajuato say, okay, we want a share of that pie. So let's, uh, let's see what we can do. And it's also seen in the other regions that are learning. So it's, it's as, 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 as you may understand, it's a mixture of many things. It's like a regional planning supported by the institutional agreements that we have and supported by the fact that this is like a region that is uh, very developed in the country, you know? Like uh, it's, uh, it's, you have the three key states and Guanajuato like with the highest per capita income in, in the country. Thank you very much. Juan Carlos, now we have a question from our online audience, Professor Daniel Vicencio. Yeah, if I may complete the answer, especially for Guanajuato, there has been from the late 90s, a very strategic public policy of the government to um, attract automotive firms. They began with GM when GM started what was looking for a region to establish in Mexico because of what, 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 kind of, what, kind of what Carlos had explained. And then after GM, 10 years later, there were some other films like Honda, uh, BMW, Volkswagen, Kia, and some others coming because the government of Guanajuato offered very good conditions for establishing. And another thing that Juan Carlos didn't mention was the lower cost of high qualified human resources of Mexico, especially from Guanajuato, because one of the policies of the government was to improve qualifying engineers, um, focusing on automotive and on the um, complementary sectors around the production of a car. So for us, uh, uh, the, um, a short question is yes, at least at Guanajuato's level, but some other states of the country, like Puebla or Aguascalientes, they have really done very strategic public policies to uh, attract the car industry from the late 90s up to now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor any further questions, comments? All right, thank you very much, Juan. Um, now I invite, uh, and this is a very much needed take on our discussions today, where we have a presentation by Cecilia Zanach. So she's from the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs. This is a very, very important perspective, not only to look into technological development, but also inclusion and diversity in, in terms of economic activity. So we're talking about not only reducing the income gap and including um, less favored populations, especially in countries such as Brazil, many other uh, developing countries as well that have these um, problems with income distribution. But we also have problems concerning gender distribution and also racial distribution among others. And um, Cecilia prepared a very interesting presentation uh, for today, please. Um, thank you very much for coming. You have uh, around 20 minutes.
afternoon. My name is Cecilia Zanotti. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Bruno. And thank you, everyone. Uh, I am the head of uh, the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs in Brazil. And I'll be glad to share with you uh, what is the gender approach, gender equality approach of Andy in the world, and how we work with uh, ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem building with this approach. So Andy is a program of the Aspen Institute, which is a philanthropic organization that was created in the United States. And Andy was born in 2009 as a global network of organizations that propel entrepreneurship. So we have now around 270 members, which are investors, accelerators, consultancy firms, corporations in more than 150 countries. And these organizations, these member organizations, they support more than 200,000 small and growing business. Andy works with this concept, small and growing businesses, which is which are business with uh, five to 250 collaborators that are seeking for capital an average from $20,000 to $2 million to grow. But these organizations, they don't know how to access capital and how to access the knowledge to grow. So Andy members provide the financial and non-financial support for this small business to grow. So our members are, a uh, majority of them are capacity development providers that gives uh, mentoring, acceleration, technical assistance for small business, investors, and then we have also foundations, research providers, associations, corporations, academic institutions as well. Uh, Andy has a, is headquartered in Washington, D.C., and we have eight regional chapters in Mexico and Central America, in Colombia and other countries in the Andean chapter in Brazil. And then we have in Nigeria, in Kenya and South Africa, and also in India and in Thailand, in Bangkok. Oops. Topic to change. Yeah. Um, we work with, uh, we aligned our strategy in 2019 with the, with the, <laughs> no, no problem, with the UN ODA, um, SD. <laughs> I always confuse the acronym of the Sustainable Development Goals. <laughs> and we are working now focused on the, the number five, uh, gender equality, and also decent work and economic growth, number eight, and then climate and environmental action. These are the three main focus areas that Andy works. And we are working to provide more capital to small and growing business, to increase the quality of the SGD support organizations and doing advocacy for, for more support for small business to grow. So what, what do we see in gender? I see that after the break, I see more women here in the auditory, <laughs> which was good for, for me to see. And um, we see that in the, it's very, it's a still a sector of uh, a very huge inequality. So just for us to have an idea in the US, only 4.9% of venture capital investors are female. 0.2% in the US are Latins and 0.2% Black women. Here in Brazil, less than 5% of all startups are founded by women. And in the US, only 3% of startups investments goes to female founders. And if we see here in Brazil as well, these numbers vary from 3 to 5%, but it's always less than 3 or 5%, it's, a, it's huge. So, and also uh, the international finance corporations, um, they, they, they calculated what is the gender financing gap in the world, in Latin America, and it's 300, $320 billion. And last, Andy has done a research also, we have a research that has been done by the Emory University in the US with um, more than 20,000 SGBs that were registered in acceleration programs. And when they uh, look at these numbers, they found out that women-led SGBs receive less than, less, uh, in average, $100,000 less 
compared to male-led ventures. So this is the context of gender inequality. So what, what have we Andy done? So we, we created a, a strategy that is called the Ended, End, Andy Gender Equality Initiative, which is a multi-year partnership among Andy, USA, and the Visa Foundation. And we created a regranting facility of $2.5 million to investors and entrepreneurship support organizations. How did we do that? We created four granting facilities to address the funding gender gap for SGBs. We have done eight action labs with our innovation labs with the methodology of MIT D Lab, and also five learning communities because among all these regranting facilities, Andy has uh, given money to 31 organizations over the last three years. And then we are now organizing these learning communities to really extract the knowledge that are coming from these uh, projects that were supported. So what have we done is uh, first, first regretting facility was called the Andy, the Advancing Women Empowerment Fund in Asia. So uh, members and other organizations could apply for around $1,050,000 and and $100,000 to create solutions to approach the and approach the gender gap, financing gap for entrepreneurs. And then we repeated that in Africa, financing three uh, entrepreneurial support organizations. And then we did two more facilities to really work with investors because uh, having in the investment teams, women in the board, women, and also creating uh, different changing their policies of investment, looking at every stage of the investment process and doing that with gender lens uh, approach, it really changes the number of women that business receiving investments. And the, the Action Lab is the initiative that, that is more connected to the event today to talk about supply chain. What have we done? Uh, we have created a, a process, as I told, MIT D Lab, the Lab of Innovation of MIT, trained the Andy team for us to facilitate the meetings. So we started creating a board of uh, advisors. We invited men, but they didn't accept. So we had a board of 100% women here in Brazil, three self-declared black and three uh, self-declared white. And what we did with this advisory board, we selected a challenge. And the challenge that we selected here in Brazil is how can we support black women entrepreneurs to access more markets? So with this challenge, we invited these organizations to be a part of the lab. And we met once per month during 12 months during a year. And we went through all the stages of the design thinking process. So we started with, defining the problem, the challenge of access to markets from black women entrepreneurs. Then we dove deep in this problem using desk research, using interviews, using other materials. And then we also started to imagine and form ideas. After that, we created a plan and some solutions. We tested, prototyped and tested some of the solutions. And finally, one of the lab participants proposed uh, a project to receive $100,000 to be executed this year. And this happened in Brazil, but also in the other seven regional chapters of Andy. So I will mention four examples of projects that uh, were approaching uh, gender inequalities. So Promohe, it's a, they are creating a platform to access high quality entrepreneurial content and training for women-led SGBs. Fundes Latino America is designing a protocol for investors to fight gender bias in every phase of the investment process, prospecting, evaluation, and approval. Impact Hub Manaus was the winner organization here in Brazil. So we are creating an inclusive platform, an inclusive procurement online platform that will share best cases of companies that are already changing their procurement process and how to really buy more from uh, black women entrepreneurs, from women entrepreneurs, from uh, LGBT community, uh, people with disabilities. 
And also, besides sharing the best practice, uh, we are identifying, accelerating training and matching with corporations, uh, 100 small business from Black women entrepreneurs here in Brazil. And last, uh, in Value for Women in Mexico, we will also create a platform to connect investors to women-led SGBs. So uh, this is mainly it. Uh, we invite we invite you to keep advancing advancing to raise gender smart investing among investors in Latin America, advancing to raise corporate procurement practice from to buy more from women led businesses, and also to support entrepreneurial support organization that can support women led business to grow. Uh, we also work with the the nexus of gender and climate in, in other countries as well. So. This is it. <laughs> Very quick presentation. <laughs> you can use the rest to, to ask questions. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Excellent, Thank Cecilia. Thank you very much. Again, I repeat, this is this is a very uh, important topic in our discussions today. It doesn't only matter uh, to where we go, but how we get there. And gender, reducing gender is a key issue, not only in Brazil, in case in Brazil, but also worldwide. So um, comments and questions? Ron? Yeah, thanks a lot for your presentation. I uh, like it a lot. I think it's an extremely good initiative. Um, I was just wondering when um, you, you started your presentation or your, your your presentation was really about how to how to improve the situation, right? And taking bottom up uh, initiatives uh, uh, to make it better. Uh, but um, I was just thinking all the time: what to you are the main barriers for women to become an entrepreneur, uh, and 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 to what extent is that taken on board when uh, developing your initiatives? Wonderful, yeah. We found out when we did the desk research, there are many barriers. Né? There are barriers in education. There are barriers in uh, self-confidence from women that are educated in a way that they should not be the first one to be there. To, to. So in the investment process, this, this becomes very clear because all the pitch <laughs> culture is very masculine. It's like, I am the best. I am the one. <laughs> Men are more used for this uh, behavior than women. So there is one uh, research that compared, for instance, two exactly equal pitches, one done for a man and one done from a woman. And then investors prefer to give money more for the male entrepreneur. And another uh, research compared, they, they analyzed the questions that were made for women entrepreneurs during the pitch and compared the questions that were made for men. And they noticed that 60% of the time for men, they ask it promotional questions. How is your business going to be in five years? What, how is your scale plan? And then for women, it was preventing questions. Like, what are you going to do if there is a crisis? <laughs> and then they found out that people that got the promotional uh, questions got like $16 million and then the Prevent, preventive questions got three million dollars in investment. So these kind of things show a lot the the bias. So the bias from investors is a really important point for us to work to help overcome barriers. And let me remember all the barriers: the competitive, the time that women has to dedicate for taking care of children and parents. This competes also with. Of with men, if men doesn't have this barrier as much as women. Of course, some men does do, but most women do have this uh, this other competitive. One. Yeah, I think these are the main that I, I remember now. Main barriers to be overcome. Um, I have a question. Um, the numbers are indeed uh, against women, um, but but have you considered? Uh, what type of companies women have In other words, maybe sectors or maybe the activities that they are pitching to investors do not require equal amounts of money. 
Yes, yes, I do. Um, yeah. Yes, I understand. I don't know how to answer this now, but it's a very good question for me to be prepared to answer later. <laughs> I will I will research more on that. Very vague is that women exactly the same as men very aggressive. Yes, yeah, sectors for sure uh, is a challenge. In technology, we know that we have just a very small number of women leading uh, business in technology. So this is also because also there is a cultural reality that, oh, I'm not good for technology as I'm not good for finance. So, but it's cultural. That's why we have to uh, really incentivate from education, women to be on these sectors as well. It's not that men are better than women, <laughs> I believe. A very closely related question to Nick. Um, I want to share the experience of the career. Uh, we have one startup called Mafi Colleague, and that was founded in, uh, by a very young woman. And then now the market capital is amongst the more than five billion US dollars, uh, huge, really huge. And she focused on the difficulties of uh, housewives to go to a supermarket. And then she uh, made a very innovative idea to deliver the fresh products overnight. And then it made a big hit. So based on your research, we expect you can recommend also, kind of uh, appropriate, am I right? But appropriate or good uh, sectors or type of business models uh, one can can challenge easily rather than the other one. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for bringing this topic to our attention. I think it's, it's very important. And, um, uh, it was a good introduction to the topic. I just remarked, I think when we talk about differences between genders, we also have to talk about the sexual aspects of age and ethnicity, because also when we look at age and racial distribution, we also see a lot of gaps. So it's not only gender. Um, um, but it, so when we look at other social categories, we also see um, a lot of differences that can um, can be explained by discrimination. And then the second uh, comment is about um, actually it's just a thought. I don't know if it makes sense, but from what you presented and also other initiatives. The basic idea is that we teach female entrepreneurs to play the game, right? To um, to to stand in in the in the game <laughs> of entrepreneurship. But it, I think we we also should maybe seize the opportunity to rethink what kind of practices dominate in entrepreneur ecosystem, and also I think the not necessarily everything is good how it's done in entrepreneur ecosystem there's also maybe some kind of or lack of solidarity i, I mean i you know what i mean it's it's the the approach that you a little bit presented is the idea okay we teach women to 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 play the game to to act to, to be more powerful and I totally understand and support this idea. But I also, but I also think we should 
take the initiative to rethink how, let's say, the standard rules are and whether maybe we should also do something about that to change these rules and not to change the women mm -hmm. so they can um, behave according to that. Yes, thank you. I really love your two comments. The first one, when we research for the four main barriers in Brazil of women, how to support women entrepreneurs, the first one was the intersectionality of gender and race. So if we don't uh, help more women, black women to come into the, to the game, then we will take much more time to resolve inequalities. And uh, McKinsey has, a, has this research that is very famous that if we had, if we achieve a gender equality, we would have $28 trillion added to the global economy. So more diverse led uh, corporations have a better performance. They have all these in their, in their, in their studies. So yes, we have to consider other, other diverse segments, segmentations together with that. It's just that we, with Andy, we chose the number five of, of, um, as, sustainable development goal. And then this, this initiative is really focused on women. But here in Brazil, we chose to work with black women because of that. And the second comment, we are in Andy now finding out from these 38 projects that we supported. Okay, we, will, we, we need to train women because of course, women has to know better how to manage finances and everything. But the biggest changes will come if we change corporations and investors. So that's why we are focusing much more uh, last week, we did a, an event here in Brazil uh, with seven uh, corporations. It was EY, Mercado Livre, Ambev, and other uh, big companies. And they are starting to create these inclusive procurement processes. It's, it's in the beginning, but they are already starting to. And then we are going to support them to really implement how can they have in their procurement softwares a uh, database of suppliers, diverse suppliers, so yes, we are focusing much more in, in how, if we have women in these positions, they will have help to change the game. And then we don't have to have this culture that really excludes women. Nice, nice comment. Excellent, Cecilia. Actually, I have, uh, it's, it's more of an invitation than a comment because I know the ASMA now works highly data intensive on what you do. Uh, you work, as you mentioned, with uh, Emory University in the United States. I've worked with the Global Accelerator Learning Initiative database already. So um, um, maybe we can help here at Unicub. Maybe if you have data and you can provide us uh, and you can share experiences and we can set up a line of research that um, can help you. This will be wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Best result from this opportunity. Definitely. That's why we, are, we invited you <laughs> oh, to see you. your presentation and to connect. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you very much, Susie. Thank you. Yeah. If I may, uh, if I may, just just a, a, a final addition, since several colleagues have already offered uh, you, Cecilia, the, uh, the, uh, the, the analytics just to mention, since you mentioned the, uh, the McKinsey, let me tell you that uh, Pierre Richard Agenot and I uh, developed in the, in the first half of the, of the last decade, a model uh, that is translatable into Excel uh, in which one may introduce several data on, on, on gender uh, inequality in the, in the countries. And, uh, and that may allow one to estimate the gains in terms of GDP by moving uh, in, in some of those components of the gender inequality. We devised that, that model exactly to try to convince ministers of finance of the countries in our policy device, uh, how gender equality mattered not only uh, as, as such as a sustainable development goal, but also because it brings economic gains. And, and this is something that is uh, demonstrable through uh, the analytics that we developed at the time. So uh, good job. And uh, we need to convince this. We need to hammer on this. Economically speaking, there is a huge gain to be accrued if we debunk uh, the uh, components of discrimination between gender. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Tavia, for your comments. Um, Mateus, can I proceed? All right, so now we have a presentation from a, a friend of mine, a colleague. I've been working with her for quite some time now, since before the pandemic. Uh, rethinking the NHELIX agents' roles in Latin America, lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. I invite Professor Maribel Guerrero. Maribel, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. Do you, thank you. Do you listen uh, well? Yes. Uh, I'll let you know when we reach 20 minutes of presentation, that, if that's okay. Yeah, maybe I'm going to uh, spend less than that, but <laughs> don't worry about it. So I, I, right. I, I, I am going to be in that um, time of uh, period. So, well, uh, thank you very much also for inviting me. Uh, uh, it's a pity that I am not be there because, well, uh, this is not a, a very uh, good moment for me for traveling. But, um, but well, uh, I, I really enjoyed um, to be the third presenter because um, most of the presenters have been topic, uh, to talk, talking about uh, a little bit the three elements that I would like to discuss with you today. Um, well, uh, first, I am not going to present a paper per se, but I am going to present some insights that of the paper that have been done during this period, uh, and as well as um, part of my experience as a part of the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. Um, um, so in that sense, I would like to talk uh, with, uh, with you this, uh, this well, afternoon, uh, three key elements. For example, uh, the elements about the different N N N NLX, and as well as, for example, the context of Latin America, and as well as what are the lessons that, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic gave us during this period. So uh, in that sense, well, most of the time uh, we, we need to analyze the past for uh, the lighting the future, but most of the time also we need to focus on the present. So uh, this is the, the, the three elements that I would like to discuss also with you uh, during this presentation. So. Well, I would like to tell you a little bit about what are the, the main elements um, that emerge from, from the idea that I'm going to uh, share with you. So during the first uh, months of the pandemic, or well, we can say that the first year of the pandemic the, during the 2020, so uh, I was teaching uh, two elective courses from the PhD programs that were the social entrepreneurship and as well as digital entrepreneurship. But at the same time, I was running different projects um, as the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. Um, that those for, who are not familiar with that project, well, we are measuring the entrepreneurial activity um, around the world. So uh, and, and was very challenging at that moment, but also give us a, a very interesting um, elements for combining theory and practice, and as well as combining research, and as well as generating several impacts with the population that uh, at that moment was the, the key point of uh, the research that were the entrepreneurs. So, and also uh, during the same time, we discovered that at that moment that different uh, multiple entrepreneurial initiatives emerged uh, not only, uh, even that we, we have social restrictions, uh, most of these initiatives were digital, for course. Most of these digital were uh, focused on health issues of supporting uh, vulnerable communities, but also give us an external elements for also uh, generate different patterns that I am going to discuss with you today. And also, of course, uh, we, as a social researcher, we have this curiosity for continue um, uh, continue generating value added for the, uh, through the scholarly impact that we are developing uh, to the community. So uh, the first element is like uh, the NLX that I call, uh, I call it. And why I call it the NLX? Because if we analyze the literature, we understand that, for example, there are a lot of um, studies that have been discussing about the phenomenon of the triple LX. And what does that mean? Well, this is uh, a phenomenon that emerged uh, in the context, uh, most of the time, the literature to say it in the context of the knowledge society, when there are three different elements that are involved uh, in, a, in a collaboration process, that is the government, the industry, and the university. And then if we continue analyzing, uh, uh, recently there are other studies that are talking about the quadruple helix. And what does this mean? This, these studies, uh, try to pursue that this phenomenon or this new ways of collaboration emerge in an open knowledge society. That is the collaboration between the academia, 
the industry, the government, but also the civil society. So what does this mean? This means like uh, the people try to solve problems uh, and not only focus uh, on the collaboration in, in the first step, but also try to solve uh, sustainable issues uh, in that sense. But also, if we continue analyzing the literature, there are other phenomena that call it the quintuple helix. And this means like uh, they, they contextualize this phenomenon in terms of the novel society and as well as democracy. And here is like an, an ecosystem that working in the collaboration with these, three, these different actors that I mentioned before, plus the environmental issues. So if we continue analyzing, there are different studies that mention that, for example, the triple helix focus in the information trans transition, the quadruple helix focus on the knowledge transition, and the quintuple helix focus on this sustainability of socio sociological transition. Well, Based on that, uh, we can understand that if we analyze the evolution of the policies, uh, this configuration of these mod modes of collaboration also supporting the developing of different policies or different initiatives that help, for example, in the US, developing the evolution of different technology transfer uh, initiatives that have generating a lot of impact not only in terms of economic, but also in terms of developing new technologies that solve pro social pro societal problems, and as well as, for, for example, generate also social impacts. These things also happen, for example, if we explore in the UK context, that this is uh, the, where I have been more related. So how this collaboration between university, government, industries, and other agents have generating these impacts. But, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we analyzed and we discovered that, of course, these different elements that I mentioned before is still combining in this relationship for supporting the, the health crisis at that moment, but also emerging other elements, for example, the no-profit organization, the digital platform, and emerging a lot of elements that started to combine different uh, ways of collaborating for solving that specific problem. So at the, at the end of the day, I would like to share the idea that of course, the global value change also are part of this combination of NLX uh, agents. So what does this mean? That uh, in terms of the evolution of new economic and social paradigm, this evolution process of collaboration also emerged, not only at individual levels, but also, for example, at city level, at regional level, at country level, or even though sometimes at international level. So, and also right now after the COVID-19 pandemic, we analyze that this collaboration not only can be in person, but also can be digital or hybrid. That this is like, like this, like that, that the process that we are living right now. And why is this important? Because I am going to explain some elements in the, few, in the next slides that help us to understand why is the importance of this configuration of the different um, elements that have been part of this uh, collaboration patterns. So then if we include the ingredients of Latin America, when we analyze Latin America, I would like to analyze in terms of business density. So as I am part of the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, uh, one of the questions uh, that emerged um, during the pre previous presentation uh, were related with the, the level of innovation, for example, of women or level of innovation um, or the sector that have been involved or what is the impact of this uh, or what is the, uh, the, the importance of the sectors, the, impo the importance of the size or the, or the importance also of the configuration of the, these companies that are part of uh, the, the entrepreneurial density. So we need to be so carefully, because also we really understand that most of the percentage of the new companies and established companies in the context of Latin America are SMEs, so medium and size, small, medium and size enterprises. So, uh, and also most of the time when we analyze what is the configuration of that uh, companies, most of the time these companies are innovative in the first stages of, of the first months when they are developing the business model for entry to the market. But then they're focused only in the local market and they forget 
the uh, continue the, the innovation in the process, or uh, as well as collaborating in different uh, elements with other agents uh, in, in the ecosystem too. So when we analyze that companies that are established and mature, some most of the time are less innovative than the companies that are starting an entry in the system. So if, if we analyze the first graph, uh, um, but, but particularly I am focusing the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor that has two important um, indicators. The first one is the, the total entrepreneurial activity that measure the percentage of the population of one country that has mentioned it that are developing a business that with less than 40, 42 months. And the second graph show the entrepreneurial employee activity. This activity is, is like a synonym of corporate entrepreneurship. What this means, this means like a, the entrepreneurial activity that are developing inside a company that are more related with innovation and more related with the developing of new companies like startups, spin off or spin, -off, or spin outs. And if we analyze, uh, and we contrast the, these indicators uh, with the G GDP per capita, we understand that, for example, in the first graph, that is the total entrepreneurial activity, most of the Latin American countries has a higher percent of entrepreneurial activity. What does that mean? This means like a, they have a lower uh, percentage of GDP per capita, but higher level of entrepreneurial activity. What does that mean? It means that obviously, given the conditions of the labor, labor conditions, and as well as the ecosystem conditions, they, these people most of the time need to create their own uh, their own activities for gain and for surviving in, in that context. But if we analyze the other graph, that the, the entre, uh, employee, entrepreneurial employee activity, we understand that most of the countries that are, for example, in Europe or developing countries or the Northern countries are the most um, active in the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity. So that means that, for example, in that context, the, um, the labor condition as well as the innovat, innovation process as well as the different incentives to innovate are more active. So, for this reason, uh, Professor Canuto mentioned that, for example, the institutional conditions matter. And also it's important to understand what is the configuration of the, that institutions, not only in terms of the configuration of the ecosystem, but also, for example, we really understand that in the Latin American context, there are different institutional voices that also um, are the, the key barriers for the development of entrepreneurial activity that also are part of that innovative process and as well as this global change um, value. So in one study that we developed in the past, uh, we really uh, analyze in deep what are the different conditions um, based on previous studies that um, they understand, for example, the different um, stages of entrepreneurial activity and what are the main conditions of that environment that, for example, um, are the barriers or are the supporters of the entrepreneurial activity in that moment. So when we focus on developing economy, we can see in that um, table that most of the policies, most of the, uh, uh, um, we can say that uh, supporting programs and financial issues and cultural issues, and most of the time are negative for that entrepreneur. So for most of the time, they, they, these entrepreneurs believe that it's difficult to manage that kind of barriers in order, for example, to be innovative, or even though, for example, to be uh, like an entrepreneur or survive in that context. And also this process also is a, is a key issue when they try to scale enough to one step, one, for example, when they have the intention and they want to create a business or when they have the business and want to translate to a mature stage in that process. So for the reason it's important to understand that, for example, has also Cecilia mentioned and as well as, for example, uh, other um, presenters, explaining it's important all the conditions, for example, the higher education context, the talent is important, and as well as the labor condition markets, and as well as all the connection with the market that most of the time in developing economies are very difficult to, to develop. So, but what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic? So during this process, uh, there is one interesting antecedent because for example, obviously in the past we have the, uh, we can say the experience of how to manage crisis, but the, this crisis impact in different con 
ways to the different countries and in different moments. But the COVID-19 pandemic affect at the same time most of the countries uh, around the world and also generate these um, lockdowns and restrictions. And also, for example, the developing of certain kind of industries because obviously they limitate the, the most important uh, of the priorities uh, in terms of other activities. So, and there is interesting, there, there are different interesting studies uh, most of the time developing for Professor Canavaris that by, by basically uh, he focused on understand how, for example, the role of these elix or different L, uh, um, agents has been part of after the crisis. And particularly, there is a very interesting case based on the 2008 financial crisis, uh, focused mainly that the most affected was Europe. Uh, and, and they are starting to analyze how all the European countries are starting to understand if the roles of collaboration, the roles or interconnections, and the role of how to change uh, and obviously the most important issue is how to allocate, allocate the limited resources that they have, the governments uh, in order to, for example, to, to, re to revive the, the, the economy. And, and so for the reason, they, they considering, considering that a new paradigm uh, emerged in that context. And this is the, the, the most in, the important motivators of the call it uh, smart specialization programs that I started in in around 2011, 2013, after the COVID-19, uh, after so the, the, the 2008 financial crisis. So, and this is a very good example because uh, Carlos, and also it is more, in, uh, if I understand well, the smart specialization process was uh, analyzed in deep. And also, this is also an antecedent how, how all these important um, management of crisis affect in this process. So. Here I show you, for example, how the how was the response of different institutions. For example, the the the, the, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, how they are starting to create this connection with different persons, organizations, initiatives, funding projects, etc., for supporting entrepreneurial activities. And as well as I give you another example of you from you, the US at this Stanford University that also developing different global scholar connections, developing multidisciplinary focus, and as well as uh, developing uh, a strong funding programs and as well as uh, different connections in order to solve that problems at that moment. So, and what is the experience in Latin America? Well, when I started to, uh, to connect in uh, all the research and, and based all the experience that I mentioned before, I just started to focus on different, um, different collectives of entrepreneurs because of different communities of entrepreneurs based on the dissertation that I am um, supervising and also ba based on the project that I am participating also. So, and when we are starting to focus on women entrepreneurs, what are the lessons that the COVID-19 gives us to the women's entrepreneurs? So uh, we, ask, we have an interesting panel of follow-up of entrepreneurial uh, um, women. And for example, we follow them before the pandemic and after the pandemic and during the pandemic. So, and in this sense, it was very interesting because regarding with the global value change, this, this particular uh, entrepreneurs um, found the main elements, for example, for go abroad. So uh, at the, in, the, in the past, this, uh, these women entrepreneurs have the main barrier to go abroad, to export or be international, uh, starting in this internationalization process. But the global value change that the COVID-19 give us the, 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 the opportunity to go digital and as well as with digital connection and starting to do international uh, activities in other countries. So, and most of the, uh, and, and big percentage of these women analyzing that if the COVID-19 pandemic uh, didn't happen, uh, they didn't have the opportunity to experiment in this process. And also, for example, they didn't have the opportunity to go abroad with a lower cost for all these um, connections and relationships that they have. The negative thing also is because most of the time 
has um, to answer one of the questions from the audience in the previous presentation. Most of the time, um, these women entrepreneurs are focused in, in sectors that are more affected with the COVID-19 pandemic, but also we need to understand that there are uh, women entrepreneurs that are developing technological and as well as very innovative initiatives and also are very proactive in that terms. The problem sometimes is like a, a the women entrepreneurs most of the time are very conservative in terms of investing. They considering that investing is important when also, when, when they are facing crisis uh, or internal crisis uh, the, do uh, the external ones. But the thing is like they need to be conservative in contrast with the, with the main entrepreneurs. So, and also, for example, we also understand uh, when we pay attention to the serial entrepreneur, that entrepreneurs that, for example, in the past, most of the time, um, some, of, some of them failure and, and they try to re-entry into the system. And for example, they, if we contrasted them with the new entrepreneur that emerging during the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously they have more advantages in terms of the persistence of the resilience, but also, for example, they also have very good um, supporting for the new ones because they are starting to participate in this and Alex collaboration with new ones in terms of explaining and in terms of supporting them, and as well as uh, avoiding, uh, for example, the failure process of the existing entrepreneurs too. And as well as, for example, we analyze the fintech uh, entrepreneurs that also emerge with a lot of intensity in the Latin American context based on this uh, situation. And also, we believe that uh, in some in certain way, this kind of uh, entrepreneurs are very transformative because most of the time are focused on supporting um, these kind of vulnerable groups that most of the time the financial systems are not considering for, for different reasons. And also obviously they facing a very uh, intensive activity. Uh, and as well as, for example, we uh, also identify the emerging of a lot of social digital entrepreneurs a lot of women digital entrepreneurs, our technological, and as well as uh, the academic entrepreneurs from universities also take a, a, a key important role in the developing of different initiatives for supporting communities, as well as collaborating with the particip particular um, global uh, value change actors with the different uh, industries uh, in, the, in, the, in different sectors. So, so, so sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I, I need you to pop. Yeah. So Do you hear you, me? If you can finish it, yes. If you can yes. finish it in two or three minutes, stops. Thank you. Yeah, I finish it right now. Yeah. So, um, in the present, what are the key issues that we need to take in account? Well, uh, they are a lot of uh, elements that we need to consider for. Um, supporting in terms of policies and as, and as well as policy guidelines, for example, the migratory issues, the, the issue of the, the trade-off be, the, between the digitalization and democracy, and as well as all, all depending issues related with the sustainable developing goals, like the diversity, equality, climate, and as well as well-being, and as well as obviously learning from the crisis uh, and management, this kind of conflict. So, that's that's all for my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maribel. Oops. Yeah. I didn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, it, it's a question actually on your perceptions when what has been going on in Latin America in terms of inflation and not only the economic side of um, the impacts of the post COVID era that we're suffering right now, but also um, social distress, because we've been reading about cases, especially now in Ecuador. And this will probably spread to other countries as we are, we are reaching a, a very difficult moment in terms of uh, prices and access to, to, to basic goods, um, also in Brazil. 
then uh, how how do you feel that it might impact the um, the outflow of uh, entrepreneurs at least knowledge intensive entrepreneurs from this countries to to other places like the united states or europe um and even australia because well, uh, sorry yeah well i i believe that well uh, this is going to be another uh, kind of crisis because uh, this is going to be a recession you know and most of the companies uh depends of the um maybe the, in the case of um, in the case of Latin America, they are more to be more conservative in terms of investing because uh, obviously um, uh, the situation uh, obviously with all these uh, interest rates is very difficult. For example, to to invest in and as well as to try to, to for example, if they want to have an access to credit, it's going to be very difficult to to have uh, these the things in the long term. Uh, and obviously, uh, it's going to be very important. For example, the, the government has a strong intervention in in that in that sense for reducing the the tax rate. For example, um, there are different um, examples in the past that uh, when the well, particularly because Latin American context is 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 very characterized by uh, by crisis in the past, you know, uh, and also, uh, but it's very difficult. If right now we analyze the, the global percent of of investment in R and D from technological companies, it's also very difficult for them. I think that continue investing uh, if they are not collaborating and they are not part of these uh, different uh, agents that are collaborating. Because otherwise, it's going to be very difficult uh, to maintain the, the conditions for, for developing uh, new products or new technologies. All right. Thank you very much, Maribel. I'm uh, going to move to the next presentation. Thank you again. All right, so now I have the final presentation of uh, this session, Global Value Chains in the Age of Digital Transformation and Fourth Industrial Revolution by Professor Moacid Miranda de Oliveira Jr. from the University of where, where, Mateus, can you? Hello, hello to the survivors. <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon. I want to thank you very much, Professor Dan Fisher, Professor Nicholas Benavides, for uh, inviting me for this event. Very interesting, very impactful. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a professor at the Business Administration Department at the University of São Paulo. I, uh, I work on strategy innovation management and international business. Um, in 2015, I was the chief editor of innovation management review. And uh, okay, we are going to talk about briefly about global value chains, the age of digital, very beautiful title, <clears throat> the age of digital transformation for the industrial revolution. But uh, a brief introduction is, uh, I, when I talk about global value chains, I always I always think about the what I call the the vicious cycle in opposition to the virtuous cycle. What's the vicious cycle? Brazil is uh, one of the largest economies in the world. Uh, Brazil is the largest producer of pupil, largest producer of frozen chicken, iron, soy, uh, beef, and the several. Uh, and is leader in a lot of, uh, of other industries, but mostly commodity industries. And the, this, why the, is this the, the vicious cycle? Because commodities demand uh, competitions on costs. 
because this demand is uh, low wages, and low wages implies unqualified people. So we have a society like the, like the Brazilian society, a very unequal society. What about the virtual side? <clears throat> the virtual side is when you use these uh, comparative advantages, transform them in competitive advantages, and then you have uh, you inoculate the technology and knowledge in the value chains, and this and this value chains demands qualified people, they have higher wages, and you create a middle class uh, society like you see United States, Europe, Japan, Korea, China is trying to do that as well, but not in Brazil. I think that we. We need to inoculate more knowledge and technology in these global value chains and doing that to create a better society for, for everyone. What is interesting uh, is that there are uh, uh, some movements happening. We are, <clears throat> we are seeing this, the increasing uh, creation of digital companies lately. We have uh, the large traditional multinational enterprise, then you have the global, the born globals, technology-based companies, but then you have the digital companies, and it's different. Technology-based is not, it's different from digital companies. China, for example, had a lot of large IT companies that did, they were not able to become digital companies. They are not China, India, sorry. The digital transformation is reshaping every aspect in business, uh, but uh, according with the MIT, MIT Center for Digital Business, only one third of a company's globally have an effective digital transformation program in place. And the situation is worse in Brazil. We have a, last week we had a, a, a conference at the University of Sao Paulo and the representative of the CNI, the, the Brazilian National Industry Confederation, uh, said that uh, in Brazil, uh, one in nine, one in ten uh, corporate, uh, firm or corporation, they have one million people affiliated to CNI, are really doing a, a more comprehensive digital transformation. And the digital transformation is out bringing these structural disruptions, connectivity, changing human behavior, new business models, new skills of people and companies. This is a big challenge as well. It's not uh, just about technology, it's about people that are going to manage these technologies. Yesterday, we have the launch a, a new initiative by XP Bank in Brazil. They created the, uh, some uh, uh, graduate course, not graduate, undergraduate course, six of them, with 2,000 positions for free. Look at that, uh, investment banking, creating uh, University offering uh, undergrad courses ma mainly in, in in the digital economy associated to the digital economies for free, trying to fit the gap of unskilled people in, in digital skills in Brazil. And the uh, the, the COVID nineteen crisis also has showed uh, how central these digital technologies are to the economy. I like to <coughs> to say that. Every crisis, you have the winners of the crisis. And the COVID crisis, the winners of the COVID crisis uh, are the, the large corporations or the startups that have the correct and adequate competence for this, uh, this digital global value chains. And they will have a lot of new unicorns, and I'm going to talk this in, in a few slides ahead. Digitalization, we have a, we're seeing also a, a reduction, a reduction in the capital necessary to enter these digital markets. And 10 years ago, it was much more difficult for these corporations or startups to enter this digital. Nowadays, it's much easier. And the digital ecosystem is, is also a way to think on how this can impact the global value chains. Uh, global value chains that have more connections with uh, digital ecosystems are more able to uh, deal with the challenges and opportunities in these new uh, knowledge and technology-based 
economy. We uh, in Brazil we have the, uh, a huge potential on the digital business. Two of the three Brazilians have access to smartphones and the internet. Brazilians spend more than nine hours a day in the internet connected, one of the highest rates in the world. Brazilians are the second or third place, this is amazing, among those that most use the main social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Netflix, WhatsApp, and Pinterest. E-commerce penetration is still low. Entire categories are still incipient. Digital advertising continues to grow at double digital rates. Over 6 billion of app downloads per year. And Brazil is fourth largest apps producer in the world. What is really interesting as well. We, we launched three years ago, this book on startups and innovation ecosystems in emerging markets, a Brazilian perspective. Where 82% of ecosystem in Latin America from Brazil and Argentina, 48% of digital startups in Latin, in Latin America are Brazilian. 73% uh, developing Brazilian startup is generating the local market, so they need to internationalize. And 61% from developed ecosystems coming from of the unicorns. And there is some a very interesting new that I was reading a few minutes ago. The Latin American, it was from the website startup.com.br. Latin American startups received it 28. $1.6 billion in the last five years, being 51% just to, in 2021. It means around the $15 billion uh, were invested in startups in Latin America uh, just in the past year. What is a kind of a paradox? Uh, for example, in, in the case of Brazil, uh, the Brazil had the Brazilian economy had a peak in 2010 when Brazil was the seventh largest uh, GDP in the world. Nowadays, we are in the uh, 12th position. But uh, since 2018 until now, in the last three years and a half, Brazil was able to create almost 30 unicorns. What is really impressive. So, uh, in the last three years, Brazil, in, in just three years, Brazil has created more unicorns than developed economies like uh, France, uh, Italy, and, and other countries. So, it's a kind of a paradox because it seems that the innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystems in Brazil is mature. And additionally, there are some uh, advantages related to exchange rates. And nowadays we have all the main venture capitalists based in Brazil, and they are investing a lot, and they are uh, having very good, very good results. <clears throat> we have some uh, you know, uh, innovation ecosystems in Latin America, São Paulo City, according to the Tecno, Tecno Latino report, São Paulo. Uh, city uh, is responsible for 41 percent of the techno, techno Latinas among the main cities. Buenos Aires 16, Mexico City 11 percent. Corporate venture and innovation hubs are quite an interesting movement as well, associated with these startups. Since 2015, in our research, we have mapped over 120 large companies. They are leading the creation of innovation hub, hubs like Cubo from Itaú Bank, Nadesco's Nova Bar, Porto Seguros Oxygen, Braskem Labs, uh, BNDS Garage, and the uh, Balduco has one. It's over 100. It's, I put 120, but it's nowadays is even much more. Sao Paulo is the, is the 21st in the ranking of the world largest economies as a city. Uh, among cities, and Sao Paulo is the third largest economy and the third largest consumer market in Latin America as well. When we talk about the state, huh? 
some uh, considerations. <clears throat> Before the industrial revolution is emerging as a new engine of innovative growth that brings digital technologies, such as artificial intelligence, big data, IoT, 5G, machine learning, 3D printing, virtual reality, robotics, etc. And uh, it's providing also innovative and intelligent changes in society, governments, etc. But the diffusion of uh, digital technologies demand the, creating, the creation of a new, new digital value chains to provide services such as financial transactions uh, to digital players and, uh, and several others. Uh, digital value chains will take advantage of digital innovation ecosystems. So it's quite important having this kind of connection with the among the value chains and innovation ecosystems. I use it to the, the terms, the concepts are evolving, but I use it to make a lot of research on the innovation clusters and global value chains. Nowadays is digital value chains and the innovation uh, and digital ecosystems as well. But it, the origins are uh, approximately the same, the same thing. Eh? Uh, Insuring, backshoring, nearshoring in developing countries is a movement that we are, we are watching. Maybe as a consequence of the of the pandemic, is a lot of most of the developing countries are uh, bringing back or trying to bring back the uh, steps or parts of the value chain that were offshore in the last three decades. Brazil is one. Brazil, China. The BRICS in, in all the major markets uh, had a lot of advantages and create and have a lot of economic growth uh, connected with this offshoring of activities. I'll give you an example. Uh, we did a research for Brazilian caps and stint from Sweden about the offshoring of R&D activities for, for Swedish firms to Brazil. It was a research we did from 2015 to 2020. And we discovered that uh, Sao Paulo, the great Sao Paulo, is the second largest in industrial city from Sweden. Obviously, it's a joke, but it's the most important uh, concentra industrial concentration of Swedish firms is in Gothenburg, and the second largest is in the Sao Paulo city. So it helped a lot uh, for Brazil, the Brazilian economy to to, to be in the position that of a, in a very important position globally. But now we are seeing this, the same companies are trying to do this movement of ensuring, back shoring, near shoring. We have a lot of terms for these new movements. But what we propose here is that if we, the emerging markets are able to develop the skills and competence in digital transformation, in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, this movement is not uh, uh, will not be able to impact these emerging economies because the competitiveness of the emerging economies as the competitiveness of developed economies will be based in the ability to deal with the uh, assimilation of the new technologies in the in the business model of large corporations or startups. And as I said before, the pandemic winners seems to be the startups and corporations with the right technologies and digital competence along with their global value chains. One very interesting aspect is that the creation of startups focusing on, on software and tools that implement uh, all these new technologies can help large corporations uh, in conglomerating the constructions of the key components. So what we're seeing here is now is that more and more, like I said to you before, uh, large corporations are creating open innovation models in different ways. Sometimes it's business incubators, sometimes it's a partnership with uh, universities, sometimes all of this together. But the idea is that 
uh, startups and the universities can play a crucial role in helping the corporations to, to uh, be able to develop all these new skills. Qualified human capital is one of the pillars for Industry 4.0, and it's a big challenge in Brazil, in Latin America as well. We understand the investments in R&D should be made by the government and also by private companies through subsides or, or not. And despite the fact that the most uh, spending on R&D is concentrated in large companies, we, uh, we understand the, the, there should be an investment in R&D also for the small and medium enterprises and the startups. I still have two minutes, so I want to give you uh, some examples uh, what we're talking about. We did some, I did a research uh, in 2015 for the State Secretary of Economic Development, Science and Technology in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, <clears throat> analyzing the, the uh, shoes and leather clusters in Franca, Birigui, and Jaú, the main clusters of shoes and leather in the state of Sao Paulo. And 2015 was a terrible year, but Franca was able to create 6,000 6, new jobs in that terrible year of 2015. According to our research, it was for two main reasons. First, uh, Franca producers of shoes are connected with the global value chains. They sell very high quality shoes for uh, for example, Italian, Italian firms, $20 a pair, the same, the same shoe is sold in the European market for $200. Uh, another initiative that helped a lot in Franca was the digital business. A lot of important producers in, in, uh, in Franca don't have a physical uh, stores or they or don't sell to anyone, but they have their own uh, digital digital marketplace. Another another example, we did a, a consulting for a firm uh, called Duo System. It's quite an interesting case. Duo System it was an IT firm for health, and we worked a lot in the strategic plan, trying to show the, the guys the digital, uh, being IT is not being digital. They were able to develop this expertise, this new technology, and now they are very strong in the telemedicine, and they took a lot of advantages during the COVID-19. When you open your access, I think it's for, I'm not sure if it's the city of Sao Paulo, the state of Sao Paulo, but if I look for my, uh, uh, <clears throat> my COVID-19 proof that I'm vaccinated, you will open there and it's powered by the system. They are able to do a lot of great work. And I think my time is over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moacir. And I think it's interesting to highlight, I know Moacir for, for some time now, he's not a in, in research on these topics, he, he's a sponsor of uh, connections within the Sao Paulo ecosystem. So for those of you who, who don't know this event, they have it every year. It's called Science Meets Business. It's a very interesting event that um, brings people from academia and from markets together. And uh, it's a very opportunity to, to connect. So um, comments and questions on most year's presentation. Good evening, Professor. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have a question here, in fact, too. When you mentioned the shares uh, in the country, uh, you said Sao Paulo and some other countries, the number of startups from the last years, do you have any numbers uh, in Brazil, like other regions besides Sao Paulo? I think it, uh, yes, uh, Sao Paulo is leading, but you uh, have a very important movement in the state of Paraná, Santa Catarina, and Rio de Janeiro as well, mainly related to startups. If you look at the tech parks, then you have the case of the Porto Digital in Recife, 
in some other in, in some others as well. In reality, what he was saying about this science meets business initiative is that we are kind of diversifying or, or our, it's not going to be just a conference. So I transform this in an annual journey with a big conference, but we also create a, a, a CIBIS research focused in applied research in order to, to fit this gap uh, you are mentioned not here. We don't have many, many much numbers. I like the work the from the street is doing. The street is, the, I'm not sure if you know them, but if you don't know, give a look. Uh, they are they are doing a, a, a good job on bringing information on the innovation entrepreneurial ecosystem. But I think the university can do that as well in a different way because we are different from from a corporation. Okay, thanks. Another one. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the um, when the, the challenges right here for us is having people uh, able to work in the fourth industrial technologies. Which other challenges do you think that Brazil, Brazilian startups and companies will face to adopt these technologies? Thanks. Oh, well, uh, I I have. Uh... I have a problem. I used to look not just at the the, the empty of the cup, but also the, to the, in the field part, part of the cup. I think the what we're seeing in Brazil nowadays, with all these amazing numbers, innovation, the startups creation, unicorn inspiration, is the result of a, a, a joint effort of a lot of agencies like uh, Papesp. Papesp is doing an amazing job. The PP initiatives. We have the Sergio Queiroz, he was responsible for that. Uh, it's over, it's over 1,600 1, startups uh, have been supported by PIP. We have seen a lot of investment by FINEP. We have seen a lot of investment by uh, uh, the startup from Apex, helping these startups to go abroad. At this very moment, it, at not this at the moment, at, at, until past month, we are working for the Invest Sao Paulo, the investment agency of the state of Sao Paulo. We prepared two groups of 30 startups to go to roadshows in London and Miami. So one of the challenges is, is also uh, the, the startup uh, discover how, what, what are the available opportunities for them? Because there are a lot of available opportunities. Just if for the ones based in Sao Paulo is amazing. What you, uh, nowadays look at that. Ooh, the Science Meets Business Conference organized the past week. We have as one of the sponsors the Sebrae. Sebrae put, uh, I think it's two hundred fifty million dollars in the in the initiative of PIP at, at the uh, Papesp. Yeah? So. It's much more money if you want to, to enter in the phase two of, his, uh, of a PIP nowadays, you are going to receive 1,250,000 reais, what is around the 200,000, $250,000 just for you to work on your business model and bring the product to the market. So there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of possibilities. We have several uh, workshops at uh, in the conference past week, we have a, a workshop by Papayas, we have a workshop by Merck. Merck is Merck Sharp and Dome. They are doing a, a very interesting movement to stimulate these startups to apply for the funding, the funding. And then there are a lot. That's one of the challenges is that discover where you find. And the, the movement, the angels movement this is booming as well. We have a, a, a fair angels, for example, fair is the fact of economics in administration of the University of Sao Paulo, but to have the poly angels as well, the angels from the Polytechnic, Polytechnic is, uh, from the University, School from the University of Sao Paulo, engineers. We have FGV uh, angels, we have MIT angels, Harvard angels, and uh, doing some advertising. We are going to have a very good panel on the subject next Friday, uh, in the third day of the Cisco uh, event about the scalability and the investment funds for uh, innovation ecosystems. So 
Uh, we can learn a lot with these people. What the the criteria they they define in order to invest in a startup, for example. Uh, thank you, Moasir. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. I have three questions. Uh, uh, just sorry, as we're already only 20 one? minutes over. Schedule. Okay, so I'll just set them. Like, um, don't feel pressure to answer them. One is the mechanism, like, um, uh, how exactly, like, the digital transformation will help us, uh, like, succeed in value chains because integrating value value chains is kind of easy. The thing is that we want to add more value added. So what, what, what is exactly the mechanism? The second part is one important thing is the infrastructure part, because I mean, um, it's very important for a, like a firm to use artificial intelligence and like uh, internet of things. The thing is that uh, in many regions of Latin America, like the access to the internet is very limited. So that's something that I missed from your presentation. And the other part, like the policy perspective, like uh, now there is this pressing need for acquiring more digital skills, like the standard type of recommendation are boot camps. So what is there to come? Uh, I mean, uh, in order to cope with the fourth industrial revolution, we are only supposed to continue implementing boot camps. I'm saying this because for instance, Nick and I review like the, um, the innovation policies in developed countries and they are and already like the innovation authority is partnering up with the um, education authority to, co to completely re-engineer the education system for, for kids and for teenager teenagers to be more uh, like, uh, to acquire more digital skills. So they are preparing already ahead for what is next to come. So how can the Brazilian policy adapt to that? Or that could be too early or it's up, only up to the developed economies? Thank you. Once you have one minute to respond, sir. That was a three minutes question. Okay. We, we... Briefly, briefly, uh, these in, um, inequalities in the country, uh, in the in whole Latin America, I know more about it, Brazil and Latin America. I think the, uh, they demand this public policy for, uh, for to, to reduce these inequalities. And for example, satellites could be very interesting in order to deal with the Challenges of the some regions in Amazon region, for example, they don't have access for internet and this kind of stuff. I coordinate a, a, a program of a doctoral program in a partnership of University of São Paulo and University of State of Amazonas. And University of State of Amazonas have some campus that are 20 hours by boat from the capital. By boat, it's amazing. So demanded new investment in technology. The government has to invest in that. And, and the, the qualification of, of the people, I think, is a challenge. But we are in, in a university. Our, I think our role is to increase the impact of the progress of society, not just developing good professionals that we are do not just doing good research that we are doing as well, but also transferring knowledge and technology to, to corporations and to the government, including a public policy, including uh, uh, partnerships, universities, and corporations, including the stimulation of creation of startups. And this, I think this is our, our role to increase it, to this impact of the university in the society. Thank you, Monsi. Uh, Juan, I'm sure you can go on with this conversation with Monsi. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today here and online. Uh, we resume our program tomorrow morning at 9. And then at 9, you have a keynote speech by, by Professor Eduardo Buquerque. And see you, hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Oh, yeah, and the round table afterwards.